Here's Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Lunch, Mr. Diamond? Too early to tell. Hey, you must shave with a dull razor. You got a scratch on your face. I use a rake. <laughs> Here's your floor, Mr. Diamond. Thanks, Ed. Well, customers. Good afternoon, gentlemen. What can I do for the floor? Oh. oh, that was nifty, Ziggy. Chino, that's him. Pick him up and drag him over to the chair, Ziggy. Sure thing, Chino. <laughs> He's really out. Yeah. See if you can bring him around. Be a shame if he missed anything. Chino, would you mind holding my ash can handle? It might break his jaw. A pleasure, Ziggy. Diamond. Diamond. He looks like he ain't gonna make it. Maybe you slapped him too hard. You hurt me, Ziggy. You know how careful I am. Here, try this pitcher of water. I felt like I was lying in the middle of a crowded sink and someone had piled all the dishes on my head. They turned on the faucet and I floated up with a dirty coffee cup and took a look around. I treaded water and squinted through my dewy eyelids at two of the ugliest dishwashers I'd ever seen. He's twitching. Oh. See, Ziggy, he's just lazy. Diamond, uh, let us know when things start making sense. Oh, that's that's a dirty trick. Oh, well, he's talking screwy. What's a dirty trick, Diamond? Uh, I'm stuck in the drain. I think you hit him too hard. He's liable to be talking like that from now on. Give it time, give it time. The Diamond, you pull yourself out. Yeah. How did your monkeys get in here anyway? He's back. <laughs> Now go to work, Ziggy, but uh, keep him with us. Hey, wait a minute. Oh. Oh. That's enough, Ziggy. Uh, can you hear me, Diamond? Uh, he don't like it. He's going to be hard to get along with. Belt him across the ears. He'll listen. Hear me now? He's nodding his head. I guess he wants to keep his mouth shut so the teeth don't fall out. Fine. Now listen, Diamond. When you get a call from a Mr. Barton, turn down the job. Understand? Ziggy, see if he's doing it. <coughs> oh. Yes, you know. He says now he's got his silver arm. Remember, Mr. Barton, you don't want to work for him. Think he gets it? Sure, you know, but he looks tired from the strain. Oh, then put him to sleep, Ziggy. Nighty-night time. He didn't have to say nighty-night. It was only two o'clock in the afternoon. He tapped me once more with a galvanized sleeping pill and tucked me away for a rest. The next thing I knew, a pair of gray suede gloves were patting my sore face. Maybe he didn't want to leave any fingerprints on my bruises. Mr. Diamond, Mr. Diamond, can you hear me? Oh... Oh, you know, this this can get monotonous. Go away. Should I call the police, Mr. Diamond? What? Oh. Oh, I, I was expecting uglier company. Could you sit up? I'm getting some of your blood on my shoes. That's tough. I'll turn it off. I'll bet you're named Barton. Why, that's right. How did you know? I'm lucky. Now get out of here. But I want to talk to you. I just had one long conversation, but it was too one-sided. Go on. My health is doubtful, but it's fun to have it around for company. Maybe $500 would pick you up? It might, for a while. But I don't like to waste that kind of money on funerals. Seven fifty. So they line the coffin with velvet. A thousand. 
Uh, you're begging to make a short life sound practical. If you do the job successfully, there'll be another thousand. You just bought yourself a corpse. Let me wash up. Talk some more. I can hear you. It's my son, Roger. He thinks he killed a man. He thinks? What do you want me to do? Find out for sure so I can brag about it? Ever heard of a John Alter? Sure. Walt Levinson sent him up five years ago on a manslaughter rap. Well, he doesn't like it up there, and he'd like to get out. I don't blame him. What's this got to do with your son? I'm chairman of the parole board. Oh, you look much better now, Mr. Diamond. I can't stand the sight of blood. It doesn't bother me. It happens every week. So, uh, you're the chairman of the parole board. Yes, some of Alter's friends promised to keep quiet about my son if I let Alter go free when he comes up before the board next week. Mm -hmm. And you think maybe your son was framed? Yes, about a month ago, he met a girl in Florida. Her name is Lenore Brown, and she's a friend of Alter's. How did they spring the frame? I beg your pardon? You must associate with a higher type thug. Spring the frame. Made it look like your son killed somebody. Oh. Oh. Well, when Roger, that's my son, went to pick up the Lenore girl at her apartment, he found her struggling with some man. That happens. It looked like he was trying to kill her. There was a gun on the floor, and she called to Roger for help. He picked up the gun and shot the man. She told Roger he had killed him and that he must get out. When we went back, they were both gone. About a month later, some of Alter's friends got in touch with me. Oh, and they forget about the killing if you let Alter out of Sing Sing. That's right. I don't remember reading anything about it in the papers. Well, you're the first one outside of Alter and his friend who know anything about it. You see, they say they're hiding the corpus delecti, so there was no report of the murder. Keeping a sieve handy isn't that easy. Why didn't you call the law? If my son did kill this man, that's the first thing I intend doing. But I have a feeling this man is not dead. Oh, you, uh, you think maybe they staged the killing, put blanks in the gun, and after your son beat it, the stiff walked out under his own steam? That's what I want you to find out. If my son is innocent, I want you to bring the parties responsible to justice. Amen. Here's a check for $1,000. If you find the girl and prove my son innocent, there'll be another 1000 in your pocket. I'll throw up the holes. Well, thanks, Mr. Barton. I'll start right away. Goodbye, Mr. Diamond. You can reach me at the Wentworth Hotel. I'm staying there until this matter gets cleared up. I won't get in touch with you unless I find something. The guys who worked me over are pretty set in their ways, and there's no sense in you tripping over a lot of dead bodies. <laughs> I looked at the thousand-dollar check and thought about the beating the two polite gunsels had given me. It was a toss-up. If I'd spent the thousand like I knew I would, I'd be dead anyway. The two goons were probably still hanging around my building, and if they spotted me, they'd guess I'd taken the job. When I get more than ten bucks in my pocket, I smile all over. I went out the back way and through the alley. Had to start somewhere, so I headed for the 5th Precinct Police Station. When you're looking for a killer, homicides got all the roadmaps on murder. An old friend and ex-partner was in charge. The men who worked the detail called him Lieutenant Levinson, but he had a couple of friends who still called him Walt. I was one of them. You earned that right when you worked for a guy for six years. After I left the force, Walt started doing a solo, but he now had a sergeant who stumbled around after him. His name was Otis, and he had the biggest feet in the state of New York. Every time he took off his shoes, I wanted to grab a champagne bottle and launch them. I don't think he liked me. When I walked in, his face always looked like an, an advertisement for a sour stomach. Well, Richard Diamond, private detective. Well, Sergeant Otis, homicide's answer to the missing link. What was that last word? Well, you're half safe, I said link. Walt in? Yeah. You turn the knob and you push. Why don't you get that uniform cleaned? Some dad's going to get up and walk to the station without you. Well, hello, Rick. If you've got... Yeah. You must get tired changing your face every day. Somebody shove you around again? Been catching up on my patty cake, Walt. Tell me, did you uh, ever know a bit of fluff named Lenore Brown? Sure, John Alder's expense account. Used to hold hands before I send him up. Know where I can find her? Alder's still got her staked out. When he leaves stir, he's going to come back and dig up the claim. You better forget about it. She's got the antidote for lonely nights, but some of all these boys are protecting it. I know, yeah. They gave me a pep talk this afternoon. And then listen to them. It's better watching a game from the bench. Oh, uh, you never can tell. I might make a score. Well, you're outweighed, outclassed, and liable to be outlived. She used to work at the Black Swan in Florida. Her daughter was trying to get a parole, and she came to New York to be close to him. Any lying on her here in town? No, but if she's seeing all of you, might spot her on a visitor's day. And now, look, Rick, why don't you stop chasing two-bit thugs and come back on the force? 
I never had all this when we were working together. You know how I feel about that, Walt. I'm a restless guy. Sometimes I like to sleep late in the morning. Okay, Rick. Want me to call the warden and tell him you're coming? Yeah, thanks, Walt. Take it easy. Bye, Rick. Be a good boy. Yes, Paul? Mr. Richard Diamond to see you, Warden. Oh, send him in. You can go on in, Mr. Diamond. Thanks, Paul. Well, Rick, how are you? It's been a long time. I know a lot of guys who wouldn't like to hear that, Warden. How are you, Jim? Just great. What's on your mind? I hear Johnny Alter's been having company. I'd like to take a look at her. Oh, Miss Brown. Well, I can't blame you. I just want to spot her and see where she goes. You can't miss. If she walked through the yard, there'd be a jailbreak tomorrow. What time are visiting hours? Well, if she's seeing Alter today, she should be downstairs right now. Pardon me a second. Yes, Warden. Paul, has Lenore Brown come in today? Yes, she has, Warden. She's in seeing Alter right now. Thanks, Paul. She's downstairs, Rick. Like to take a look? Yeah. I'll have Paul take you down. Mm-hmm. Uh, on second thought, I'll go myself. There she is, sitting at the end table talking to Alda. Oh, now I know why Alda needs a lot of money. She's wearing enough mink to carpet Radio City. You should get a load of her on a warm day. Coat doesn't stop me. She'd show up, even if she's wearing a tent. How long has she got with Alder? About another five minutes. Warden, maybe I'll let you put me away for a couple of years. With something like that to look forward to on Visitor's Day, I might go for the change. Well, you'd get tired of just talking. <laughs> Think what you could do on the outside. Yeah, I am, but it would probably send me right back up here. Now, you want to stick around till she's through talking? Thanks, Jim. I, I'll wait in front till she comes out. <laughs> I hung her on by the big gray buildings until she came out. She walked over to a long white convertible and got in. Now I know what the guy meant when he wrote. Ask the man who owns one. I decided to let her buy me a new fuse, and I walked over to the car. Uh, going to town? Oh? Back up three feet, and I'll let you know. Okay. Mm-hmm. Your tailor couldn't do all of that. Thanks. Get in. Visiting. Yeah, yeah, the warden's an old friend. How many years did you know him? Ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, baby. I've been going home every night all my life. Every night? Well, almost. What do you do with the almost? Depends. Everybody likes something different. You must get tired thinking up new ideas. Oh, I don't think much. It's more fun being surprised. Hey, what are you stopping for? We just got started. Surprise? Oh, yeah. And the nickel-plated one. Look, baby, you don't have to pull a gun. If I'm getting fresh, I'll get out and walk. You'll sit right there, Diamond. Oh, name dropper. Mm-hmm. Expecting company? Mm-hmm, and you've met them before, honey. That's nice. I wouldn't want you to get stuck with the introductions. That's your friends coming along in that car? It should be. Now hold real still. They'll only shoot you this time. Sometimes you're lucky. When a dame's got a gun on you, you don't stand much of a chance unless she's got her mind on something else. This one did. And when she looked up in the rearview mirror to make sure it was her boys, I tagged her. My two playmates were just pulling up in the green sedan when I went out of the car like a dry transmission. There he is! He's locked with Mom! Nail it! He let go just as I dived off the side of the road and hit the center embankment. I rolled to the bottom and came up looking like an exhibit for smallpox. He's down the hill. Go get him, Ziggy! There was a line of trees just off to the right, and I got to them just as Ziggy tried again. He needed a rifle. I was running through the trees then, and I could hear Ziggy somewhere behind me falling all over himself. I pulled my gun and thought about waiting for him. I could give him so many holes he'd whistle in a high wind, but I had another idea. I stopped and listened. He's around here somewhere. Come on, we'll, we'll, we'll spread out. That tore it right down the middle. They were somewhere behind me, and both of them were looking. I got a new suit. Oh, oh 
my deep, it's the Bollinger's, Gino. I thought you was Diamond. Can't you tell a difference, Ziggy? He's got on a blue suit. Oh, I'm a little colorblind. Uh, now let's find Diamond. They started hunting again, and I cut off to my left and headed back to the highway. I reached the hill that sloped down from the highway, and I went up fast. The cars were about a hundred yards down the road, and I used my last lung getting there. Lenore was still out, just like I'd left her when I put her to sleep. I went over to the Gunsel's car and lifted the hood. Chino and Ziggy could apologize all night while they looked for a new distributor. I went back to the white convertible with the unconscious nylons and got in. I noticed something lying on the seat. It was her purse, and she didn't wake up when I grabbed it. Doing a rummage job at 80 miles an hour isn't easy. But there wasn't much of interest anyway, just a little black book. I needed a gimmick, so I stuck it in my pocket. I put the purse back on the seat just as she started coming around. Oh. Wow, well, now that's it, baby. Sit up and look at the pretty scenery. How did you get here? Where's Ziggy and Chino? Playing Peter Pan. Hmm. Jaw hurt? Yes, you heel. Play rough and you get hurt. Where do I take you? Uh, my apartment, I guess. You're going to ask a lot of questions, and I don't talk much. We might as well figure out something to fill in the lull. I drove to her place on East 51st and walked it to the door. She looked at me like a fat woman eyeing a French pastry, and her mouth slipped down to her shoelaces when I gave her a peck on the cheek and left her standing with an old front doorknob in her hand. I knew she wasn't going to spill anything, even if I got her drunk. Besides, she could probably drink Tony Galeno under the table and still be sober enough to play hopscotch. I went back to the office and took out her little black book. There were a lot of names, and some of them I knew. Chino, and after it, likes his work. And Ziggy, and after his name, has own gun. Yeah, yeah, Richard Diamond, too. I never did figure out what the three stars were for. I forgot all about my date with Colin when the phone rang. Yeah? Hello, Rick. Oh, up to... No, uh, this is Fang Wu's Sanjay Chop Chow. Now, Fang Wu, call Mr. Richard Diamond to the phone Chop Chop. He's got a date and she doesn't like being stood up. Hello, hello. Hi. What was all that about? Did you forget you had a date with me? Yeah, yeah, I did. And I'm sorry, baby, but right now I, I'm being chased like a hopped-up fox. And I haven't had time to curl up and relax. You're impossible. I know it, I know it. Hmm. Want your sorority pen back? Well, I'll make up my mind when you get here. I'll give you my Lone Ranger magic decoder. <laughs> you fool. <laughs> Are we still going steady? Oh, yes. Rick, when am I going to see you? Uh, honey, right now I got some reading to do. Why don't you go to a movie? Little women pass the senses. I'll be over later. I'll probably end up marrying an usher. Don't be too late, Rick. I won't. Besides, we get along better early in the morning. Bye. Bye, baby. I sat there for a minute thinking about Helen Asher and wondering why I hadn't learned how to butter my bread. She was everything a guy should want. Ten million dollars playing multiplication in a fat trust fund. A figure that would snarl of any quiet intersection, and a mind that would give a master's degree an inferiority complex. Diamond, you fool, you. Well, Lenore Brown's little black book was a poor substitute for an evening with Helen, but three items put me in second gear. They weren't hard to find. Take out all the men's names, and there they were. Three addresses. One was in the village, another in Harlem, and the last was somewhere in Chinatown. All of them were a setup for a dead man who wanted to make himself scarce. I wanted to talk with Barton before I started hunting, so I called the Wentworth. Wentworth Hotel. Mr. Barton, please. Yes, sir, I'll ring him. Hello? Mr. Barton, this is Diamond. Oh, yes, Diamond. Did you find out anything yet? Uh, not yet, but uh, tell me, did your son uh, tell you what his victim looked like? Why, yes. He said he was a dark man with a scar from his nose to his chin. He said he'd never forget it. Oh. Oh, well, thanks. Maybe I'll call you tomorrow. I hope you clear this thing up in a hurry. So do I. I want to get my nerves untangled. I took the easy address first, 
grabbed a cab, and 20 minutes later, I was walking down the steps of a little dive on the east side of Greenwich Village. It was a shabby little place, and the customers had enough long hair to give a toupee dealer the DTs. A fat waiter walked over and eyed my clean shirt. He was wearing an apron that looked like he'd made the salad on it. He was swell. Hey, you wanted something, Mac? Yeah, oh, a pound of egg noodles. Just sweep them up off the floor. Do you know anyone named Lenore? Lenore. Oh, sure, Lenore Brown. Hey, she comes in every once a week, listens to the kid at the piano. <laughs> no way would a classy dame like that go out with him. <laughs> he don't play the piano so good. You ever see a guy with her? Dark man with a scarf from his nose to his chin? No, no. She always does a single. Yeah, well, thanks. Hey, you still want those noodles? I walked out, got back in the cab, and marked off Greenwich Village in the little black book. The second address was on the fringe of Harlem, the hill, they call it. The night was black, and the fog had rolled in off the East River and staked out a claim all the way to Lenox Avenue. As I walked up to the old brownstone, my nerves started screaming S.O.S. I stopped cold and looked down at two gleaming eyes, like two pieces of polished glass shining in the glare of the dim street lamp. As I got used to the darkness, I could make him out. He was a big, white, battle-scarred bulldog, and he had some ideas of his own. He started shuffling in slowly, jerking back his lips and showing a row of white teeth. Hold it, Lucifer. I hadn't heard him come out on the porch. He was a big man wearing an off-white undershirt. And from what I could see, he looked meaner than his dog. The animal stopped, but he kept facing me, showing off his toothpaste smile. You won't hurt you, mister, unless I tell him to. I'll think about it for a while. I'm a poor substitute for horse meat. What do you want? Do you know a Lenore Brown? You a cop? Shamus. Beat it, Lucifer. <laughs> Thanks, pal. I couldn't hold my breath much longer. You can come up on the porch. You're looking for Lenore Brown, huh? Yeah, I know her. I met her. My wife works for her. Is your wife in? Yeah. Yes, sir. Hello. Come here. Some private dick wants to talk to you. She's Miss Brown's private maid. Yeah. Your husband tells me you work for Miss Brown. Yeah, what's she done? She got many friends? Men friends. Yeah. Oh. You know a dark man with a scar? Oh, sure. I know lots of them. What are you talking about, woman? Oh, I, uh, I met someone who Miss Brown knows. What did you mean by that, mister? Look, I really don't know anybody with a scar. Now you better be. Yeah. Get moving. And I want to talk to you, woman. Get in there. Yes, honey. I knew she was going to get bruised, but he looked rough enough to cut my windpipe, and I wanted someplace to pour my coffee down in the morning. So I got out of there fast and headed for the last address in the little black book. The place was on one of those narrow, dark streets. It was so quiet you could hear yourself change your mind. A sign above the door read Tangy, so I pushed it open and went in. If I didn't find a man with a scar here, I was out on strikes. It was a little restaurant on the bottom floor of a two-story building. A quiet waiter slipped up and showed me to a booth. He shoved the menu in my hand and disappeared before I could ask him anything. The place was empty except for an old couple sitting near the door. The waiter said something to them, and they looked quickly over at me, and then they left in a hurry. The room was completely empty now. Even the waiter had disappeared. I looked up at a flight of stairs at the far end of the room. A pair of very healthy ankles came into view, and they were holding up a pair of legs that ran my blood pressure up to 190 again. I eased my gun out and held it under the table. Lenore turned the corner and started down toward my booth like a loose snake in a rabbit pen. Mind if I sit down? Uh, it's your party. Shame on you. Don't you know it's not nice to pill for a lady's handbag? Now, Mama will have to thank. It looks like the last address paid off. If you're buying shrouds, it did. Where's the guy that young Barton was supposed to have killed? Upstairs. But he's very unsociable. Hates long conversations. I only need a couple of lines. He can't even do that. He likes to keep on breathing. Old man Barton figures Alter framed his son. He's not going to let your boyfriend out of Sing Sing until he finds a man with a scar. 
think he can do better than you did? Uh, I found him. Was it worth dying for? I don't know. I can tell you better after I talk to him. Mama's going to have to spank sooner than she expected. Come in, boys. Well, look who's here. Are Mama's two big idiots out collecting blood again? Where are your buckets? Oh, he's bitter. President! You've, um, you've met Chino and Ziggy before, haven't you? Yeah, on the end of a fist. They want to show you the town. I know the beat. I'll bet you've never seen it from the bottom of the East River. No, but if you'll put on a bathing suit, I might buy the idea. Oh. Too bad we'll never make the beach together. I'd like to show you the sights. Boys, you better help Mr. Diamond out of the booth. I think he's stuck. You know how it is. The boys like to keep moving. So do I. I, I shot once and caught Ziggy in the stomach, and I dumped the table over on Chino. Oh. He grabbed like he was going to waltz with it. I didn't even have to get up. I just shot him through the cover chart. Oh. Lenore was out of the booth fast and running for the stairs. Look out, Tony, look out! I caught up with her at the foot of the stairs, and as she started up, I saw him, standing on the upper landing, scar and all, all meaning gun in his hand. He missed me, but nailed her halfway up. She spun around and fell all over me. But I point a gun pretty good from a prone position. You should have kept your nose up, mister. A bad landing washes you out. I called Lieutenant Levinson, squared myself. Then homicide came down and cleaned things up. They were all dead, and I figured I never would reach the beach anyway. I phoned Barton, who took his son down to the morgue to look over the night's take. Young Barton identified the man with the scars, the one he thought he'd killed. They gave me the notch, and I made another call. This time to a pair of silk pajamas with an understanding heart. It was late, but I was hungry. Oh, good morning, Mr. Diamond. Isn't it rather late to be calling? You know something? You're right, Francis. It's 2 a.m. Time for all good butlers to be betty by. Miss Helen is in the library, but I'm not sure whether she wants to see you. Well, you just run along and get some sleep. I'll find out and let you know. Very good, sir. Confidentially, she's a little peeved. Look. Chin up, Mr. Diamond. Francis, if she gets tough with me, I'll knock her teeth out. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Francis. Is that who I think it was? Oh. Hi. The food was cold a long time ago. So is my date. I'm sorry, honey. Oh, that's all right. The fire's almost burned down. It's two o'clock in the morning, Mr. Diamond. I've sat through two features of Tom and Jerry in the fourth chapter of Batman Hops of Freight. Ah, come on, don't scold, baby. I haven't in weeks, but I've been rehearsing this for the past two hours, and you're going to listen. And that's another thing. You never play when I want you to. Only when I've got you on the carpet. That sounds like fun. Now, stop being glib. If you think for one minute you can turn me into... How do you face the weather, sunshine? Put on a great big smile. Now, stop that and listen to me. Okay, okay, I'll shut up. Well, go on. No. Now, you made me forget what I was going to say. Well, if you can't remember, honey... Hold a good thought. It's a big, wide, wonderful world you live in. When you're in love, you're a master of all you survey. You're a gay Santa Claus. I just remembered. Too late now, honey. I'm rolling. There's a brave new star-spangled sky above you. When you're in love, you're a hero, a Nero, Apollo, the Wizard of Oz. Oh, Rick, how do you do it? You're a kingdom, power and glory. Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell, was previously released over the National Broadcasting Company for listeners in the United States and has been re-released to you men and women overseas by the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education.
Here's Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. It's five o'clock in New York City, and the big neon signs light up the dark office that overlooks Broadway on the corner of 53rd Street. Behind a second-hand mahogany desk, relaxing in a swivel chair, is the leading figure of the Diamond Detective Agency, combination stockholder, office boy, and clue chaser. He is Richard Diamond, and his mind is on a lovely redhead named Helen Asher as she sits on a couch talking about things he likes to hear. At this moment, however, another scene is taking place in the wealthy district of Long Island. A long black convertible is just pulling up to an old English mansion, and a curvaceous blonde steps from the car. She is met at the door by her brother. Well, good evening, my dear sister. You're looking simply ravishing. How would you know the difference? Oh, drop dead. You disgusting excuse for a man. Why don't you sober up for five minutes and take a look at yourself? I did once. Oh, by the way, our dear stepfather would like to see you in the study. Tell him to go I already did. Now it's your turn. I don't want to. Now get out of my way, Chris. Mm, Suit yourself. But Murray Lang's in there with him. Murray? Hmm? Did I start your heart going pity pat? Oh, shut up. <laughs> you better go in and protect your money, darling. <clears throat> Bye, jailbird. Sock. I don't care what your plans are. They concern my daughter, and that's enough for me to put a stop to them. You're not going to put a stop to anything. You can't intimidate me, Lang. You're just a cheap, no good gangster, and your methods are too well known to frighten me. Come in! Oh, hello, Liz. Hello, Murray. I'm glad you're here, Elizabeth. Mr. Lang and I were just discussing your future. I'm surprised you put up with it this long, Murray. Come on, let's leave my dear stepfather until he simmers down. Elizabeth, I want to talk to you. Well, I don't want to talk to you. Let's go, Murray. Listen to what he has to say. Maybe you'll get a laugh out of it. Well, what is it? I've just been talking with Lang about your intention to marry him. I have advised him that if such a thing were to take place, it would result in the most serious of consequences. Is that all? No, that is not all. When you got into your trouble with the police, my dear stepdaughter, you were paroled in my custody. If I should report to the board that you had violated the terms of your probation, you would most certainly go to prison. Why, you... What's the matter? Aren't you satisfied with the salary you collect for taking care of Mother's estate? How dare you, you little... Sit down. You look bigger behind a desk. Well, just yell and scream all you want to. After Monday, you better start looking for another source of income. You know very well it's not the money. But your greasy boyfriend here would certainly like to get his hands on it. Look, you, I don't give a hang if you are a midget. I'm not going to stand here and listen to you. Murray. No, baby, I won't take it. I'll wring his scrawny little neck. Go on, Lang, go on. It would give me the greatest of pleasure to call the police and have you locked up. I'll fix it so you won't have a head to call anyone with. Murray, leave him alone. Can't you see that's what he wants? Yes, well, Mr. Lang. Come on, Liz, let's get some fresh air. I want to say one more thing. Just remember, Father, my probation expires Monday. After that, you won't control any part of my income, so you better start getting packed. And if I report you to the probation board in the morning... I wouldn't. If you do that, you'll not only stop being my guardian, but you'll stop breathing. Get out. Get out, both of you. Come on, Murray. Try to intimidate me. I'll make them both sorry. Detective. Detectives. Private detectives, yes, yes. Yes. Ah, here's one. Full page ad. Must be doing very well. Richard Diamond, private detective. If you've got a case, share it with me. Richard Diamond. Circle seven. Yeah? Mr. Diamond? That's right. I want to hire you for a few days. Oh, you saw the ad. Well, it just so happens I'm available. I can't tell you much over the phone, too many extensions in the house, but it's about my daughter. I'm afraid she's going to get herself into some serious trouble. Well, how old is she? Twenty. Tell her to wait a year. My name is Chase, Ralph Chase. I live at 82 Maple Drive, Sands Point. Will you come out this evening? A hundred dollars a day and dibs on the icebox. I'll see you about eight. Goodbye, Mr. Diamond. What was that all about, Rick? Oh, I got a job, baby. When do you start? Oh, yes, you're right. No, Rick. You can start it in the morning. You can't break another one tonight. Now, come on, Helen, baby. A job's a job. And a date's a date. I won't let you break this one. Your car downstairs? Yes, but I can drive myself home. Please, Rick. You promised you wouldn't break another one. Keys in it? Yeah, look. I want to hire you to protect me for this evening. Hmm. I've been receiving mysterious phone calls, and I'm in fear of my life. Really? You've got to take the job. 
old friends come first. I'll have to get home and shave before I start working. You mean you'll take it? After 12.30. Bye, baby. You beast. Oh, you must be getting tired from driving that big car around all day. Grab a cab, honey. It'll give you some rest. I'll take good care of your car. What? Want a buck for the cab? Huh? No, no. On second thought, you only live about 25 blocks. Walk will do you good. Rick. Deep breathing all the way up Fifth Avenue. Nothing like it. Bye, baby. Oh! On the way to the car, I thought about Helen. The most wonderful girl in the world. Money, looks. But she had one bad fault. She wanted to get married. I got into the big sedan and headed for my apartment. I'd been up late the night before with the blonde singer, and I was feeling tired. Funny how things change. My nights in college were just as busy, but at one o'clock the next afternoon, I was out playing football. I faced facts pretty well, so when I got home, I took a nap. I slept until seven and got up and dressed. I drove Helen's car out to Long Island, and at eight o'clock sharp, I was ringing the doorbell of the Chase Mansion. It was a big house, all right. If they built another one like it, Long Island would sink. Well, to someone at me chamber door. My name's Chris. Boo. Blow your booze some other direction. Your breath would wither a lung. My alcoholic exhalations are composed of the finest ingredients. You must have a weak stomach. Look, if you'll just stagger out of the way, I'd like to see Mr. Chase. Dead or alive? What? Nothing. I was just thinking out loud. Well, go right ahead. And after your talk with my stepfather, you can find me in the bar. <laughs> You'll probably wind up like I am. That's a sweet thought. Where can I find your stepfather? Probably in the library, lying in my money. I left him leaning against the front door, gagging on the fresh air. I wandered down a long hallway and a big sitting room, furnished with enough antiques to make the Metropolitan Museum give up in shame. There was something about the place... A heavy quietness, like a bar of gold in a dark room. The shot had come from up ahead, and I tried a couple of doors before I found the room. Mr. Chase! Mr. Chase! In here! In here! Mr. Chase? Yes, yes. Come in and shut the door. I looked over at Ralph Chase crouching behind a desk. He got up slowly, all five feet of him. And I tagged him for a guy who would give a thousand dollars for every inch you could put on his legs. He looked like he could afford to be a mile high. The tall French windows were open at the back of the room, and you could still smell burning cordite. Someone tried to shoot me from the garden. Yeah, I heard the shot. You must be Diamond. That's right. Don't you think you better shut the French doors and pull the drapes before someone takes another shot? Yes, yes, very good idea. Uh, you pull the dime, the shade diamond. Hey, you can start earning your money right now. You're a little excited, but I'll start to work. All right. Uh, be careful, he might still be out there. Well, I doubt it. I can't see anyone out here. Oh, he just missed me. You can see where the bullet hit the wall. I jumped and hid behind the desk. Mm, didn't you hear him on the porch? No, he must have stood in the soft grass that surrounds the garden. That's a good ten feet from the house. You're lucky he didn't move in closer. He probably wouldn't have missed. Got any idea who it was? Of course, it was Murray Lang. Murray Lang? The gambler? Yes, do you know him? Well, I used to be on the force. Set him up six years ago on a larceny rap. Then you know what he's like. He was in the house this afternoon. We had an argument and he threatened me. An argument with your daughter? Yes, about my daughter. How'd you know? Well, you told me she was getting herself into trouble. She couldn't have picked a better playmate than Lang to get there with. Father, we heard a shot. Not really. Oh, let's go. He's not dead. My stepchildren, Mr. Diamond. Oh, well, lovely. I'm quite alive, so you can both stop looking so unhappy. Does it show? Come on, sis. Let's find the guy who fired that shot. I want to give him a few pointers. Where's Murray Lang, Miss Chase? Yes, he's the man you want. I'm sure he Don't tried... Don't be absurd. Murray left three hours ago. What are you, a cop? Does it show? You're wearing too much cologne. Come on, Chris. <laughs> Oh, she's nice. That's Elizabeth. The boy's her brother, Chris. I'd hate to draw straws. I married their mother and raised those two brats after she died. The courts appointed me executor of this state. They don't like you handling their money, is that it? Yes. Since they've been old enough to ask for 50 cents to go to a movie, they've condemned me for watching their interests. You, uh, you said you were worried about your stepdaughter. 
Tell me about it. I'll make it brief. Hate long explanations. Elizabeth got into some trouble with the police. Hit and run. She'd been drinking. The man died. Liz was sentenced to a year in Folsom. But I got her off on probation. Oh, what do you want me to do? Drive around with her and spoil her aim? Monday the probation expires. She says she is then going to marry this hoodlum, Murray Lang. And you don't want that because you think he's after her money? Exactly. When she marries, the will reads that I shall, as executor, turn over half of the estate to Elizabeth. What about Christopher? He looked irresponsible when he was born. His mother left instructions that he should not receive his share until he is 35. That's another eight years. Well, your uh, stepdaughter's old enough to know what she's doing. I can't see how you can stop her. That's what I want you to do. And if I do, you'd be in a pretty good spot. What do you mean, Mr. Diamond? You continue as executor. I can understand you thinking something like that, but believe me, as much as I dislike my stepchildren, I wish to keep them in line for their late mother's sake. Oh. Well, Mr. Chase, I'll, I'll take a look around outside. Maybe I can come up with something that'll point out the would-be killer. If it was Lang, you can stop worrying uh, about Elizabeth. Sing Sing doesn't boast a wedding chapel. I went out through the French doors and started looking around on the soft grass that bordered the garden. I had a fat hunch, so I stopped looking and started wandering. I was halfway through the rose bed when I spotted them. It was Elizabeth and a man. In the darkness, I couldn't make him out, but Murray Lang was my best guess. They went up a narrow path to one of those Chinese pagodas at the far end of the garden. Oh, Mary. And I slipped up close enough to give my ears a workout. It was Lang, all right. I don't care what you think. I didn't take a shot at the old man. Then who did? He's got a policeman in there now, and he's going to start trouble. Let him. I'm clean. If it was that lushed-up brother of yours. Chris hates him, but he'd never try to kill him. Well, then stop hounding me. Maybe you took a shot at the old boy. Murray! Well, you got a good reason. I'm tired trying to buck the whole Chase household. If you love me, let's take off tonight and get married. Tell the old man to go to the devil. You can certainly wait till Monday. Yeah, but he won't. He's going to cause some kind of trouble and get you tossed into Folsom. He's not going to give up all that money just because you're through with your probation. He probably cooked up that shooting to, just to get the cops here. Oh, Murray, what's going to happen to us? Oh, ask your stepfather. He's been doing your thinking for you. I don't have to. We'll get married Monday. Okay. I'm staying clear of this place till then. But what if there's more trouble? I haven't got anyone to turn to. You worry about it, baby. I got a police record that makes yours look like a merit badge. I was too good a target in the moonlight, so I started back up the walk to the house. As I passed a hedge, I noticed a funny-looking plant that was shoving its way out of the foliage. I'm sorry I did that. It was the Johnny Jump-Up variety. Black... <laughs> The guy on the other end of the sap gave it to me right over the eyes, and I went down like a crapshooter making a pass. I rolled over and watched the moon melt and run down in my eyes. Something warm and sticky spread over my face and turned the night red. Yeah, I was bleeding again. I guess I showed signs of recovering, so he started all over. This time, he used his foot in my side. Oh. Oh. Oh, a couple more kicks in the ribs and in the right place, and he could have whipped up a fast course of Nola. I felt tired, so I rolled up in an old rose bush and went to sleep. When you finally start coming around, it's like swimming your way out of an acre of mud. If you've taken enough beatings before, you diagnose things in a hurry. The pain in your head is where you got sapped. The ache in your ribs is where he booted you. And the thought in your mind is... Oh, it's something about an eye for an eye, if you've got one left. I sat up slowly and looked around. No one in sight. And my watch said ten o'clock. I'd been out for an hour, and I was feeling lonely until I started to get up. I made it to one knee and looked down at the best reason I could think of for staying home nights. It was Murray Lang, and you couldn't blame him for staring... He wasn't impolite, just dead. Something on the walk beside him gleamed in the moonlight. I took out my handkerchief and scooped it up. It was a little nickel-plated 32. You could still smell the fresh powder in the barrel. I put it in my pocket and stumbled back to the house. Chris opened the door. Well... You shouldn't drink so much. I never get so loaded I look like that. Well, try it sometime. It might be an improvement. Boo. I... I told you once before not to do that. 
Now, tell me, where were you ten minutes ago? I was in the bar. Who was with you? Red and green midgets. Now, let go of my collar. Okay. Where's the phone? In the hall. Hey, what's going on? Who beat you up? Nobody. I always bleed like this on warm nights. Huh? Big pores. Oh. Homicide, Sergeant Otis talking. Who taught you how? Did you sit up nights with a parrot? Oh, very funny. Only one guy could think up a lousy joke like that. What do you want, Diamond? A picture of you. I'm going to show some doctors that mercy killing has its points. Now, let me speak to the lieutenant. Comic. Homicide, Lieutenant Levinson. Hello, Walt. This is Diamond. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me get the bicarbonate. What's the matter? I get stomach trouble every time you call. Go ahead. All right. I got a killing for you. I I know it. I know it. Why can't you be a good boy and stop finding corpses? I'm out at Sands Point, 82 Maple Drive. I think I've got the murder weapon in my pocket. Who's dead? An old friend, Murray Lang, and you better step on it. There's a drunk staggering around the place, and he's liable to spot the body and put it in a cold shower to sober it up. Oh, all right, we'll be right out. Hold the fort. So Mr. Lang's dead? Hmm? You better stop sneaking up on people, Buster. And you'd better stop telling me what to do in my own house, Mr. Diamond. You sobered up pretty quick. I heard what you said about finding the murder weapon. May I see it? No. It stays in my pocket until homicide gets here. Whose gun is it? It's a 40-pound broadsword. Now, stop trying to look like a Chicago muscle man or I'll start oh, slapping you... Oh, there you are, Diamond. I've been looking for you. I... Scott, what happened to your face? Someone was giving away hints. Chris, did you have something to do with this? <laughs> Hardly. Mr. Diamond has a decided advantage over me. He has muscles. I'll be in the bar. What's happened? Where's Elizabeth? I don't know, but her boyfriend's got troubles. He, he can't explain the hole in this chest. Lang, what do you mean? He's out in the garden. Someone shot him. Is he dead? Well, if he's not, he's trying awful hard. Well, then we'd better call the police. That's been taken care of. What kind of a gun do you own, Mr. Chase? You don't see... No, I don't. I just dig around till I come up with something. What kind of a gun do you own? Why, you're 45... Now, wait a minute, Diamond. If you've got any ideas about this murder, you'd better wait until the police get here. Now, look, Chase, I've been insulted in your house, had the air let out of my ego by your beautiful stepdaughter, and beat up in your garden. That's a full night's work, and now I'm on my own time. Where can I find Elizabeth? I don't know. She may be up in her room. Oh, where is it? End of the hall, head of the stairs, first door. Thanks. Beginning to rain. What about Lang's body? Well, if he catches cold, call me. I went down the long hallway to the foot of a massive staircase. The only light was the one burning in the room I just left. I looked over at my sh over my shoulder and saw Mr. Chase framed in its dim glow, watching me. In that moment, I thought who Chase reminded me of: a triangle hat, his hand in his vest, and Napoleon had a twin. I went up the stairs, two at a time. Yes? Pardon me for barging in, but some guy in the garden just beat all the bashfulness out of me. How dare you? You get out of my room. You better put on something a little warmer, honey. That thing would start a Harry Carey epidemic in Boston. What do you want? Yeah. What did you do after Lang left you in the garden? What? Big ears. I overheard everything you said. I see someone pushed your face around. It's an improvement. Did Murray catch you eavesdropping? Well, if he did, he won't have much time to gloat. What do you mean? If you've done anything to Murray... Aren't you getting Murray, ready for bed a little early? I don't know what you want. I don't have to answer any of your ridiculous questions. Now, if you don't turn around and get out of here... What's the matter, baby? The drawer empty? Hmm. Lose something? No. Maybe this is it. Where did you get that gun? It was lying in the garden beside your boyfriend's body. Beside... That's it, lover. Now sit down and relax. Is Murray dead? Like Jimmy Fiddler's gossip column. Didn't you hear anything after Murray left you? Oh, no. I was crying. I ran back to the house and came up here. Is there another way back to the house besides the path that Murray took? It's one that leads to those outside doors. I, I came right to my room. Please leave me alone. This is your gun, isn't it? Yes, but I didn't do it. I didn't. Murray and I were going to be married Monday. Ballistics will probably show it's the one that did the job. You better tell me everything you know. I don't know anything. I didn't shoot Murray. Someone stole my gun from the drawer. Oh, please find out who did it. If they hold me, I'll go to prison anyway. Please, Mr. Diamond, please. It's going to be tough if this is the gun. I'm pretty sure it is. You could still smell the powder when I... The powder. What's the matter, Mr. Diamond? Huh? Oh. Oh, nothing, nothing. Look, uh... 
You stay in your room. Maybe I can do you some good. I promise you'll stay here. Sure. I'm not going anyplace. Ah, and try and snap out of it. Sometimes you keep losing until there's nothing left to play with. It breaks the jinx. I went downstairs and started looking for Chase. As I passed the doors leading to the garden, I stopped cold. A flash of lightning turned the garden flat white. Someone was standing over what was left of Murray Lang. Well, like the view? Oh, Diamond. I was just looking at the body. I talked with your daughter. She says the gun that killed Lang was hers. What? Claims they had an argument, but won't admit she shot him. Oh, no, I can't believe it. Certainly she had no reason, unless... Unless what? Well, unless she found out Lang was just after her money. Well, that's, uh, that's possible. Anyway, if she did do it, I still can't figure who worked me over. Maybe it was Lang. You told me yourself he didn't like you. Maybe it was Elizabeth. Oh, no. It would have to be somebody very strong. She might have kicked you, but never could she have hit you hard enough to crack your head open like that. Yeah. Uh, uh, tell me, when does Elizabeth come into her money? Why, at the end of the probation. The court set it aside until she was cleared of all charges. Who gets it if she goes to prison? Well, I'm the sole executor of the state, but she's not going to jail. She didn't do this thing. I'll get the best counsel in the country. I'm sure you will. Uh, tell me something, Chase. It's pretty obvious that my face got pushed around, but uh, how did you know my ribs got the same treatment? What? It doesn't show. It just hurts. Why, I... Uh, well, you told me. Uh -uh. What are you getting at, Diamond? You'd have to reach pretty high to sap me, but if you were mad enough, you could make it. This is absurd. I'm going inside. And when I get grouchy, it's better to listen. I'm liable to use you to make the flowers grow. Go ahead, Mr. Diamond. I'm listening. Well, everybody in this house has some sort of motive for killing. With Elizabeth, it could be the old story of a woman scorned. With your lushed-up stepson, he could want to put the blame on his sister so he'd get more than his share of the estate. And we certainly know you stand to profit if Elizabeth goes to prison... Because you retain custody of the family fortune. I'm getting wet, Mr. Diamond. Everybody's story's weak, but only one of them doesn't stand up. You said earlier this evening someone tried to shoot you from outside your library. Of course they did. You have the shot and saw the bullet hole. That's right, I did. But you told me he was standing outside the room by a good ten feet. Nothing to say, Chase? You're trying to catch me up in something. Oh, you are so right. Now, when I walked into that room, I could still smell burning cordite. To smell fresh gunpowder like that, the gun would have have to have been fired outside the room. You staged it, so I'd think someone was trying to kill you. Is that all, Mr. Diamond? Outside of the slip you made about kicking me in the ribs. Now, ah, let's go inside. I don't think so, Diamond. Oh. Oh, that the forty-five you were telling me about? Yes. Go ahead, make a try for it. I'm going to show you how it works. You kill Lang with your stepdaughter's gun, and you're going to collect the money if she goes to prison. Oh, you're a slob. My stepdaughter could easily kill two men tonight. Now, you're in a spot. You can't shoot me with that forty-five and make it look like the same person killed Lang, too. So you've got to get the thirty-two in my pocket. Give me Elizabeth's gun, Diamond. You try and get it, Chase. Why, you... Rick! Rick, are you out there? Better give it up, Chase. That's the law. He eats little men like you. Rick! Stay right there, Diamond. Another killing won't matter if you try and stop me. For Pete's sake, if you're out there, Rick, answer me. I'm getting soaked. Just keep your mouth closed, Diamond. I'm getting out of here. You'll never make a chase. They'll pick you up inside of an hour. Not if you're too dead to tell them. Yes, that's it. If I kill you, I'll eat at least have a You should watch your step, Chase. Keep your head down, Lieutenant. Somebody's mad. Shut up, Otis, and get out from under that bench. Rick! Over here, Walt. What's going on, Rick? Who's doing all the shooting? Oh, well, we took turns. He was just going to kill me when he tripped over the body of his first victim. I used this thirty-two in my pocket, shot him twice. He's dead, Lieutenant. Give me my baking soda, Otis. Hey, yeah, Lieutenant. Don't look so unhappy, Rick. He was going to kill you. Oh, I'm not unhappy. I I'm just sore that I didn't have time to take the gun out of my pocket. I ruined a darn good coat. <laughs> The three of us went back in the house and Otis took Christopher up to bed so he could sleep it off. Walt listened to the story as I told it to Elizabeth. She cried a little and thanked me with her eyes. Walt went downstairs to clean things up and I sat by her bed and until she went to sleep. She didn't even wake up when I kissed her goodbye. <laughs> oh, I guess it was better that way. 
I said goodbye to Walt and Otis and headed for 975 Park Avenue. I was late. And my face could use a mile of bandage. I hoped Helen wouldn't mind. Yes? Oh, my goodness. Hello, Francis. Tell Miss Asher I brought a car back. Oh, how bad a wreck was it, sir? Give me a glass for the backbone, will you, Francis? Yes, sir. Right away, sir. And Miss Asher's in the study. Ah, oh, thank you. Goodness. Thank you. Hi. Well, it's about... Oh, Rick, not again. Mm-hmm. Your poor little face. Yeah, my poor little face. Well, you just stretch out on the couch and I'll get you a nice tall drink. Francis is already on his way. Oh. Feel better? Yeah, oh yes. Got a pillow? I'll hold your head up. How's this? Mm-hmm. Like some music to go with it? Sure. Turn on the radio. You comfortable? Mm-hmm. How about you? Uh-huh. That music sounds like San Francisco. Remember the top of the mark? Yeah, fun too. <laughs> Mind if I turn off the light? The glow from the fire is enough. You're cute. Better? Much. The snow is snowing, the wind is blowing, but I can weather the storm. What do I care how much it may storm? I've got my love to keep me warm. Mm -hmm. Me. I can't remember a worse December. Just watch those icicles fall. What do I care if icicles fall? I've got my love to keep me warm. I like your singing, too. Off with my overcoat, off with my glove. I need no overcoat, I'm burning with love. My heart's on fire, the flame grows higher. So I will weather the storm. Why do I care how much it may storm? I've got my love to keep me warm. Oh, that was nice. Hey, why did you turn the radio on? This is nicer. Come here, Rick. Oh, honey. Honey, you're reading my mind. Here's your drink, Mr. Diamond. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> You have just heard the fourth of a new series, Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Betty Moran, Jay Novello, Jack Edwards, and Tal Avery. Music was under the direction of David Baskerville. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. Even here in America, we're liable to have a few misconceptions about freedom. Many of us regard it as an outright gift with no strings attached. Well, that isn't quite so. All of us have received a heritage of liberty, a legacy of freedom forged in other days. Remember that the liberty you enjoy is a precious legacy, a legacy that can be lost through disuse. Don't ignore freedom. Work at it. For freedom is everybody's job. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This program has come to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.
Dick Powell, transcribed as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. My name's Diamond, and like a lot of working people, at five o'clock in the afternoon, I get pretty anxious for six o'clock to roll around, especially if I haven't had a client for the last three days. But even if I don't expect anyone to drop in before six, I can't take a chance, so I stare out of my office window on 53rd Street just to kill time. I see the night starting to muscle in on the Broadway bright lights, and I wonder just how many prospective clients are out in the city. Who's getting in trouble? What kind of trouble? And will they come to Richard Diamond for guidance? Now, take the two hard-looking thugs in the downtown hotel room as they watch a pretty blonde hurriedly get into a flashy mink coat. They're going to need plenty of guidance. Where are you going, Dottie? I got an appointment. Uh, don't you think you ought to stick around just in case the contact comes in? If it ain't here by now, it won't be until tomorrow. Now stop looking like a couple of anxious bloodhounds. Relax. Sure, Dottie, sure. Uh, but you really cannot blame us for being a little disquieted. <laughs> don't she look classy, Al? Hey, who are you going to roll tonight, doll face? Your grandmother. Oh, ain't she out of Alcatraz yet? Hey, I, I don't like no cracks about my family. Well, what are you going to do, Stan? People stop by the zoo every day. Yeah. Now, please, no legomachy. Yeah, no leg Yeah. You keep running off at the mouth like that, baby, and you'll be spitting out all your teeth. Yeah, well, when you kick off, Stan, don't try to sell your body to science. I'll never get both heads in that bottle. Why, you... Please. Please. I'm, I'm, I'm going to hit... Please. Yeah. Please. Leave us, Dottie. And, Stanley, you shut your big mouth before I shove my foot in it. We... Go on, Dottie. I think you had better make a hurried percolation. What? Feed it. Down. Oh, Al, why didn't you let me mess her up a little? She's always acting like she's got a family background. I do not know whether her family had anything to do with it, but it is a very nice background to gaze at. Now shut your ugly face and let us start tailing her. Yeah, tailing her? What for? I think she is up to something. Yeah, well, sure she is, but I don't want to get booked as a peeping Tom. <laughs> Stan, you are a melon head. I think she is going to try a cross. Florida has not never been late with the numbers before. Yeah. You think she's going to pick up the bundle and skip? No. I just want to see what she does with her evenings. Oh, well, I can tell you that. She... Stanley, please. You arouse my irascibility. Oh, I'm sorry, Aloysius. Paper. Evening paper. Paper. Evening, Glenda. Oh, hello, Horace. Times. You look tired. Hard day at the office? I stayed home. My wife's swell. Mm. Here's the times. Yeah, thanks. Good night, Glenda. Good night. Papers. Evening papers. Have you got a light edition? Why, yes. Right here, dearie. You got it? Yeah, in the purse. Put it down on the counter and look through the paper. Okay. Paper. Evening paper. What do you want me to do with the purse? Keep it till I meet you at the train. Sure, honey. It's good to be working again, ain't it, Dotty? I gotta go. They usually got a tail on me. I'll see you tomorrow morning. Relax. We're in the chips. Paper! Evening paper! Uh, paper, sir? No, but I will take that purse. Purse? Oh, why, that nice young lady must have left it on the counter when she looked at the paper. Please, just extend your agent index and shove it over here. Why, I can't do that. He belongs to that young lady. Oh, look, it would make me very unhappy to have to shove all those nice old wrinkles around, but I am in need to possess one patent letter handbag. Now, if you will kindly move it to my approximate latitude, you old bat, we can dispense with all... Why, you poor excuse for a low-brow gun if... Madam. For two cents, I'd wrap a lead sap across your flat head. Well, hello, Glenda, hello. How's, how's oh. business? Oh, Officer Quine... Aren't you on a little late? <laughs> yes, uh, I've been changed to the six o'clock beat. Well, good evening, sir. Uh, yeah, lovely. Uh, good evening, officer. Say, haven't I seen you somewhere before? Uh, hardly. I reside in Flatbush. Well, thank you, mother. I do not see anything I want. Uh, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't see anything he wants. What does he think you're running at? A drugstore there? <laughs> hey, Al, I saw a cop. Mm, I am proud of you, Stanley. Huh? Now let us hurry around this corner. What, you think Dot and the old dame are cooking up something together? Stop here so we can watch the old dame. Stanley, to put it in your words, yeah, I think they are cooking up something. Oh, you figure she slipped the old girl the numbers? Your perception astounds even my astute. Hey, 
Abzai. Oh, yeah. Your grandma is taking off and leaving the cop behind to watch the papers. Yeah, she's going in that building. She has got the purse. Stanley, yeah. stay here and await my return. Okay, but uh, my feet are beginning to hurt. Go in a drugstore, purchase some Blue Jays. I shall be right back with the purse. <laughs> Mr. Diamond. Well, hello, Glenda. Come in, pull up a rocking chair. Well, that's the way it begins. Sometimes when you wait around until the last minute, you get a customer. I wasn't too happy about this one because I knew she didn't have enough money to hire a tramp to spot cigarette butts. I haven't got much time. I've got Officer Quine watching my paper stand. Officer Quine? Hmm. You should be happy you aren't selling fruit. He's already got his thumbprint and every apple in Yonkers. Mr. Diamond, I found this purse. Ah, uh, found it, Glenda? Oh, you know me, Mr. Diamond. I'm going straight now. I remember a snake that said that once. He broke his back. Honest, I haven't been doing that kind of business since I got out. Well, what can I do for you, Glenda? I'm broke. Oh, it's not a touch. I want you to find the owner of this purse and return it. Why don't you give it to Officer Quine? Well, there's no money in it. And with my record, he'd sure run me in for purse snatching. No money, huh? Oh, no. No, I didn't touch a thing. Just uh, took a peek, maybe. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> a young girl left it on my counter. If you find her, you can ask her. I didn't touch a thing. Okay, I'll see what I can do. Oh, thank you, Mr. Diamond. Goodbye. Keep your nose clean. Oh, I will. She'd keep her nose clean, all right, in a glass of gin. I'd known old Glenda ever since she started working bunco rackets and got put away for two to five. I was sure she'd lifted the dough from the purse, but I opened it and went through it anyway. I was just kicking myself for telling her I'd try to dig up its owner when the door opened and an ugly-looking mug wearing alligator spats walked up to my desk. You should be ashamed looking in someone else's purse. It's a bad habit, like not knocking on doors. Oh, it said on the door to come in. How long did you have to wait before someone came by to read it to you? May I please have the purse? Oh, is it yours? Yes. Well, I didn't notice the wedges. Give up high heels? You are a very poor comic. Now, may I have the purse, or must I make you bleed? Oh, oh, it's like that. Well, sure, here it is. Thank you. <gasps> and something to go with it. Oh. I caught him with one that made my arm feel good clear up to my shoulder. His eyes rolled back, and he went down faster than the celluloid collar on the flagpole. I looked at the black purse and started getting that lousy feeling again. I'd gotten into something, and it was beginning to smell already. So I called the 5th Precinct Police Station and an old friend, Lieutenant Levinson. Homicide, Sergeant Otis. Hello, Otis. Let me talk to the lieutenant. Is this Diamond? No, it's platoon number three of the Brownies, 300 strong. Now let me talk to the lieutenant. Hey, what are you going to do with all those tired jokes when you run out? Give them away to idiots. You want to start a collection? Oh, uh, nuts. Lieutenant Levinson. Hello, Walt. Diamond. Oh, wait a minute. Otis. Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant. Where'd you put the bicarbonate? In the top drawer, Lieutenant. Oh, uh, hold it a minute, Rick. Get me some water, Otis. Yellowtown. Go ahead, Rick. I can stand it for a second. Well, if you didn't get so excited, you wouldn't have to take that stuff. Here you are, Lieutenant. Never need this stuff until you call. Now, who's dead? Uh, nobody, but there's a guy in my office lying on the floor. He's dead. He's got to be. No, he isn't, Walt. I just belted him in the mouth when he tried to get rough. Oh. Uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. He's trying oh. to wake up. Groan for the nice policeman. Oh. You hear him, Walt? Okay, so some guy got tired and went to sleep on your floor. What do you want me for? Uh, hold it a second, Walt. He's getting a little too active. What did you do? I kissed him goodnight. What did you do that for? Well, I've seen him somewhere. I think he's wanted. Oh, well, hang on to him. I'll send the wagon down. The door will be open. I'll fix it so he doesn't get away. Wait a minute, Rick. Where are you going? Well, about five minutes ago, an old dame hands me a black patent leather purse and asks me to find the owner. Right afterwards, this cultured gorilla wanders in and says the purse belongs to him. Oh, what's in it? Nothing much. A compact, book of matches, and a handkerchief. Mmm, smells nice. No money? No. Oh, uh, I gotta stop by Helen Ashes for a minute, and then I'm gonna find out what makes this purse so valuable. I'll say hello to Helen for me. Sure thing. Bye, Walt. Be a good boy. Goodbye. <laughs> I got a rope out of my desk that I hung my socks on when I had time to wash them and tied the sleeping Garneth to a chair. I didn't know much about pocketbooks, but I knew someone who did, 
So I headed for 975 Park Avenue and a beautiful redhead named Helen Asher. Oh, good evening, Mr. Diamond. Good evening, Francis. Is Miss Asher in? Yes, sir. She's in the study. Shall I announce you? No, just dig up something that'll get me back on my feet. I'll let myself in. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Diamond. Yes, Francis? If you'll pardon me for saying so, sir, but I just love the way you talk. Well, thank you, Francis. Eaton, 98. Majored in Sloyd. Oh, oh, my goodness, you're pulling my leg again. Anyone home? Rick, you got here. Hi. Hi. Well, since when did you start carrying a purse? Like it? Matches my complexion. Oh, you idiot. Take a look. Whose is it? Mm, got to find out. It's worth something. One guy already tried to get it the hard way. Cigarette? Oh, well, thanks. It's got some initials on it. D.K. There's nothing valuable in it. I know. That's what I can't understand. Got a match? Here's some in the purse. Thanks. Here. Hmm. Adams Hotel. Flop house with sheets. Compact's never been used. My darling. Well, thanks. Oh, the perfume and the handkerchief, silly. It's my darling. Oh. Ah, oh, don't look so hurt. So are you. Well, come here. <laughs> Rick. Here's your drink, Mr. Dab. Oh, my goodness. Oh, that's all right, Francis. I was just trying to convince your boss we should take in the wrestling matches. Why, Francis, you're blushing. Oh, pardon me. Miss Asher's residence. Yes, sir. One moment, sir. It's for you, Mr. Dam. Oh, thank you, Francis. I'll see if the dinner is ready, Miss Helen. Hello? You get right down here. What? Lieutenant Levinson. Get down here to the station, Diamond. You're in trouble. Diamond? Wait a minute. Slow down. Not dead, huh? My stomach starts getting back to normal and you have to knock some guy off. Knock some guy off? I don't know why I should waste time with explanations. I ought to just send notice over there with the wagon, but I like your girlfriend too much. What are you babbling about? I thought you said the guy in your office was still kicking. What? Yeah, somebody made a punch board out of his chest and I like you for a suspect. Now get down here. Wait a minute, Walt. Somebody shot him? Yeah. If that wasn't what killed him, he died of fright when he saw the bullets coming. Now, I'm not talking anymore till you get here. Make it ten minutes or I'll have a warrant out for you. Oh, swell. Rick, what's the matter? Oh, that crazy Walt Levinson's got me in line for a murder rap. I gotta go down and square myself. Murder? Rick! Yeah? I'll see you later, baby. But, Rick... I can't wait. I'll get back as soon as I can. If we were married, this wouldn't happen. Rick, you forgot the purse! Francis! Francis! Yes, Miss Asher? Francis, Mr. Diamond forgot this purse. See if you can catch him. He's gone to Lieutenant Levinson's police station. Yes, Miss Asher, my best. Rick just has got to stop this foolishness. He... Oh. How did you get in here? Who are you? I come in a back way, lady. Uh, where's the shamus? You get out of here. No, just just relax, baby. One yell out of you and you get hurt pretty bad. What? Uh, where's the shamus? He went down to the police station. Okay. Where's the purse? I saw him bring it in. Uh... I don't know. Oh, come on, baby. Or do I shake it out of you? You, you stay away from me. You... Hood. Hood? Hey, where's the purse? I told you I don't know. No, stay away. Okay. But you're making it tough on yourself. Stay away. You stay away from me. With <laughs> Underneath her arm, she walks the bloody tower uh, with the red tucked underneath her arm at the midnight hour. Pardon me, uh, sir. Uh, oh, yes, madam? I believe you have my purse. Oh, I beg your pardon, but this purse is the property of Mr. Diamond, private detective. Yes, I know. I gave it to him to hold for me. Well... I'm very sorry, madam, but you'll have to claim it from Mr. Diamond himself. Oh, yeah? Help! Police! Oh, madam. Measure! Madam! Help! This man is trying to steal my purse. Uh, madam, uh, let go of my coat. This guy giving you trouble, mother. He's trying to steal my purse. Help! Oh, yes, huh? Looks just the type. This will learn you, Romeo. Oh, my. You're gonna know, lady, will you? Come on, get up and fight it. Hey, lady! Lady! How do you like that? Didn't even say thanks. Now, look, Rick, 
I don't care what you say. You told me you had a guy in your office. When my men got there, they found him tied in the chair with three bullet holes in his chest. He was making noises when I left. Some guys do that when they get shot. Oh, stop being an idiot. You know I didn't kill him. Yeah, I know it, but what do I tell the commissioner? That I let you go because you're a friend of mine? Used to be on the force? No, but you don't have to act like I rubbed out the whole west side. Well, I'm mad. I want to retire in five years, and I want to do it with a healthy stomach. Yeah? Lieutenant, Murphy's got some guy out here he picked up for purse snatching. Says he's a friend of Diamonds and wants to see him. Send him in. This can't get any screwer than it is already. I got a purse snatcher who says he knows you. Purse snatcher? Francis. Yes, Mr. Diamond. I, I don't feel so well. That's all, Otis. Isn't he your girlfriend's butler? Yeah. What happened, Francis? Well, sir, I was bringing that purse down to you. That's right. I left it at Helen's. Yes, sir. Well, a little old lady approached me on the street and claimed it belonged to her. What did she look like? She had white hair, and she was wearing an old shawl. I think she'd been drinking gin, sir. Cheap gin. Glenda. Glenda Bergen? Is she the one who gave you the purse? Yeah. And then what happened, Francis? When I wouldn't give her the purse, she started yelling and called me a masher. And some enormous gentleman arrived and clouted me in the jaw. Oh, it was disgusting, sir. And the old lady got the purse? Yes, sir. She ran off, uh, and the enormous gentleman sat on my chest until an officer came and carted me off to this place. Was Miss Helen all right when you left her? Why, yes, sir. You don't think... I don't know. But if they knew I had the purse and spotted me going into Helen's... Here, Rick, use his phone. Thanks. Don't you see, Walt, this whole thing has something to do with that purse. Purse, purse. I've still got a stiff on my hands. Oh, my goodness. Hello, honey. You all right? Oh. What's the matter? Hi. Please come home. What happened? A man broke into the house looking for that old purse. I told him I didn't know where it was, and he started slapping me. He did, huh? Yes, and I need comforting. Well, honey, I've still got something to do. Lock all the doors until Francis gets back, and I'll be over as soon as I can. All right. Did you get the purse? Francis will tell you all about it. Bye, baby. Bye. Rick, some louse shoved Helen around. Francis, get over there and take care of her. It's all right if he goes, isn't it, Walt? I guess so. Otis, I'm releasing the guy that was picked up for purse snatching. And don't say, yeah, Lieutenant. Okay, Rick. Oh, thank you, sir. Step on it, Francis. Miss Asher needs someone to take care of her. Yes, sir. Walt, give me two hours to find out what this is all about. Are you going after Glenda? Yeah. If she's tied up with this killing, I'd better send some of the boys along. Give me two hours alone. I want to find the guy who shoved Helen around. Okay, Rick. Two hours, and I put in a general alarm for you and the old dame. You know where she lives? I got a shack over near the East River. Thanks, Walt. Otis, let Diamond go and bring me a tablespoon and some water. And Otis, shut up! I grabbed a cab, and 20 minutes later, I was standing at the edge of the East River. The fog was rolling in, and pretty soon it would be so thick you could put it in bales. Below me, next to the water, was a line of weather-beaten shacks, and one of them belonged to old Glenda. You want something, Mac? Huh? Oh. Oh, I didn't see you. Uh, does uh, old Glenda live in one of those shacks? Yeah, that one. Got a match? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, keep them. Thanks. Forget it. No, uh, wait a minute. Huh? Let me see those matches. Hmm. I've forgotten all about them. What's the matter? You collect them or something? Uh, these I do. Sorry, pal. You'll have to get some others. Okay, sporty. The inside of the shack looked like a hardware store after a good earthquake. Someone had torn it to pieces, and old Glenda had gotten the same treatment. She was lying on the wooden floor, staring up at me. She couldn't close her eyes because the rope around her neck was squeezing them open. Is she dead? Huh? I followed you down. Well, hooray for you. The next time you sneak up on somebody, you'll probably end up with a skull fracture. Just wanted to see what was going on. Is she dead? Unless she can breathe through her feet. She's been strangled. Gonna call the cops? No, no. I thought I'd rub her wrists for a while. Now, here's a buck. Call Lieutenant Levinson at the 5th Precinct and tell him what's happened. Sure. Got a nickel? Yeah, here. And tell him I've gone over to the Adams Hotel on 28th Street. My name's Diamond. Good for you. Now step on it. He left in a hurry, and I reached in my pocket and took another look at the book of matches I'd gotten from the black handbag. They were from the Adams Hotel on 28th Street, so I went over there fast. The sleepy night clerk showed me the register, and I found what I was looking for. 
I remembered the initials on the handbag were D.K. A Dorothy King was registered in room 306. I went upstairs. Yeah? I got a message for you. Slip it under the door. I'm not that skinny. What is it? It's from Glenda. Oh, wait a minute. All right, the door's open. All right, now shut it and come on in. Huh? Oh, what a lovely gun. Glad you like it. Now, what do you want? I just left Glenda. She's dead. What? Yeah, strangled. How'd you find me? Matches in your purse. They were from this hotel. I checked the initials on the bag with the register. D.K., Dorothy King, room 306. Holmes would call it elementary. You must be the shamus Glenda gave the bag to earlier this evening. That's right. How did you know? Well, she called me. she tell you she got it back? I feel a quiet streak coming on. I usually like women who don't talk much, but right now you'd better start talking as fast as you can. Funny thing, this gun I got makes me lazy. Now get out of here. Baby, baby, I got a big fat surprise for you. Yeah? Yeah. My gun makes bigger holes than yours. Huh? What do you think I'm doing with my right hand, keeping it warm? Oh, don't give me that. You ain't got nothing but a big finger in that pocket. Oh! Surprise. Next time I make it count. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Sure. Drop it. Now, that's better. Kick it over here. All right. Please. I didn't kill Glenda. Where's the purse? I ain't got it on us. Well, who has? Now, look, baby, I'm in a bad mood. Honest, I don't know. That's right. She don't, mister. Stan. Well, you certainly know some pretty ugly company, Dottie. I don't know if I like that. You don't? Maybe I can word it a little different. Stan, he's a private cop. He come up here and tried to shove me around. Well, you should have done it, Shamus. Would have saved me the trouble. What do you mean, huh? Why, you no good cheap double crosser. Al and me saw you slip the bag to that old dame, and Al got killed trying to get it from the Shamus. I didn't kill Al. No, the old dame did it. I went up to the office and found him dying. He told me she'd done it. What are you gonna do? Well, the organization don't like being crossed. I got the purse from the old dame and paid her off for killing poor old Al. Now I gotta pay you off. I got a surprise for you, too, Stanley. Yeah. You try anything, you'll have more holes in you than a fishnet. He's got a gun in his pocket. Well, look at his pocket, wise guy. Oh, gee, I wish Al was here. He'd know what to do. Come on, shoot him. Shoot him. Stan's got it coming. Looks like it's a tie. No sense in both of us getting killed. Yeah. Yeah, you you plug me and I'll nail you before I go down. Don't listen to him. I think he's got a point. What are you going to do? That's up to him. Well, as Al would say, a hurried departure is in order. I'll take care of you later, Doc. Huh? Uh, goodbye, all. <laughs> it's pretty good. Al would like that. Don't let him get away. Stop him. You stop him. All right, baby. Where is he going with that purse? If I tell you, will you give me a chance to get out of town? I can't do anything about that. When I leave, you're on your own. Technically, you haven't done anything the law could hold you for. I haven't? No. But that won't stop me from pushing you around. Now, let's have the story. If Stan hasn't been there already, he's headed for a locker in the subway station at 34th Street. What's in the locker? $100,000 in counterfeit bills. Oh. Oh, baby. Counterfeit. You have been naughty. Now, Papa, we'll have to keep you on ice for the cops. Get in the closet. Oh, please, give me a break. Sorry, honey. Get in. Ouch! You're hurting me! I went down to the night clerk and told him to tell Lieutenant Levinson when he got there about the blonde in the closet of room 306. The subway wasn't far, but Stanley had a head start and he was in a hurry. I ran the rest of the way. I went down the steps. A train was just pulling out when I spotted him. He'd just taken a bundle out of one of the lockers, and as he turned to go, I walked up behind him. Hello, Stanley. What? What you got in the box? The shamus. Here, you take it. Oh. He tossed the package in my face and started running for the exit. But a crowd of people blocked his way, and when he saw me come up with my gun, he changed his mind. He turned and vaulted the turnstile, and I ducked behind the row of lockers. He had a gun, too. I tried to get a clear shot at him, but there were too many people. And then the frightened little guy did a stupid thing. He jumped down on the tracks and started running up the tunnel. Oh, look at that fool man! He's jumped down on the tracks! Stanley, come back here. You can't get anywhere that way. You said it, Mac. He's running uptown on the downtown side. Here's a corny line. Stop or I'll shoot. You won't get me! Stan! Look out, there's a train coming. Look out! No! Oh! 
Oh, Mr. Diamond, come in. Hello, Francis. Is Miss Asher all right? She's better, sir. She's lying down in the study. How's the jaw? Oh, I feel better, sir. This ice bag is helping the swelling. I'll be in the pantry if you need me, sir. I'll try not to. Hi. Hi. Well, poor little baby. Yes, poor little baby. You're lucky he didn't knock you out. Oh, I'll get it. Francis is nursing his face. Asher residence? Let me talk to Diamond if he's there. He is. Rick? Mm Mm-hmm. Now, you listen to me. I've been chasing your conquests all over town. I end up down in the subway station. I notice gets stuck in the turnstile. Don't you think it'd be nice to let the police department in on something once in a while? Oh, sure, sure. Right now, I'm at 975 Park Avenue, nursing a beautiful redhead back to health. Oh, did you find the blonde in the closet? Yeah, I got the whole story from her. You want to hear it? I guessed most of it. She was fencing for a counterfeit ring as she tried to cross them. The key to the locker was in that purse. Yeah, in the compact, under the pancake makeup. She and old Glenda used to do a duet together before they both got sent up. When the blonde got out, she started working for a counterfeit mob. They'd stashed the dough in different subway lockers around town and used her to make the contacts. So she figured she could use the 100000 Well, nothing like being in business for yourself. Well, she was afraid to pick it up herself, so Ricky. she slipped the purse to Glenda like she'd just forgotten it. Ricky! Yes, dear? Are you listening to me? I just stopped. Bye, Walt. What? Now, wait a... What is it, baby? I want some sympathy. Sure, sure. What would you like, lover? Sing something. Oh, come on, baby. We can do without that. No, I want you to. I'm sick, and then blood should be pampered. Oh, let me rub your head or something. Mm, afterwards. I want you to sing. Oh, but it's late, baby. Well, then sing softly. Sing me to sleep. Oh, honey. I'll get mad, and you'll have to buy me a present. Ah, uh, okay. Lullaby and good night with roses be dyed. That's wonderful. With lilies be Hey, you look at board your tonsils! Shut up! I'm trying to sleep! Well, what is that? Oh, it's that grouchy new neighbor. Oh, it is, huh? Mm-hmm. Hey, you want something, bud? Yeah, shut your big bezel. Oh, is that right? Out of your face with sunshine. Oh, no! Put on a great big smile. Make up your eyes with laughter. You will Please, all... Rick. Yeah, okay. That guy gets shell-shocked if he fried potatoes. Rick. What is it, baby? Come here. Oh. You do need pampering. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Betty Lou Gerson, Jane Morgan, Jack Crucian, High Averback, Herb Butterfield, and Wally Mayer. Music was under the direction of David Baskerville. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This program has come to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. My name's Diamond, and I'm in business for a very simple reason. I like money. Oh, sure, I could do better, but I don't believe in straining myself. I might make a few bucks more, but so what? You work harder, your back gets weaker... And you take that extra couple of bucks and spend it for a brace to keep you from folding in the middle. 
No, I got a little one-room office that leans out over Broadway, and I'm very happy. Sometimes I get a case that lasts a week, a hundred bucks a day in expenses, and I make enough to pay the rent. Take my girl Helen Asher to dinner a couple of times and rest my feet on the desk like a prosperous businessman. I'm in partnership with a shill called Human Nature. And with him on my side, it just figures that people are going to get in trouble. Like the character who's ringing the doorbell of an apartment on the east side. He's built just right for more trouble than he can handle. Well. Hello, Mrs. Moran. You say that like you're really glad to see me. I'll let you know as soon as we can talk business. Did you bring a rubber hose along? Why? Are you going to be hard to get along with? This time, yes. Where's your husband? He went out. I tried to convince him the window was the quickest way to the street, but he's old-fashioned. He took the elevator. You're drunk. You can't get a bit out of me. Want a drink? Just get the 500. I don't want to be around when your old man gets back. You couldn't afford that, could you? No, and I don't think you could either, baby. Now let's stop playing games, Mrs. Moran. I've got a big, fat surprise for you, Mac. Keep it in small bills. Isn't that funny? That's your surprise. Yeah? Yeah. You don't get the money. You get something else. Stop yelling. You'll have the whole building up here in a minute. you will be up anyway, Mac. A gunshot makes people curious. Now, wait a minute. You don't have to pull a gun. I don't have to do anything. And I'm breaking myself of one habit right now. I'm through paying your dirty blackmail. Now, you know I got my orders. If I don't collect, someone else will be around. Come on, give me the gun. Sure. A piece of the time. I need a drink. Well, here's to nothing, Betty, old girl. and shot to death in blackmail plot. Socialite Betty Moran kills gangster, then takes own life. Read all about it, paper. Hi, kid. Oh, paper, mister? Yeah. Hey, I'll uh, keep the chair. Oh, thanks. Wealthy wife of William Moran kills... Well, I have to call Mr. Moran. No sense to lose a good source of income. <laughs> Come in. Mr. Diamond? Over here. Oh, this clothesline, I, I couldn't see you. Do you always do your laundry in your office? Free soap. Pull up a chair, Mr. Uh, Moran. Uh, William Moran. Oh. Mm. Nice pair of Argyles. One of my old clients. Sends them down from Sing Sing. Have you read the morning papers, Mr. Diamond? I haven't had time. Took some throw rugs down to the laundry mat before I started on the socks. My wife died last night. What did you eat for breakfast? Why, uh, pancakes and eggs? Why? You must eat a whole pig when you're not in mourning. How did she die? She was shot to death. Couldn't she get two people for a pyramid club? She was being blackmailed. It's usually the other way around. The victim shoots the blackmailer. She did that. His name was Mac Grayson. Hmm? I want you to find the other man behind this blackmail ring. Oh, what makes you think there was more than one? I received an anonymous phone call this morning... It was from a man who said he was a friend of Mac Grayson. He made it perfectly clear that he was going to continue with the blackmail. You uh, know what they had on your wife? She was a very wealthy woman, Mr. Diamond. Before she married me, she was rather uh, wild. Well, they get that way sometimes. There were some letters. Why don't you go to the police? As far as they're concerned, the case is closed. They say it's a murder and a suicide, and that's that. But I want to get the people who drove my wife to suicide. Okay, Mr. Moran, but if you want me to try and dig up your blackmailers, my fee is rather high. I want to start sending my laundry out. Money is no object. That's the nicest thing you could have said. A hundred dollars a day and a fifth of plasma. Plasma, Mr. Diamond? A hundred proof. I never know what I'm going to run into in a case like this. I may bleed a little. You can reach me at Evergreen 45021. I'll write you a check. Here, uh, use my pen. It's getting an inferiority complex. Do you know anything more about this man who called you this morning? No, only that he said he was a friend of Mac Grayson's. 
Oh, there you are, Mr. Diamond. This should be enough of a retainer. Oh, yes, yes. And uh, that's all you know? I'm sorry I can't be of more help. Oh, you've been a brick. I'll get the rest from Homicide. Thank you and goodbye, Mr. Brandt. Goodbye, Mr. Diamond, and good luck. Oh, I'm sorry I knocked down some of your washing. Uh, there. Well, I'll be hearing from you. Well, that's the way it goes. One minute you're washing socks, and the next you've got enough money to stake out a claim on every night spot from Mott Street to Harlem. Unless a particular blackmail ring likes to kill private detectives. I had a hunch the assignment might run into overtime, so I put in a call to a lovely redhead named Helen Asher. Francis the butler answered, and I told him to pass the word along that I might be late for my date. I hung up before Helen could get on the pipe and start screaming at me like a wounded eagle. I locked the office, went down to 5th Precinct, and an old friend, Lieutenant Levinson. He was in charge of the homicide detail and could tell me about the late Mrs. Moran and her victim. When I walked in, Sergeant Otis was polishing his billy. Hello, Otis. The lieutenant in? Well, Richard Diamond, the all-American gumshoe. Oh, you're just jealous because that club you've got is a better shape than your head. Lieutenant, Diamond's out here. Okay, send them in. Tell me, Shamus... How does one get to be a great big private detective? Saving box tops? Well, you have to observe things, Otis, my boy. For instance, one look at your shirt, and I can tell you've been eating well for a week. Why don't you either get it cleaned or stick it in a pressure cooker? Hello, Walt. Now, wait a minute, Rick. If you've got a body somewhere, take it to another precinct. No, I'm a little short right now, but maybe I can dig one up. <laughs> what yeah, I said. Yeah, that was a swell one. Is this just a social visit or am I a dreamer? It's about the Moran suicide. You handle it? Uh-huh. One of the neighbors called us. They're both deader than Otis on a double date. What about the Grayson guy she knocked off? Cheap thug. A couple of convictions. He... Oh, don't tell me Moran's been to you with that blackmail story. Yeah, yeah. He seems to think Grayson was working with someone. Rick, that guy pestered us all morning, but there's no proof of blackmail or anything else, except two people got killed. Give me a quick rundown. I don't know why you're interested. I think Moran drummed up the blackmail theory just to cover that his wife was running around with another man. Well, I'm interested because Moran gave me a fat 200 bucks in advance to get me in the spirit of the thing. Well, if you want to be bored, here are the photographs of the deal. Here's Mac Grayson. Mm. Bullet entered his chest just below the 10th rib. The gun was a 32. Same one that the Moran dame used on herself. Enough powder burns on his shirt to show that she was standing pretty close when she gave it to him. She'd have to be not to miss him. Ah, uh, you can see she was lying about ten feet from Grayson near the bar. Huh? Probably needed a stiff shot before she knocked herself off. That's the highball glass on the floor near her head. And that's the thirty-two she used, about six inches from her right hand, and only her prints on it. Powder burns on the girl? Sure, all over her temple. We did the paraffin test on her hand, too. She fired the gun all right. Did uh, Grayson have any friends? We never tied him up with anyone except an old wino that hangs out on Skid Row, dump called the Parrot Club. Name's Wilbur Truitt. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah. Well, thanks, Walt. Now, look, the dame killed the guy and then shot herself. What more do you want? I'll let you know. Now, wait a minute. I know that gleam in your eye. I always get a sour stomach from it. If you've got something, you'd better tell me. Oh, you're a cynic, Walt. Have you, uh, have you talked to this Wilbur Truitt? We questioned him this morning. Got a tail on him? Sure, but he won't take us anywhere. Now, what are you cooking up? Well, maybe you think there's something to Moran's blackmail story. Oh, don't be an idiot. Then what are you tailing Truett for? Because I can't take a chance. Blackmail's a federal rap, and if Moran keeps stirring up trouble, I want to be able to prove he's nuts. Now, you look here. I want to know what's on you or mine. I'll send you a letter. Oh. Otis! Yeah, Lieutenant? Get me my bicarbonate. And shut up. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs> I went through the squad room and out into the hall. I used the payphone by the door and put in a fast call to my client, William Moran. I had a hunch, and Moran's $200 retainer in my pocket gave him an A priority on it. Yes? Mr. Moran. That's right. This is Diamond, Mr. Moran. Uh -huh. I've got a lead on someone who knew Mac Grayson. Well, that's fine, Mr. Diamond. Who is it? Well, a guy who hangs out on Skid Row named Wilbur Truitt. Ever heard of him? No. Oh. Well, he might have been the one who phoned you this morning. I, I think I'll go down and find out. Good, good. You'll keep in touch, won't you? Oh, as long as I'm on the case. Goodbye, Mr. Moran. I left the 5th Precinct and headed for Skid Row. If you've never seen the street, it's a liberal education in the misery of human beings. Even the sun winds up with a hangover if it shines on the place too long. 
The parent club was a cellar with a low ceiling and a drink of wine for ten cents a glass. The smell of stale alcohol was so strong that if you opened the, opened the door to air the place out, the walls would probably cave in. I found Wilbur Truitt sitting at the bar with a dirty towel around his neck. He held the towel and a glass of wine in one hand, and with the other he pulled the towel, lifting his hand and the glass up to his mouth. <laughs> you must have been an engineer. I learned this little stunt in grammar school, bucko. I started missing my mouth 30 years ago, so I used this towel as a sort of alcohol pulley. It cuts down the element of risk. Hate to spill a drop. You know a guy named Grayson? It's the shakes, bucko. I am completely exhausted after a night of revelry, and my hand waves like it was flagging down a caravan of whiskey trucks. Look, friend, But I... after one or two pick-me-ups, I am perfectly capable of lifting the glass by myself. And come nightfall, I'm in excellent condition to entertain my little friends. Oh, swell. Most cowards let the little fellows frighten them, and they end up in Bellevue, but... I like them. They worried me at first, but when they found out how much I drank, they began to show the strain, and the shoe was on the other foot, so to speak. Oh, no. They tried to frighten me the first night, but I just kept right on with one bottle after another, and it finally drove them to drink. Now my DTs have hallucinations. We are rapidly building up a thriving community. What were you saying, bucko? Uh, something about the evils of self-indulgence, but I've forgotten now. Good. In that case, I will let you buy me a drink. Oh, sure. Waiter, bring a bottle. You just gave me cold chills. If I lick your hand, it's only a sign of fond endearment. Okay. Now, uh, do you know a guy named Grayson? I knew there was a catch. Are you a cop? No. In that case, I trust you. Besides, you are holding that lovely bottle. What about Grayson? First, a small glass of truth serum. First, Grayson. I can't stand to look, so I will turn my back on the bottle and tell you what I know. Mr. Mac Grayson... A very unsavory character who reached a sudden demise last evening, dealt in smutty pass and made them pay off by milking his victims. He has only one friend, a Mr. Leo Fink. Now, please, I'm beginning to spit out wads of cotton. Where does this Fink live? Oh, you are indeed a heartless rogue. I was once. You aren't by any chance a spy from the Purity League? You get the bottle when I find out where Leo Fink lives. Eleven... 22nd Avenue now, please. Now, here you are. Don't struggle with the cork, bucko. I have just acquired the strength of an uncropped Samson. And as I gaze upon this ruby goblet, I am reminded of the fact that you are not the first to come seeking the whereabouts of one Leo Fink. Huh? Play it back in English. Ah, a thug with the disagreeable habit of twisting my ascot. Approached me not ten minutes before you came in seeking the same information. Did you give it to him? I had to. One more pull on my tie, and dissipation would have been a thing of the past. Thanks, Wilbur. Here, buy yourself another jug. Oh, bless you. And good morrow, cousin. Here's to my love. Oh, true apothecary. Thy drugs are quick. Thus, with a kiss, I die. I left Wilbur with his first love and walked out on the street. I grabbed a cab and headed for Leo Fink's address. All the way over, I kept thinking how wonderful fresh air really was. When we finally got there, I paid off the cabbie and looked at my watch. It was 4.30 and the city was turning soft and mellow as the sun started giving up behind the tall buildings. I got that lousy feeling again when I looked across the street. A prowl car was parked at the curb, and it looked like Homicide's private limousine. Something was wrong. I went up to Fink's apartment in a hurry. Yeah? Ah, uh, what do you want, Shamus? Well, good afternoon, Sergeant. I'm taking the census. How long ago did you die, sir? Very funny, Diamond. Otis, who is that? Diamond, who else? I didn't ask for a quick quiz on well-known personalities. Let him in. Yeah, Lieutenant. 
Shame on you, Otis. You'll never make an Eagle Scout. Hello, Rick. What do you want? I bet he's dead. You'll bet who's dead. You know who's dead. Sure, I know who's dead. Who do you think is dead? The guy I came up here to see. Well, who did you come up to see? Well, I think it's the guy who's dead. Don't you know? No, I ask you. Well, I'm telling you. You told me nothing. Look, why are you up here? Because I'm looking for a guy. What guy? I think it's the guy who's dead. Who's dead? Oh, he's on third. Don't you know? I think I know, Lieutenant. You shut up. Of course I know. Well, all right, all right. If you're going to hold out on your old pal... Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. How did we get into this thing? Otis! Here's your bicarbonate, all mixed. All right, now let's start again. Walt, who's dead? Oh, let's not have two bodies up here. The guy's name is Fink, Leo Fink. Uh, why did you say that in the first place? Because I don't have to do anything I don't want to do. Walt! Lieutenant Levinson. Now, what are you doing up here? Well, I came up to see Leo Fink, that's all. Well, he's in the other room. If he spills anything, don't believe it. He's been dead for ten minutes. That's too bad. He knew Mac Grayson. Yeah, how did you find out? That sweet old gentleman you sent me over to, Wilbur Truitt. Oh, you got something out of him, huh? What else did he tell you? Nothing, but we uh, struck up quite a friendship. I'm going to go back over and see what another bottle of wine will do to his memory. I'd better haul him in. Well, don't do it, Walt. Don't do it. I can find out things a lot quicker. Shh. I got a system. Okay, but keep me posted. I've got to clean up here. How did Fink get it? Two bullets in the head. No idea who gave it to him. They used a Luger, I think. Hey, have you questioned Otis? Oh, go on. Get out of here. Walt, tell me, did you check the prints on that highball glass next to Mrs. Moran to find out whether they were from her right or left hand? Now, what difference does it make? I'll let you know. Now, you wait a minute. No, I can't. I'm behind schedule now. Bye. Oh, Otis! I went downstairs in a hurry and started back to Skid Row and Wilbur Truitt. I turned a corner and had a quick change of heart. That's far enough, Shamus. Wow. Well, look what I picked up. All right. Get into this alley. Now, why don't you put that cannon away? It shows up like a pair of gums at a dentist convention. Turn around and get going. I can run if it would help. Take your time. You haven't got too much of it left. Stop nudging. You got a coal barrel. Don't you like it? No, but it helps. Hey! A lesson in the manly art of self-defense. Next time, don't get so close with a gun. Well, what do you know? A Luger. Okay, so, so I'm a Butterfingers. You got the gun now. What are you going to do? I got a mean streak, and it shows up when someone tries to kill me. I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and if you don't answer them... You'll wish you'd picked on an octopus. Now get up! Oh, you're a big one. Now, who sent you after me? I don't know. Who sent you after me? Honest, I don't know. Oh, wait, wait a second. All right, the guy told me on the phone his name was Jones. Sure, first name's John. Now, wait, wait. I, I know it's a phony, but he was recommended. You get paid for your work, don't you? Yeah, but this one I collect after the job. Where? I thought you'd gotten over that stubborn streak. Okay. Uh, uh, the 8 o'clock ferry to Staten Island. He's going to slip me two bills. And you don't know his right name? No. Did you know Mac Grayson? Well, I heard of him, but I never met him. Are you as handy with a 32 as you are with that Luger? Huh? Forget it. Next question. Who killed Leo Fink? Oh, that's a pretty big one. Okay, I'll word it differently. Who killed Leo Fink? I'll take the beating. Yeah. Well, I got a hunch this Luger of yours will check with ballistics. Come on. Homicide's still up in Fink's apartment. Nuts! What did you say? Okay. I hustled Louie up to Walt and left him handcuffed to Sergeant Otis. They deserved each other. Louie said he was going to be paid off at 8 o'clock, and my watch said it was a quarter after 7. That gave me 45 minutes to check at Homicide and still catch the ferry to Staten Island. The fingerprint man at the 5th precinct put the prints from the highball glass under a microscope and told me what I wanted to know. My hunch had been right. So I grabbed a cab, and 20 minutes later, I was paying for my ticket at the ferry landing. A thick, wet fog was beginning to roll in off the river, and by 8 o'clock, it was hard to even see your watch. Someone was playing a piano in the lounge as the ferry began to move slowly across the river. I didn't know who I was looking for, but I figured if there was going to be a payoff, it would be outside. I leaned against the rail and took out a cigarette. Got the match, mister? Huh? Yeah, yeah, right here. Thanks. Lousy night. Yeah. He wasn't my man. 
When he struck the match, I could see his dirty work clothes and his factory badge. I started down the other side of the board. Finding a killer in that fog was like looking for your car keys in a mine shaft. I reached the bow of the boat, and right then I knew I was about to score. I get a tight feeling in my stomach when I start closing in on danger. I spotted the dark outline at the rail, so I pulled my hat down and walked up beside him. He was hunched over with his arms resting on the rail. Terrible night. Mm Mm-hmm. It'd be awful if you had to find someone in this fog. Not if he found you first. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like the name Louis Osgood. Have you heard of it? I like the name Moran. William Moran. Who are you? Just an employee. Diamond. Hey, you get a gold star. Well, what do you want? Uh, Have you found the blackmailers? Now, stop playing Alice in Wonderland. I just pushed around your hired gun at Louis Osgood. He had enough to say to put you away for a long time. He couldn't have. He didn't know Didn't know your name? Who murdered your wife? You or Louis Osgood? Why do you say murder? The police said it was suicide. Well, I got news for you, Buster. Homicide just changed its mind. I checked and found out that the highball glass near her head was covered with prints from her right hand. What does that prove? It proves that to take her own life, she'd have to have fingers a foot long. The prints on the gun were also from her right hand. You're going to tell me that your wife shot herself while holding a highball glass in the same hand? That's not my problem, Mr. Diamond. Well, I think it is. If Louis Osgood didn't shoot her, that leaves just one suspect, you. Now, let's take a walk back to the cabin. I want to keep an eye on you for homicide. All right. This is where I leave you, Mr. Diamond. Hey, come here. I hadn't thought he'd make a break, but as long as he had a gun and knew how to use it, I could understand why he did. I got my gun out and took off after him. I expected him to go over the side and in the fog, and he'd have a good chance. But when a guy gets cornered, he does funny things. I never would have spotted him, but he threw open a door and framed himself in the light from the inside. I must have caught him because I saw him start to fold and stagger through the door. I took my time getting there. A wounded man with a gun can get pretty mean sometimes. The door swung back and forth with the motion of the boat, and I could hear the sound of the engines. He'd gone down in the engine room, so I dropped to my knees and went in after him. A long, polished ladder led down to the big diesel's below, and I knew I'd hit him with the first shot because there was a bright red trail of blood leading down the ladder and behind the churning machinery. Moran! Oh, Moran, come on out! You can't get out of here. Come and get me, Diamond. I don't like being slapped around, and I'm going to see that you get yours. He was somewhere off to my left and keeping himself hidden. A catwalk circled the engine room, so I pulled an old stunt. I took a wrench off the wall and tossed it down the metal ladder. I watched for his gun flashes, and when I spotted his position, I got down on my stomach and crawled along the catwalk until I was directly over his head. He was sitting in a lot of blood. And he didn't look like he had long to go. Come on, Diamond. I know you're down here. Surprise. Look at the birdie. What? Don't try it. Sorry, Moran, but this just wasn't your night. You want to tell me about it? I shot my wife. I came in just after she shot Grayson. And she was standing at the bar with her back to me, mixing a drink. She dropped the gun by Grayson's body, so I picked it up and shot her. Wiped my prints off and put hers on it. Why did you do it? I hated her. She had money. I found some letters and turned them over to Mac Grayson, the well-known blackmailer. I wanted him to drive her crazy until she drank herself into a sanitarium, then I'd have her money. I never guessed she'd kill Grayson, but when I did, I saw a chance to kill her and make it look like suicide. You should never have called me. The police were satisfied. I had to find Leo Fink. He knew I'd hired Grayson... And he was going to blackmail me. So when I dug up the little wino that knew Fink, you hired Louis Osgood to bump Fink and me. Is that right? Hey. Hey, Moran. Oh, well, it was a dull conversation anyway. Lousy night. The captain came and helped me carry him up to the deck. Back at the ferry landing, I called Walt Levinson and told him the whole story. I didn't wait around. I just hung up in the middle of his lecture on good behavior and started walking. A stiff breeze was kicking up and pushing the fog back where it came from. After a good round of murder, a guy likes to relax. And I knew just the place to curl up and get my fur brushed. I grabbed a cab and headed for 975 Park Avenue. And the only girl in the world who looked better than her $10 million bank account. 
Oh, good evening, Mr. Diamond. Hello, Francis. Is Miss Asher in? Yes, sir. She's in the library. Thanks. Get me a glass of milk, will you, Francis? Milk? Oh, yes, sir. Right away. Hey, that's a B-flat. Rick, where have you been? Sailing, sailing over the bounding main. Move over. You were supposed to have been here at 8 o'clock. Oh, what's an hour if you tack it on to the end of the evening? Well, I'm glad you've been keeping out of trouble. I can't stand it when you wander in all beat up. Mm, you smell nice. What kind of cologne is that? Gunpowder, 38. What? Oh, nothing. What's this you were playing? Oh, a new song. Again. You were just dandy. Well, you know I don't play well. I just pick. You should be glad you don't play the guitar with those beautiful nails you'd saw it in half. <laughs> You're ridiculous. Mm. Whoops. Oh, that wasn't a B-flat. Rick. Mm-hmm. Who do you love? I won't tell. Rick? I love you, baby. Then let's get married. Uh, hey, these are pretty good lyrics. Now stop that. Again, this couldn't happen again. I hate you. This is that once in a lifetime. This is that moment divine. You never sing when I want you to. What's more, this never happened before. Though I have waited a lifetime for such as you to suddenly be mine. No comment? No. Mine to hold as I'm holding you now and yet never to part. Mine to... Hey, what's the matter? Uh, don't go. You want to sing? Go ahead. Well, what did you have in mind? I won't tell. You're not being original. That's my line. Well, I'm mad. Come here, come here. No. Come here, huh? Mm -hmm. Helen. Mm -hmm. Still mad? No. Mm -hmm. Well, let's get you mad again. It's so much fun making up. <laughs> Mine again. What's the name of the song again? <laughs> uh, it never happens again. I'm mad. Oh, good. No. Oh, Ricky. Here's your milk, Mr. Diamond. Oh, my goodness, you never warned me. <laughs> just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Tal Avery, Herbert Butterfield, and Jack Petruzzi. Music was under the direction of David Baskerville. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. Now this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This program has come to you from Hollywood. Now NBC brings you a three-way cavalcade of grand comedy with Phil Harris and Alice Faye, Fred Allen and Henry Morgan, all following in fast succession over most of these NBC stations. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. As Richard Diamond, private detective. Hello there. My name's Diamond, and I'm known along the big street as a guy who manages to keep his nose pretty clean and still make a few bucks while I'm doing it. Oh, sure, it gets a little grimy, but you've got to expect that. I'm a shamus, private eye, gumshoe. To the guy who hasn't ever been worried because he tripped over a corpse in his breakfast nook, I'm known as a private detective. And to some guys, I'm known by a lot of other names. Not the kind you'd find in a book on manners and social usages. But there are times when you... 
might turn up on your desk calendar under the heading of what I must do today. Who hires me? How do I make a living? Well, maybe this will give you an idea. Fred, why don't you eat your toast? It's getting cold. Why don't you stop worrying about the temperature of my breakfast? I'm trying to read the paper. Did anyone ever tell you how charming it is to have breakfast with you every morning? Yeah. My ulcers. I'd like to go shopping today. Will you leave me some money? Fred, did you hear me? Mary, I'm reading. Well, stop reading and listen to me for a minute. I need some new summer clothes and I want to go shopping today. Here. Here's ten bucks. Buy yourself a bathing suit. Oh, that's very funny. Hmm? I need more than ten dollars. I want five hundred. What kind of a bathing suit are you going to buy, Mink? I'm not going to buy a bathing suit. I need some new clothes. Will you put down that paper and listen to me? Well, I see you made Jimmy Cello's column again, my darling. What? What prominent socialite is fighting with her wealthy husband and crying on the shoulder of a big-time playboy after the arguments? Is that... It's supposed to be me? Can you remember five minutes in the past five years when we haven't been fighting? Are you accusing me of running around with some playboy? Running around is right. I expect one of you to be the first to do a four-minute march. How dare you? How dare me? Why, you lushed-up little tramp. Tramp? Yeah, tramp. Everybody in town knows you're seeing Lauren Oliver. All right, so I've been seeing him. We're... We're just friends. Well, that kind of friendship is grounds for divorce in this state. Why, you oh, dirty... Oh, I'm sick of this whole rotten mess. And I'm going to do something about it. You're going to do something about it? Why, you're conceited, pompous. You're going to do something, are you? Well, you better hurry up because I've got some ideas of my own. Uh, yeah? Lauren. Yeah, yeah, Mary? I've got to talk to you. What time is 10 it? 10 o'clock. Well, it's still the middle of the night. Call me back this later. This can't wait. Fred found an item about us in Jimmy Cello's column this morning. He stormed out of here like he was going to kill somebody. Well, you're just a gal who can recognize the symptoms. Well, that's a nasty line. What do you want at 10 in the morning, Longfellow? Look, honey, I'll take care of Cello, and if that husband of yours gets out of line, I'll take care of him, too. You see what I mean? If things like that didn't happen, I'd be out of business. I'll lay you eight to five that before three o'clock this afternoon, one of those charming people will be walking into my office begging for help. Yeah? Rick? Oh, hello, Helen, baby. Hi. You gonna take me out tonight? Sure, sure. I'll be over later. We'll have a quiet evening. No, no. I want to go dancing tonight. If you don't take me, I'll throw a tantrum. But, baby, I don't have the cash. I'm tapped this week. Well, if you won't let me take, you'll borrow it from Francis. You told me yourself he was good in a pinch. Yeah, but he's already black and blue from those three lunches at Lindy's. Besides, he's not only your butler, but he's a darn good businessman. He wants security. Well, give it to him. He's already got my badge, my book on the ten best ways to sneak through transoms, complete with illustrations, and my gun. Haven't you got something else? Yeah, but I'm saving the right eye in case of an emergency. Keyholes, you know. Look, honey, let's go take in a quiet movie. And... I want to get dressed up and go to a nightclub. It's summer. The flowers are blooming and the fox has left his lair. His what? Oh, I've been hibernating all winter and I want to get out into some nice smoke-filled dance floor. Why, Helen. Why, Helen, nothing. Please, Rick. Now, hold it. Someone's knocking at my chamber door. Come in. Mr. Diamond? Yeah, I'll pull up a chair. I'll be right with you. Who is it? I'm afraid to look. I haven't paid the light bill. This is a detective agency, isn't it? You, sir, have just won yourself a new economy home size murder sampler, complete with a matching set of bodies. Me? No. I haven't got time to listen to your bright remarks, Diamond. I want to hire you. What did he say? He doesn't like my bright remarks. You won't even admit they're bright. What else? No, oh, something about wanting to... Uh... Something about what? Uh, what was that last statement, sir? It sounded rather cozy. I said I wanted to hire you. What? I'll call you later, baby. Bye. Uh, wait, wait a minute. I... Now, uh, Mr. Uh, Sears. Mr. Sears, what can I do for you? I want you to follow my wife. Will I like the view? She's running around with another man. Well, if they're just running around, don't worry about it. It's when they get tired and slow down that things start to pop. There was a veiled article in Jimmy Cello's column this morning about my wife and this man. Yeah, I know Cello. So do I, but I'm not interested in Cello at the moment. Well, what do you want? Enough on your wife so you can get a divorce? Yes. Oh, well, that, that comes kind of high. I don't like cases like this, and I usually turn them down. If you want me to swallow my pride, it'll take a $200 retainer and a 100 a day in expenses. I'll write you a check. Oh, 
Oh, just like that, huh? I am quite wealthy. Hmm. That's why I want the divorce, Mr. Diamond. There you are. Yes, sir. There I am. Now, what's the man's name that your wife is uh, seeing? His name is Lorne Oliver. Well, this is turning into a family gathering. You know him? Sure. Runs the Monarch Club. That's right. What's your wife's name, and we're going to get a look at her. Mary Sears. You can see her tonight at the Stork. We'll be there for dinner, 9 o'clock. I'll be there. Oh, uh, incidentally, that uh, comes under the heading of expenses, in case you have a short memory. I have a good memory, Mr. Diamond. You can send me the bill. Oh. Address and phone number? 45 East 65th Street. 45 East 65. Evergreen 41793. 41793. Now I've got to be going. Goodbye, Mr. Diamond. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Sears. Yeah? What do you hang up on me for? Uh, honey, this is because you always give me an argument. You never want to go anywhere. I'm getting tired of shows and hot dogs. I want to go dancing. What? And I don't mean Roseland. I want to go to the stork. I'm a growing boy, and I like to see the bright lights and throw my money around. But, Rick, you... you I'll certainly... pick you up at 8.30, and this time, don't wear slacks. <laughs> You're an idiot. Bye, idiot. Yes, that's the way it goes, just as I told you. The word private in front of detective means you're married to all the troubles in the world, and that includes everything. So if a guy turns up who's unhappy with his wife, you listen to him howl, and if he's got enough money, you take the job. It's for better or for worse. And until Mr. Sears came in, it was decidedly one-sided. I'd teach cooking to a bunch of headhunters for a fee like the one he'd given me. When I looked at his $200 check, I started getting that big man complex again. So I closed the office and went back to my flat. We'd probably be up late, and Helen always had some extracurricular activities after we'd get back to her place. You know, roasting marshmallows, fast game of canasta, or an exciting round of Emmys on the living room rug. Anyway, I always got home pretty late in the a.m., so I spent the rest of the afternoon taking a nap. At 6 o'clock, I got up and dressed, and at 8.30, I picked up Helen. Wow. And at 9 o'clock, we were sitting at the Stark Club bar, right on schedule. Rick, when are you going to ask for a table? Well, honey, the drinks come faster here. But I want to dance. Oh, no, no, no. I mustn't overdo it, lover. Uh, How do you know? Maybe some mountain climber will ask you on a 20-mile hike tomorrow. Think of your feet. I am. I want to move them around that dance floor. Oh, Rick, I know you. You do something. You do it all the way. Yeah, let's nick. Oh, now you stop that. You're on a job, and you don't want to go in there because you've got to watch somebody. Well, Helen Asher, how are you, darling? Well, hello, Lauren. How have you been? Oh, couldn't be better. Why don't you ever stop over to my club? I'd like to show you around. She just brought a seeing eye dog. Oh, hello, Diamond. You two know each other, don't you? Yes. How did we make such a grisly mistake, Oliver? I don't know. I tried taking penicillin for it, but it didn't do much good. Well, it probably helped out in the other things. Why don't you try hanging yourself? Really? You always did think you were a pretty funny man, didn't you, Diamond? <laughs> It's easy being a comic. You just find an idiot for an audience. How do you like the performance? Stinks. Pardon me, Helen, but I see some people I know. You'll excuse me, won't you, Diamond? Oh, sure, yes. But the next time you drop around, bring some airwake, huh? Rick, even if you don't like him, you shouldn't say those things. It's liable to start a fight. Oh, he wouldn't take a swing at a midget if he was riding an elephant. wonder who his friends are. They don't seem to be too glad to see him. The name's Sears. Is that who you're watching? Yeah, the wife. I don't know whether I approve or not. She's very attractive. Isn't she, though? Rick! This is business, baby. Business. I'm only drooling because I haven't had anything to eat since this morning. Well, then let's get a table. You've seen her. You've observed what she's doing. Now let's get something to eat. Now, wait a minute. Here comes somebody else I know. Where? Standing at the check room. The little man? Yeah, here he comes. Who is he? Name's Cello. Oh. Jimmy Cello. Writes a gossip column. I read it all the time. Yeah? Uh, hello, Jimmy. Well, 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 a Broadway shamus. Who's the uh, lovely redhead, Diamond? Helen, meet James Cello, but be careful what you say. Jimmy, Helen Asher. Uh, hello, Mr. Cello. How do you do? Is this an item, Rick? If I don't get us a table soon, she's going to make me give back her sorority picture. Oh, uh, <laughs> speaking of tables, I see some people I know. Uh, nice meeting you, Miss Asher. Thank you. Goodbye, Diamond. Bye, Jimmy. Rick, he's going over to see his table. Hello, Walter. Hi, doll. Hi. Well, well, good evening. What do you want, Cello? 
Oh, just drop by to see how the happy little family was getting along. Well, just drop away. Nobody asked you to stop by. Yeah, why don't you do that and take Oliver here with you? Nobody asked him to stop by Fred, either. Fred, keep your voice down. This is my table, and I don't like a lot of crumbs lying all that over it. Who's a crumb? Come on, Lorne. I guess Mr. Sears has forgotten a few things. I haven't forgotten a thing, Shallow. When you print one thing in that lying sheet of yours, and I'll have you sued for life. Listen, Sears, if I did print anything, they'd put you away so far, they'd have to pipe air into you. Oh, do go on, Mr. Cello. This is getting interesting. You'd better get out of here, Cello. No, no, no. Go on, Cello. What have you got an old money bag? He's a lying, dirty gossip monger. He doesn't have uh, a thing. Wait a minute. I don't like that. Why don't you ask your husband about North Africa sometime, Mrs. Sears? Well, just a minute. Fred, stop it. Fred. All right, now pick yourself up and get out of here, Cello. Uh, maybe you're right. I've got a column to get out. It'll be all about you, Sears, in big type. Go on, get out. All about me. You gonna throw me out, too? You can bet your life I am. I'm getting out of here. You stay right where you are. Don't talk that way to Mary. I'll talk any way I like to my wife. Lord, maybe you'd better leave. Here come the waiters. Now it's I'm gonna push his fat slob's face in. Yeah? Yeah. Come oh, on, oh, 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 All right, all right. Come on, break it up. Break it up. Come on. Hey, waiter, give me a hand. Come on, you... Take your hands off me, Diamond. Now calm down, Mr. Sears. I'll kill that slob. Oliver, yeah. you shut up or I'll pull your pants up over your head and shove you in a glass like a breadstick. I don't like people meddling in my affairs, Diamond. You're fired. I'm what? You heard me. Now take your filthy hands off me. Ah, well, they were lily white before I palmed that check of yours this morning. You can have it back. Here, eat it. What? Why, miss... I'll have you in jail for this, Diamond. Why? It isn't every day you get to eat a $200 check. Oh, Rick, let's get out of here. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, baby, but that's what happens when you go to work for a hyena like Sears. You think he's a nice guy because he laughs so much. But you find out later it's only because he chewed your leg off. We left Sears still spitting out pieces of the check I'd shoved down his throat and headed for Helen's apartment. I was sore. When I get hot under the collar, I don't make for good company. So I dropped her off with a kiss and went back to my flat and climbed in the sack. I smoked a dozen cigarettes before I got to sleep. And when I finally did, it must have been with a big smile on my face. All night, I kept dreaming that Lauren Oliver and Fred Sears were beating themselves to death with hot paper sacks. Sunshine Market. Locks popovers are specialty. Now you stop clowning and get over here right away. Walt? Lieutenant Levinson. Oh, wow. Where are you? I'm in your office. Yeah? Well, if any clients come in, give them a good sales talk. Tell them how many people you've killed or something. There's a guy in your office now. Prospect? Depends on what you're talking about. I think his name is Fritz Sears. Uh, tell him to go home. He canned me last night. I don't think he'll listen. All right, all right. So he's sore. He's got a right to be. acting like an idiot, Walt. You know I didn't have anything to do with it. I know you didn't, but we find the stiff in your office and we get a report that he fired you last night, but you had a fight with him. I gotta tell the commissioner something, Rick. Tell him Sergeant Otis is teething. Now, you stop that. No, what do you know about the killing? The coroner just left. He said that Sears had been dead about eight hours. The cleaning woman found him at nine this morning and called us. Mm, that puts the time of the murder around 1 a.m. We found this clenched in the dead man's hands. What is it? An article torn out of the morning papers. Here, read it. Ah, oh, Jimmy Cello's column. Read it. All right, I will. Don't yell at me. Ah, Fred Sears, wealthy import-export man, is having troubles. He's finding it hard to explain about his past doings in North Africa, and at the same time, he's finding it just as hard to explain his wife's interest in the local playboy, nightclub owner, Lauren Oliver. Yeah. He got so mad at the Stark Club... Oh, I was there, I was there. He got so mad at the Stark Club last night that he took a poke at your columnist and then tried to beat up Lauren Oliver. Will this lead to a rematch between Oliver and Sears? We're having a whole bunch of them picked up. Walt, Walt, before you do that, give me a couple of hours, will you? Try to dig up your killer? I can't. You know what we've got to do. It's routine. Well, the commissioner's already having fits every time he hears my name. Now, look, Rick. Walt, I got a business to protect. And if he finds out the stiff was killed in my office, he'll probably haul in my license. Yeah. One hour, Rick. That's oh. all I can give you. I got a job, too. Oh, thanks, Walt. I suppose you've got an alibi for one o'clock? Call Helen. We were toasting marshmallows. Well, I 
had three good suspects, Lauren Oliver, Cello, the columnist, and Mrs. Sears. One of the three was built just right for the electric chair. An hour isn't much time to dig up a killer, so I grabbed a cab and headed for Lauren Oliver's office in the back of his club. Yeah, come in. How are you, Oliver? Oh, what do you want, Diamond? Not particular about who comes into my club. Oh, I'm surprised you can operate with that kind of policy. People probably see you in here every night. I think I'll have you thrown out. Where were you at one o'clock this morning? None of your business. Herman. Yeah, boss? Come in here and show a guy out of my office. Oh, we get rough, huh? Yeah. Okay, okay. I'll let you tell the cops who knocked off Fred Sears. Hey, this is the guy, boss? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Did you say someone knocked off Fred Sears? That's right, but don't start crying about it. It makes me feel so helpless. I'll tell my story to the cops. They'll get a lot tougher than I will. You won't get tough at all, Mac. Oh, stop flexing, Herman. You'll snap your girdle. Well, I guess it doesn't make much difference as long as Sears is dead. I was with his wife from about 12 o'clock to... to, Well, it was a long time after one. Well, where were you all that time? At my place. And I'll take a walk, Shamus. You got my alibi. One more question. Did you go out at all? Yeah, I went out and got the late papers. So what? I like to read. Okay, okay. You don't mind if I stop by and see Mrs. Sears, do you? No, go ahead. I'll see you later. Oh, Herman. Yeah? You can let the air out now. Your muscles are lovely. Well, Oliver had a good story if it checked. So that left me with two more stops. Cello's newspaper office was the closest, so I grabbed another cab, and ten minutes later, I was sitting at his desk. Oh, you don't think I had anything to do with it, do you, Diamond? Where were you at one this morning? I was covering a party at Richard Gray's. I was with friends from about 11 o'clock till after 3. You can check. Go on, check. Look, Poison Pin. Sears had your column from the late edition clenched in his hand. He, he did, huh? Well, you don't think if I was going to kill a man, I'd leave anything like that around? I don't know. Well, now, obviously, someone is trying to make it look like I did it. Have you talked with Oliver and Sears' wife? Oliver's got an alibi, and I'm headed for Mrs. Sears' place right now. You know the address? Yes, yeah. 45 East 65th. But Mrs. Sears couldn't kill her husband. I know her too well. No? Well, thanks, Cello. I'll check your alibi. If it stands up, then I'll have to really go to work on Mrs. Sears. Yes? Mrs. Sears? Yes. Oh, you look even better up close. What's on your mind? You mean right this minute? Well, aren't you nice? Don't crowd me, though. I can keep up a pretty good average in this league. I'd say about a thousand. Mm -hmm. May I come in? I think so, if you keep talking. I like to hear nice things. Well, you deserve them. But I can think of some nice things to say about a panther. We'll talk about my family some other time. Can I buy you a drink? It's a little early, unless you got some milk. Milk? Where's your husband? Oh, you know about him, huh? Oh, I'm sorry. This looked as though it might work into quite a friendship. Where is he? I haven't seen him since last night. Why? a friend of yours? He's been using my office. Oh? Yeah, yeah. He died there last night. What? Everybody is so surprised. But, uh, how? Who did it? That's what I'm trying to find out, lover. Where were you at 1 a.m.? That's none of your business. Okay, let the law drag it out of you. Goodbye, dear. Uh, wait a minute. All right, I'll tell you. I was with a man named Oliver, Lorne Oliver. Oh, for how long? From about 12 o'clock to... Well, much later. That's what Oliver says. Did you go out at all? Just to get the papers. That checks with Oliver's story, too. Did you go out alone? Why, uh... uh no, I, I went with Lorne. He says he went out alone. Oh. Well, yes, yes, he did. I thought you said you went out with him. Well, that was later. Lorne was the one that went out to get the papers. Okay, what time was it? Uh, about two. When you both went out or when Lorne went out to get the papers by himself? Uh, when Lorne went out. Oh. Yes, now, now I see. Well, I, I'll, I'll see you later. I'll come back again. Oh, I'll do that after you get over crying for your late husband. I'll keep my emotions down to a minimum. I'll bet you will. I left her standing in the middle of the room, looking after me like a vegetarian with an eye on a green salad. I closed the door and started down the hall for the elevators. For some reason, I never seem to get where I'm going. Hello. Hmm? Oh, <coughs> While you're still tuned in, Diamond, I'll give you some advice. Stay away from Mrs. Sears. Now I want you to be sure and get the point. Rick. Rick, come on.
Come on, snap out of it. Uh, I'll go away. Come on, you don't look so good. Uh, it matches the way I feel. Oh, here's a new line. Where am I, Walt? In Mrs. Sears' apartment. Hello, handsome. She heard the scuffle in the hall, came out, found you, and called me. Swell. Who did it? I didn't see him, but his voice sounded like a thug that Lauren Oliver keeps around, a patty cake with. Oh, that was probably Herman. Lauren is so jealous. Well, your hour is up, and now I'm going to haul them all in, including this Herman. Oh, do you know Herman, Walt? Sure, Herman Sharp. Got a record a mile long. Uh, Walt, if a guy wanted to hire a killer, where would he go? You know all the stoolies as well as I do. Yeah. Mrs. Sears, what was the fight about last night at the stork? Oh, a columnist named, named Cello threatened my husband that he was going to print something in his paper. He said something about North Africa, and Fred hit him. North Africa? This is really getting mixed up. Was your husband ever in North Africa? Yes, during the war. He was a captain in the army. Walt, can you get me this Herman Sharp's address? He's the boy I want. Sure, but I'm coming along. Have your boys pick up Cello, Oliver, and take them both down to the station along with Mrs. Sears here. Well, you don't think I had anything to do with it, do you? I've known Jimmy Cello a long time. About five years ago, he used to run around with a little dancer named Mary Carroll. Sure he did. I'm Mary Carroll, but I broke up with him when I met Fred. Yeah. Well, you'll see him at the station. You can pick up where you left off. Come on, Walt. We went down fast and climbed into the prowl car. Walt put in a call and got Herman's address over the two-way radio. Twenty minutes later, we were standing in front of Herman's door was an old apartment house on the Lower East Side. I started for the door, but Walt had other ideas. Rick, we can't go in there. Why not? Because I haven't got a search warrant. Well, you got to go in if you want to crack this case. Not without a search warrant. Search warrant for what? To go in. Well, what do you want to go in for? I don't want to go in. You do. Do what? Go in. Well, go ahead. I haven't got a warrant. Well, what are you looking for? Herman Sharp. He's probably in there. He is? Sure. Well, what are we waiting for? Oh, what did I do that for? For that. What? Herman Sharp. Oh. Ah, is he dead? Yeah, been shot. What are you looking at? Newspaper on the floor. This morning's. Oh. Cello's column's missing. Been torn out. Then Herman's your killer. Swell. Who killed Herman? Don't you know? I'm going to start that again. Walt, go on back to the station. I'm going to check something and make a phone call. I'll be down in half an hour and point out your killer. <laughs> Calm down, calm down, this everybody. This is ridiculous. I want my lawyer. You'll get one later. Relax, Oliver. They can't hold up much longer. How do you feel, Mary? I don't like this any more than you do. Well, good afternoon. And happy Father's Day. Oh. Rick, where the devil have you been? Made a phone call to Washington, Walt. Mrs. Sears, did you know that your husband had a dishonorable discharge from the Army? Why, no. You knew it, didn't you, Cello? That's right, but I kept it quiet. He got it for running a black market. What's this got to do with the death of Sears? Oliver, you told me you went out to get the papers last night. That's right. What time was it? Uh, a little after two. You know what time the late edition comes out. How about you, Mrs. Sears? Uh, what Lorne says is correct. How about it, Lorne? Were you the one to go out and get the papers? Uh, yes. Uh, then, Mrs. Sears, why did you tell me this afternoon that you also went out to get the papers? Well, I... Mary, don't say anything. You don't have to. The stories don't check, so you couldn't have been together last night. Look, Diamond, what is this... Oh, got... now you look, Oliver. You're both liars. But that doesn't make either one of you the killer. Oh, but Rick, Cello's alibi checks right down the line. Sure it does, because he was at that party. But the killer wasn't. Oh, we know that. He couldn't have been. Yeah, but the man who hired the killer to knock off Sears was. What are you talking about, Diamond? Oliver, where was your hired gun if last night? You mean Herman? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. He was with me until 6 o'clock, then he left. Walt, when you find Herman's gun, ballistics will probably say that it was the one that did the job on Sears. Herman? Yeah. Cello? You hired Herman to kill Sears, and then you killed Herman. You're out of your mind. I didn't even know this Herman. We found the newspaper next to Herman's body. It had your column torn out of it. That doesn't pin anything on me. It just shows you that Herman probably stuck that article in Sears' hand after tearing it out of a newspaper. That's, you, that's what you wanted to make it look like. You knew Herman. You knew about the clipping, so you killed him and tore the column out of this morning's newspaper. Of course I knew about the clipping. You told me about it this morning in my office. That's right. But you were the only one I told about it. You couldn't convict Jack the Ripper on that kind of evidence. I'm afraid he's right, Rick. Jello, what time does the late edition come out? About two o'clock. Walt, what time is Sears killed? Around one. Say. Yeah, yeah. The killer couldn't have gotten hold of that column at one o'clock. The papers weren't even out on the street. Well, then how did he do it? Only one man could have gotten that column before 1 a.m., the man who wrote it. Jimmy. He oh. tore it out of the galley sheets. The proofs that are made up before the paper goes to press. 
Cello hired Herman, gave him the clippings, and then went to the party. Oh, you're doing great, Diamond. Keep it up. You're still in love with Mary Sears. You were jealous of Oliver, so you hired Oliver's boy, Herman, figuring the cops would pin Sears' murder on Oliver. How am I doing? You're a good liar and a rotten detective. You knew I'd go to see Mary Sears, so you sent Herman to beat me up and make it look like Oliver was behind it. What? You tried to frame Oliver all along the line. Why, you cheap little scandal snooper. I'll fix it so you don't frame anybody. Wait a minute. All right, break it up. Come on, come on, break it up. Break it up. Hey, Walt. What is it, Rick? Bye. Good evening, Mr. Diamond. Uh, evening, Francis. Miss Asherin? Yes, sir. She's in the library. She's a little tired from last night. I think she's taking a nap. Well, I'll walk on my tippy toes. How about a glass of warm milk, Francis? I'm a little tired, too. Uh, yes, sir. Right away, sir. Well, look at the little baby. Mm-hmm. Oh, her's in dream rain. Poor, really tired baby. The evening breeze caressed the trees tenderly. Oh, Rick. The trembling trees embraced the breeze tenderly. Hello, baby. Don't stop. All right. Close your really eyes. Then you and I came wandering by. Oh. Wonderful. And lost in a sigh were we. Ricky. The shore was kissed by sea and mist tenderly. Ricky. I can't forget how two hearts met breathlessly. Ricky, come here. Your arms opened wide and closed me inside. Ricky, come here. Uh, what is it, dear? Just this. Mm. Mm. Here's your milk, mister. Oh, my goodness. Now, this time I refuse to blush. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, High Averback, Joan Banks, Parley Bear, and Sidney Miller. Music was under the direction of David Baskerville. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. Now this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This program has come to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there. I'm Diamond. What if you got any idea how much trouble a private detective can get into sometimes? Well, if you happen to have an office at Broadway and 53rd Street and the sign painted on your door reads Diamond Detective Agency... You're a setup for more trouble than a guy who goes bear hunting with a switch. I know, because I've got that office and the sign painted on the door. Sure, I've got a lot of idle time, and I use it up sitting around with my feet on the desk, waiting. But idle time can be as dangerous as a rattlesnake taking a sun bath. It's just a preliminary, the lull before the storm. You might wait an hour, a day, or maybe even a week. But the quiet minutes keep multiplying, and sooner or later, things come to a head. Like one day last week. 
I'd been working on an extra long lull that didn't look like it was going anywhere. But in another part of town, a union meeting was taking place. It was going to keep me jumping around like a hungry flea at a dog show. I wanted to talk to you men. It's time that we did something. (coughs) The Laborers Assistance League is already functioning in a great number of factories in this city. And it's getting a stronger foothold all across the country continues to expand and gain power because it operates best where there's growing unrest and discontent within the factories. Now, they cause trouble and make it look like the union's not doing a good job for the worker. I know for a fact that four or five men can sit in on a union meeting and cause enough trouble to make it look like the whole union is wrong. Now, this union is getting along fine. He's really out to make trouble tonight. Yeah. If he keeps it up, this is going to be a tough union to crack. He won't keep it up. We're going to take care of him. Oh, what good will that do? His brother Phil will be in from California next week. We can shut his brother up, too. Are you sure he planned this thing with his brother? Yeah. When he gets in from California, he's bringing enough information to put us out of business. Well, that just gives us a week. He's talked too long. Let's break this meeting up. He's doing just that. Yeah? How do we know you're not talking through your hat? Well, now, look, you all know me. I gripe as much as the next guy. But I know for a fact that this league is not only working like that all over the country, but now it's beginning to move in on our factories and our unions. Yeah, but how do we know it's such a bad thing? There are a bunch of racketeers. And if you don't believe me, you come to this meeting next week and I'll give you the proof you want. I don't believe you. Well, I guess you're right. He promised them proof in a week and that's what his brother gets in. Don't worry about it. When he gets the package, he won't be able to give anybody anything. Tom, bring Hmm? in the rest of the dinner dishes, will you? Oh, sure, honey. Here, Mama, let me wash them. You talk to Tom for a minute. He's going to another meeting tonight. Oh, meetings, meetings. Always meetings. Oh, Tom, you're working too hard. No, don't worry, Mama. Phil will be home tomorrow. You help me. Oh, this is not a good business, Tom. The phone call, the threats. Come on, Tom. Tell Mama. No, I, I, I can't, Mama. It'll all be over soon. Now, come on. We'll help Marge. I told you to go sit down and relax. <laughs> you sound like I was getting to be an old lady. You take the dish towel and we'll both do them, huh? <laughs> yeah, honey. <laughs> Your wife thinks I'm getting too old to wash dishes. Just you wait until she has a daughter-in-law. I think Mama's hinting. Oh. Mama, shame on you. You give us the time to get the son first, then there's plenty of time for a daughter-in-law. Well, I had you and Phil by the time I was 18. Marge is 22, and you've been married over a year now. <laughs> Mama, if you're so set on me raising a family, why don't you talk it over with Marge? Maybe you two can think up something. We'll let you know. Oh, you do that, will you? <laughs> you better hurry up, Tom. You'll be late for the meeting. All right, Mama. Oh, I'll get it. No, 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 no. You say goodbye to your lovely wife. Why, thank you, Mama. You know, before your father died, I only had time to raise two screaming roughnecks. But now I plan to be the grandmother of at least five more. <laughs> How about it, honey? Think we ought to make Mama happy? This is a conspiracy. <laughs> Who do you think's going to get left with all the work? Uh, maybe just three then, huh? Silly. I love big families. Oh, I thought so. <laughs> Smooching when you ought to be on your way to the meeting. Can a guy even smooch with his own wife? <laughs> Who was at the door, Mama? Oh, the mailman. He left our special delivery package for you, Tom. It's in the living room. For me? Yeah. Must be from Philip. It's from California. Oh, he must be sending some stuff on ahead. Well, why don't you open it, Mama? Maybe it's something for you, too. Oh, the women have dishes to wash. It's addressed to you. If you don't want to open it now, so leave it till tomorrow. Now, go on. Get out of my kitchen. You know you're sounding more like a mother-in-law every day. (laughs) Okay, I'll open it. You know, maybe it'd make you happier if you knew that Marge and I decided on five kids. Children are not kids. Kids are goats. Well, you never know. Tom, a John Wagner called you earlier. A Wagner? What do you want? He didn't say. Who's the package from? Oh, that's from Phil, all right. I know it's a surprise, because he sent it to me at the shop first, and then they sent it on here. wonder why I didn't get it at the shop. Well, what is it? Just a second, Mama. Wrapped up pretty tight. Boy, it's sure heavy. (laughs) 
Diamond Detective Agency, murder soft, cheap. We eliminate the middleman. Oh, by George, that was a good one. Is this Lieutenant Levinson, the homicide kingpin? Yeah. Rick, get down here, will you? What's up, lover? Something pretty nasty. Well, tell Otis to stop leaving his bubble gum under the seats. No kidding, Rick. This is something that you ought to know about. Well, stop sounding like an auctioneer at a mortuary and tell me what it is. You know the Waxmans? Mama Waxman? Yeah. Sure, I had dinner over there last week. Took Helen. What's happened, Walt? Last night, someone sent Tom Waxman a box with a bomb in it. What? I knew you were a friend of the family, and I've got to talk with you. Come down here, will you? You know it. I closed the office and grabbed a cab for Walt's precinct. All the way over, I kept thinking about Mama Waxman and her two sons. I'd known the whole family when I used to be on the force. Tom, who used to sing first tenor at the synagogue, had gotten hit in the throat with a baseball. And Cater Weinberg asked me to take over for him, so I sang that day in Tom's place. Mama Waxman heard me and asked me over later for the best dinner I'd ever eaten. we have been friends ever since. The cab dropped me off at the station, and I went in fast. Sergeant Otis was sitting at his desk reading the police gazette. Hello, Otis. Stop panting. They're just pictures. Oh, it's the comic gum show. Go on in, Diamond. The lieutenant expects you. Well, thanks, Sergeant. Oh, by the way, when are you going to get a haircut? You're beginning to look like Rasputin with a Tony. Uh... Hello, Walt. Sit down. I got a real headache. How much damage did the bomb do? Plenty. Killed Tom and put his wife and mother in the hospital. Mama Waxman's pretty bad. Oh, that's awful. Any line on the killer? Yeah, that's why I got this headache. We're uh, holding Phil Waxman, Tom's brother. Holding Phil? Are you crazy? Those two kids were inseparable. Tom's wife said that the box the bomb came in was from Phil. She heard Tom say so before he opened it. Well, she could have been mistaken. Someone could have copied Phil's handwriting. The story's got more holes in it than a fishnet. The package was sent from California, Rick. That's where Phil was. He got in this morning and we picked him up at the train. Uh, what does he say? I thought at first he was going to say plenty, but then some guy comes in and says that he's his lawyer. After the guy left, Phil shut up like a clam. He denies the crime, doesn't he? Oh, sure, but that's all. Can't get anything else out of him. Who was this guy who claimed to be his lawyer? I got it right here. Name is John Wagner. Ah. Uh. You check on him? Yeah, he's a lawyer, all right. But we can't find an address on him. Moved his offices about three weeks ago. Can I uh, talk to Phil? Won't do you any good. But if you want to have Otis take you over to the tombs. I won't have to hold Otis's hand, will I? Oh, go on. Get out of here. Somebody to see you, Waxman. All right, Diamonds, you got five minutes. How are you going to keep track, Otis? On my fingers. Well, that'll only get you up to 13. I'll scream if I need you. Uh... How are you, Phil? You're in on a tough rap. Yeah. You want to tell me about it? I've told the police everything I'm going to. Who was the lawyer who came in to see you? Just a lawyer. John Wagner? Just a lawyer. Look, uh, what were you doing in California? Now, Phil, I know you didn't send that bomb. Why don't you open up and get yourself free? I've said all I'm going to say. Now, get out of here, Diamond. Oh, it's like that, huh? Yeah, it's like that. Oh, come on. Go on, get out. Okay, okay. But don't forget your mother. You don't want to let her down. I'm going over to the hospital and see her now. Hey, Otis, let me out of here. Richard, how's my big policeman? Fine, Mama. Did you know that one of my wonderful sons is dead? Did you know that, Richard? Yes, Mama. Now, you take it easy or the doctor won't let me stay. They killed my Tom because what he said was the truth. And that's why they are bad. Because they don't let people tell the truth. Who, Mama? My boy Phil knows. He will tell everything about them. And then they will be arrested. Sure, Mama, but who does Phil know about? I just saw him and he won't tell me. Mama. I, I feel so sleepy. I, I, I'm tired. Mama. You'll have to leave now, Mr. Diamond. Is she a sleep nurse? Yes, we gave her an injection before you got here. Oh, 
Well, then may I see Mrs. Tom Waxman? For a minute, yes. She's in this next room. She isn't as serious as Mrs. Waxman, but she has to rest. I'll give you a minute with her. Marge? Yes? Who is... Rick? Oh, no, oh, no, nah, nah. come on. You've got to help me out. I'm the guy that's supposed to make people laugh. I'm the cornball with the bad line of chatter, remember? I can't help it. I'm sorry. They, they gave me something to make me sleep, and things don't make too much sense. Look, dear, I want to help Mama, and I want to help you, too. But the nurse will only let me stay a minute. The police are holding Phil. I just came from seeing him. Did he tell you anything? Nothing. I made a mistake and told the police that the bomb had arrived in a package from Phil. I didn't think... They can't believe Phil would ever do a thing like that. He was helping Tom. Mama said Phil knows who did it. He doesn't know. He just knows who's behind it. I'm pretty sure I know, too. Who, Marge? Tom's been making speeches against an organization that call themselves the Laborers Assistance League. I've heard of them. King-size bunco game. Yeah. Phil's been in California. He joined the league and found out a lot of things about it. He used to write Tom once a week. Your time's up, Mr. Diamond. You'll have to leave. Uh, just a second. Marge, did Tom tell anybody what his brother was doing? I don't know. There was a man named John Wagner that called Tom all the time. John Wagner? He's a lawyer. Please, Mr. Diamond. Uh, did he tell any of the men who work in the shop with him? Yes, I think so. Mr. Diamond, I'll have to call the doctor. Please, nurse. This may mean another man's life. Marge, who did he tell? Well, I, I can only remember one person. Ralph Pryor. Pryor. Mama used to fix Tom and Ralph dinner after work sometimes, but he... He, he was Tom's closest friend. Okay, Marge. Now, you take it easy, and I'll see what I can do. Please, Rick, find the men who did this. Yes. Well, I'll try. All right, nurse. I shouldn't have let you stay this long. What would I have to do to get you to take care of me? Have an accident. Well, I'll see what I can come up with. Bye. hospital and walked out of the street. One of those sidewalk photographers snapped my picture and handed me a card in the case I wanted to send him two bits for the print. I threw the card away and headed for the factory where Tom had been working. The superintendent took me down and introduced me to the new foreman of the shop. Yeah, pretty rough about Tom. That's an understatement. Tell me, when did you take over Tom's job as foreman? This morning. How long have you worked for the shop? About three years. Why, are you a cop? I might be. You know a guy named Ralph Pryor? Sure, that's him. Right over there about that there turd lathe. Want me to call him over? No, I think I can make it under my own power. Hey, uh, you Ralph Pryor? Yeah. You knew Tom Waxman pretty well, didn't you? Yeah. Well, don't cry on the machinery. It'll rust. Who are you? What do you want? Name's Diamond. Let's say I'm a friend of the family. Well, good for you. What are you snooping for? I've got an erector set. I just love machinery. Well, don't get too close to this machine or it'll take your arm off. As long as it's not the one I count my money with. How long have you worked here? None of your business. Where were you during the war? Same answer. Well, thanks, Mr. Pryor. You've been grand. Hey, Foreman. Yeah? Did you talk to Pryor? Yeah, he's the quiet type. So how does the mail come in here? From the mail room. Ask a silly question. No, I mean who brings it in? Well, no special one. Foreman usually sends someone after it. Do you remember a package coming here for Tom yesterday or the day before? No, if there'd been one, Tom would have seen it. He was the foreman then. Where can I find the mail room? Up the hall to head the stairs. Thanks. Sure is too bad about Tom. You said that. Say, didn't I know you all back in Little Rock, Arkansas? No. I'm from Malvern. Uh, I just thought I'd ask. <laughs> I went up and talked to the mailroom clerk, and he was a little more help. There had been a package for Tom. He told me that he'd sent it down along with some other mail, but he couldn't remember who'd picked it up. I was beginning to get warm, and I knew it. 
So I slipped into a phone booth and put in a fast call to Lieutenant Levinson. Homicide, Sergeant Otis. Otis, let me talk to the lieutenant. Oh, it's you, Diamond. Why don't you stop playing like a detective? Why don't you buy the lieutenant a necktie for his birthday, a fuzzy green one? You think he'd like that? Sure, and if the clerk hasn't ever seen a fuzzy green one before, just show him your tongue. Now, put the lieutenant on. Uh, Lieutenant Levinson. What? Did you find out anything about that bomb? Oh, yeah, Rick. It was dynamite, highest grade. But I don't see how it could come all the way from California through the mails without the caps blowing the whole thing up. Uh, Neither do I. Do me a favor, will you? Pick up a Ralph Pryor. He works at the same shop that Tom Waxman did. What can I hold him on? Just picking him up. Pick him up for questioning. Since when do you need an excuse? Now, you wait a minute. If you know something about that I've case, just I'll... got a hunch. Pick the guy up, and I'll be down in a little while and tell you all about it. I hung up on Walt just as he was getting around to the words you could censor and headed back to the factory. I waited around outside for about ten minutes, and then, sure enough, a prowl car pulled up, and two boys in blue got out and went in. In a couple of minutes, they came back outside, only this time they had company. Ralph Pryor. I waited until they pulled away, and then I hailed a cab and headed for the 5th Precinct myself. Oh, where have you been? Snooping, Walt. I just saw your boys pick up Pryor at the factory. Thanks. Now, would you kindly tell me what you wanted him picked up for? Oh, it's a long shot, Walt. I found out he knew what Tom's brother was doing in California. What was he doing? Getting some information on a racket that's been trying to muscle in on Tom's local union. In California? Yeah, they're operating all over the country. You've heard of them. Labor's Assistance League. Oh, those leeches. Well, I still don't see what this has got to do with Pryor. Well, I think that bomb was sent from the factory here in New York. And I found out a little while ago that in order to get hold of that package, the killer would have to be working in Tom's shop. You think Pryor did it? I'll tell you better when I see if anyone comes down to get him out. Well? Well, what? Well, what are we going to do? Sit here and look at each other? Well, that's a pretty ghastly thought. How about a fast game of canasta? Oh, you know, it's a lousy two-handed game. Well, I'm just trying to help. We could play jacks, but twosies throw me. Yeah, what is it, Otis? Uh, The lawyer, John Wagner's out here. He says he wants to see the guy we just picked up. Fast word? Ralph Pryor? Yeah. He says he represents some kind of laborer's assistance league or something. Said that Pryor's a member. All right. Let him see him. Okay, Lieutenant. John Wagner, that lawyer who came in to see Phil Waxman this morning, is back again, Rick. It's time to see Pryor. Yeah? (laughs) Well... What are you looking so smug about? Looks like the hunch is going to pay off. You mean this lawyer is tied in with the killing? Well, I'm not sure, but I think so. Tom Waxman was making speeches against the Assistance League. Now a lawyer from the League shows up to help the only guy who knew what Tom was up to and worked in the same shop with him. Now I suppose you want me to hold the lawyer. No, Walt, why? How do I know? That's what I asked you. What? Am I supposed to know everything? Lock him up if you want to. What for? He's not guilty. How do you know he's not guilty? Because you had me pick up Ralph Pryor. Well, let him go, too. Let him go where? With his lawyer. I thought you wanted me to lock up the lawyer. Well, that was your idea. What was? Locking up the lawyer. I don't want to lock up the lawyer. Well, let him go. He's not in. Pryor is. Well, let him go. Who? Phil Waxman. How did he get in here? I don't know. You put him in. Of course I put him in. Now, why should I let him out? I don't know. I ask you. Ask me what? Why you put him in. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant? Empty the jails and throw this idiot out of my office. Thanks, Walt. Bye. I went out in the squad room and spotted the lawyer just as Otis started back into Walt's office with a glass of bicarbonate. He was a little guy, dressed neatly in a Hamburg, blue suit, and spats. I made sure that he was my man, and I went out in front of the precinct to wait. I hung around for about half an hour until he finally came out, and then I started the tale. He grabbed a cab, and so did I. We went across town, and I watched him as he got out and went into a big building on 38th Street. I went in after him. We rode the same elevator to the eighth floor. We both got out. I made like I was looking for a room number, and he went in the door with a sign on it reading Continental Shipping, offices in New York, California, and London. I got close to the door and could hear a phone being dialed. I'd have given my eye teeth, complete with the fillings, to have heard what the conversation was about. Yes, yes, I just went down to see him. He'll be released in an hour. I've got him passage on the tramp steamer. When they release him, he'll meet me at a place I picked, and I'll give him the ticket. I'll tell him the police are up to something, and he'll have to get out of the country. Now, don't worry about that. He'll never get there. The captain of the ship is being paid to see that he doesn't. All right. Yes, everything is going as well as can be expected. Oh, one more thing. A friend of Waxman's, a private detective, is following me. One of our men took his picture coming out of the hospital after seeing Waxman's mother. 
Yes, well, don't worry about it. I can take care of him when the time comes. All right, goodbye. I waited until he came out of the building and the hunt was on again. I grabbed another cab and it took my last three bucks chasing him to a little waterfront dive on Canal Street. I followed him in and watched him sit down in a booth at the back of the room. I made like an unhealthy patron and took a table near the door where I could watch. An hour later, a guy walked in and headed for the lawyer's booth. He was Ralph Pryor. He talked with the lawyer for a minute, then took an envelope from him and got up. He went out and I went after him. If I was right, he was my killer. And the lawyer could wait. Uh, Ralph. Uh, I want to talk to you. I thought I told you to stop snooping. Bad right here. Let's step in this alley. For what? Get in the alley. Hey, what do you think? You're shoving around? You're just full of questions. You know, mister, you're not so big that you can't end up with a busted head. Now, let me go. I guess you better understand something. Oh. Get the point? Oh, you dirty... You don't want to play, huh? Oh. Oh. Maybe you haven't guessed it, but I'm mad. I'm going to kick you from one end of this alley to the other until you tell me who sent that bomb to Tom Waxman. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. The state might slap my wrist, but I don't like losing good friends. Oh, my nose. You should see Mama Waxman. She looks a lot worse, but she's got a lot more troubles. She lost a son. Oh. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I can't take any more. Ah, sure you can. Sure. Just think about something else. Tom Waxman, maybe, or his wife and mother. Want to tell me? Okay. No. Please. please. Wait a minute. I, I... All right, I did it. I did it. Leave me alone, will you? You picked up a dummy box sent from California to the factory and you planted a bomb in it. Yeah, yeah. Why? Because Brother Phil had evidence enough to smear the league? You know a lot, don't you? Sure, Tom was going to present the evidence in front of his union. And the league sent an empty box from California addressed with Phil's forged handwriting. I went up to the mailroom and picked up the box and put the bomb in it and sent it to Tom's house. You do it for the league? Yeah, I did it for them. Who's the boss of the league? Uh, Well, I... I... Come on, come on. All right. It's... (laughs) Oh... Now you'll never know. Wow. Mr. John Wagner, complete with Derringer. I hope you'll notice the error of his ways, Mr. Diamond. He talked too much. You've got a funny way of keeping clients out of trouble. I'm glad you noticed. I'm going to do the same for you. Won't you need a retainer? No, this one's on the house, so to speak. I think you're going to get one anyway. That cop at the end of the alley with a riot gun doesn't look like he's hunting gophers. That is a very stale attempt at throwing me off guard. Anyone that would be stupid enough to try a worn-out stunt like that deserves to die. You'll make it easy for me. Okay, suit yourself. Fire when ready, Gridley. What do you think? <laughs> Thanks, Walt. You arrived in the nick. Nick pick. A big azunt. Why can't you get mixed up with a wife beating or something? The taxpayers are getting tired of seeing their streets cluttered up with a lot of bodies. Why don't you yell at me? How did you find me? I knew something was up, so when Ralph Pryor was released, I tailed him. I saw you tailing Pryor, I saw the lawyer tailing you, so I tailed the lawyer. Well, if you'd had an eight-piece band, you'd have had a parade. Oh, nuts. Oh, what's the matter, Walt? You, you'd have had to shoot him. He was going to kill me. Oh, I'm not worried about that. Well, what is it? I forgot to bring my bicarbonate along. Oh. Well, the wagon came and created Pryor and the lawyer off to the morgue. When we got back to the station, Walt put in a call to the feds and told them to check the uh, Labor's Assistance League in California and pick up the guys who sent the packages through the mails. Using the mails like that can be a tough rap. And three weeks later, the government closed in. They picked up the big wheel and threw the whole bunch away from 10 to 20. Tom's brother, Phil, was released, and he went in front of Tom's union and gave them the evidence he'd collected while he was with the league. Needless to say, the league wasn't represented that night or any night after that. About three weeks after Mama Waxman came home from the hospital, she invited me over for one of her famous dinners. I brought Helen, and her butler Francis came along to help with the serving. Hi, Mama, I'm stuffed. Well, Richard, you didn't finish up the cheesecake. Can't make it, honey. I can't move. Oh, the Helen's a good girl. She ate everything in front of her. You know what? You two should get married. (laughs) 
her appetite is the best argument against getting married I can think of. Keep working on him, Mama. <laughs> all right. Now, let's all go into the front room. If I know my big policeman, he still likes to stretch out on the couch, huh? You are so right. <laughs> <sighs> Here, let me help you, Mama. Oh, thank you, Richard. Uh, there's Francis. Oh, he's in making some coffee. Oh, he's been such a help. Before the accident, it was nothing to serve supper. You sit right here, honey. All right. Thank you. Oh, I won't have to eat another thing for a week. Here's the coffee, Mrs. Rexman. Uh, Francis, you must call me Mama, like the rest. Oh, yes, ma'am. Uh, Mama. Did you have enough to eat also, Francis? It was simply wonderful. You know, someday if Miss Asher doesn't mind, I'd like to stop by and... Well, to swap recipes, as it were. Well, mm-hmm. I think that would be wonderful, Francis. Why don't you do that? <laughs> I'll give you some fine ones, Francis. Where's Phil tonight, Mama? He had to go to our union meeting. He's going to work in Tom's shop. He also asked me to thank you for singing at the funeral. Glad to do it, Mama. Richard, we always wondered where you learned to sing in Yiddish. Well, I used to pound a beat on the Lower East Side. Oh. Well, uh, would you do me a big favor, Richard? Sure, dear. I'm feeling a little sad about my boy tonight. Would you sing something for me? Uh, this song he liked you to sing. Oh, huh? I'm a little full of dinner, Mama. Please, Oh, really. oh yes, uh, please, Mr. Diamond. Well, <clears throat> all right. <clears throat> Mimi, Mimi. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> a Yiddish medal, da fa Yiddish a boy. Pretty good for a shake, it's so, Mama. Oh, fine. Du schön am Edel, in es darf sein, a soi. What does it mean? Don't tell her, Mama. Well, in the toy ray is geschwiben, in es oi is du swabliben, a Yiddish medal. Da fayir is a boy. Hi, 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 Hosen Kale Mazelta. Oh, that was wonderful, Richard. You know, you would make a fine canter. Well, thank you, Mama. How did you like it, Francis? Ha! As a Hosen, Mr. Gitten, this was it. What? Francis. What did he say, Mama? <laughs> he said, as a canter, you would make a fine dishwasher. <laughs> you have just heard Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Hey, Eddie. Eddie, you mind if I butt in for a minute? Not at all, Dick. Thanks. I just wanted to tell the people that next week our show is going to be on at a different time and a different day. The day will be Saturdays instead of Sundays. And would you please look in your newspapers for the time? Thanks, Dick. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Richard Diamond will come to you next Saturday at a new time. Be sure to check your newspaper for the hour. This program has come to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there. My name's Diamond. If you spotted me on the street, you'd probably figure me for an average working man. But you'd be wrong. I fit the description all right because I break my back six days a week to keep my piggy bank nice and stuffed. But my occupation puts me in a class by myself. I'm a private, honey, nothing in this world but detective. You probably say, so what? The average working man comes under the heading of a lot of different jobs. And you'd be right on that count. But there's one little thing that puts me in the class all by myself. Trouble. Mr. and Mrs. Average John Doe work six days a week to keep clear of it. I put in the same time playing footsies with it. It's a kind of silent partner with references dating all the way back to the year one. People get in trouble every second, and I count on a small percentage to come to me to get them out of it. The rest, 
odds and good advertising. As an example, take the other night in a little bistro over on 48th Street. A couple of guys sitting at a back table were getting set for a special brand of trouble. The big kind that you find under the heading of murder. Oh, Bert, old boy, this is turning out to be a wonderful evening. Well, I'm glad you're enjoying it, George. Oh, yes. Say, who's a blonde over there in the booth? Hmm? Well, I've never seen her before, but she's cute. Yeah, she's sure. Good evening, baby. Oh, George, George, yeah? take it what? easy. Maybe she's waiting for someone. Oh, don't be silly. Look, she's smiling. Let's ask her over to the table. Well, huh? I still think she's waiting for someone. If you want to take the chance, go ahead. You ask her. All right, I will. I uh, said good evening. Good evening. Uh, my friend and I noticed you were sitting alone, and uh, we wondered if you'd join us. Oh, I don't believe I can. You see... Oh, please. Just for a few drinks? No, really. Uh, thank you just the same. Well, if you say so, but I'll be unhappy for the rest of the evening. Hi, baby. Tony. I'm sorry I took so long, but... Hey, who's this guy? Not Tony. I said, who's the guy? Uh, if you'll excuse me. No, you wait a minute. Uh, George, come on. I think we'd better leave. This guy a friend of yours? Yes, he is. Was this guy making a pitch, man? No, he only asked me over for a drink. Oh, he did, huh? Now, wait a minute, pal. Please, I made a mistake. I'm sorry. So you made a mistake. Well, I don't like jokers that try and pick up my girl. Oh, hey, wait a minute. You didn't have to slug him. Maybe you'd like to do something about it. Maybe I would. Oh, oh, well, that's the first time Tony ended up on the short end of a fight in a long time. Is that right, George? Yes. I think I cut my head. Yeah, you're bleeding all over the place. You better get out of here, mister. I saw the manager duck in the back room. He's probably calling the car. Here, let me give you a hand, George. Yeah. Here, now, hey. take my hat and wear it over the cut until you get home. I'm getting out of here, too. You want me to drop you off? Uh, what about your boyfriend? He's still unconscious. He was that way when I met him. You want the lift or not? Yeah, what about you, Bert? Oh, I'll be all right. Now, go on. Let her take you somewhere so you can get cleaned up. I'll grab a cab and head for my place. I'll call you in the morning. But I don't Now, want stop to... arguing. You can't afford a scandal. Well, all right. Come on, honey. Let's go. Well, this... Very nice apartment. You better go get cleaned up. Uh, back to that room. I'll get a couple of drinks. I can sure use a drink. I won't be long. Take your time. Yes. Tony, get out of here. Where is that guy? Come on, get out of here. Why, you cheap little... I'll beat it out of you. Let go of me. Take your hands off me. You ah! Take your hands off her. Help. I'll kill the both of you. Help. There's a gun in the desk. A gun? All right. I'll wring your little neck. Oh. You shot him. I did? You better get out of here. Yeah, but uh, what about you? Go on, get out while you can. I'll think of something. Yes. Leave the gun. I'll throw it the river or something. Huh? Oh, all right. Now go on, beat it. You just killed a man. <laughs> Yeah, come in. Hiya, Mr. Diamond. Well, Hennessy, what did you do, wreck your cab? Nah, it's down in the front. Hey, that's a warm magazine you're reading there. Yeah. Listen to what it says here about women's bathing suits. Huh? 1949 suits allow maximum exposure to sun. Note plunging neckline. <laughs> Note. Who's going to miss it? If it plunges in the Lord, wind up at the bends. <laughs> yeah. Uh... Mr. Diamond, would you mind shoving it in the drawer? The picture distracts me. Mm, not at all, no. I, I don't blame you, Hennessy. Thanks. Now, what's on your mind? This. A hat? Yeah. Well, I don't think I can do you much good. What did you bring it to me for? I found it in the gutter over in Flatbush. So what? Some guy loses a hat. Don't tell me you want me to find him. No, I, I just got to worrying a little, you see. I, I found this beside... Oh, a thirty-eight. Well, let's have a look. Take a look at the hat, too. It's got blood all over the inside. Yeah. And initials on the inside. BK. Gun's been fired. You can still smell the powder in the barrel. 
Why didn't you take this to the police? Oh, I didn't want to get mixed up in it. You see, I got to pick up as many fares as I can. I ain't got nobody to drive my cab for me, and I didn't want to spend the day answering questions down at headquarters, you understand? Well, you'll probably have to anyway. I'll have to notify them. Yeah? Well, I, I thought maybe you could find out who owned the hat and maybe solve the case before you notify him, you see? That way I wouldn't have to spend too much time. I could just tell him I found it and beat it. Well, I can't withhold evidence. It'd take away my license. And if you did, they'd lock you up. Okay, I, I just thought well, maybe... Well, I can check the hat store before I get to the 5th precinct. Yeah, well, uh, won't that be a tough job? There's a lot of hat stores, well, you know. this hat's got a label. Besides, when someone finds a bloody hat with a 38 lying next to it, I, I get interested. Particularly when there isn't a corpse to go with it. Yeah. Well, I gotta go, Mr. Diamond. Thanks a lot. You got a free ride any time you want it. I may take you up on that. So long, Hennessy. Well, there you are. What did that tell you? When you're working with trouble, something always shows up. Sometimes it's just a routine case. A guy knocks off his wife and he comes to you because he suddenly found out that he had that lonely feeling. Or maybe you get a real screwy one. A taxidermist that got tired of stuffing animals and went to work on a neighbor. Or then you get one that gives you the same feeling you get when you pick up a poker hand and the first four cards you look at are all spades. Well, I was holding two cards. A hat with blood on it, a gun that had been fired, and all I needed to fill out the hand was a body. By all rights, I should have taken the evidence right down to my friend, Lieutenant Levinson, at Homicide. But I didn't have anything to do, so I decided to see what kind of pieces I could fit into the puzzle. The label in the hat was from a store on Fifth Avenue. It wasn't far from my office, so I walked it. Yes, sir. Something I can do for you? Yeah. Stop munching your sensen and tell me if this hat is from your store. Well, let me see it. These glasses are not telescopes, you know. Yeah. Here. Well, if you're planning to return this merchandise, sir, I can assure you the store will not accept it. You've been bleeding on the sweatband. Look, Rosebud, I just want to know if the hat is from this store. It most certainly is. It's one of our custom models. Who did you sell it to? If you found this hat, we will be glad to return it to its owner. We are not supposed to give out the names of our clients. I have a small badge here that should cut this conversation down to a few words. See? Oh. Now, would you mind telling me to whom did you sell this hat? Well, just because you're a detective, I am not impressed. However, under the circumstances, I'll give you the buyer's name. You're a real sport. I suppose you wear a shoulder holster, too. Or is that bulge your tailor's fault? Psst. Come here. I really keep a midget in there. You don't say. Yeah. He spits through the lapel at stupid hat clerks. Oh, really? Now, come on, bright eyes. Who bought the hat? Well, if you'll just hold your horses. That's the new line, if I ever heard one. Come on, Bubbles. Oh. Yeah. Here it is. This hat was sold to a Mr. Bertram Calmus. We make all his hats for him. Well, bully for you. What's his address? 430 Sutton Place. Now, will that be all, sir? Yes, that will be all, and thank you. You've been a break through the whole ugly mess. I left him watering his gardenia and headed for the residence of one Mr. Bertram Calmus. The apartment house was about ten blocks away, and with the money I had in my pocket, all taxicabs started looking like iron claws with four wheels. I walked. Yes? How do you mean that? Yes, I don't want any. Oh, and I've got a pretty good sales talk. I never buy anything unless I have a demonstration. My middle name is Semper Paratus. Like the Coast Guard, I'm always prepared. I suppose I could top that, but I'm getting tired of trying to close the door on your foot. What is it you want? I hate to admit it, but I'm looking for Bertram Calmus. My husband. Good for him. Is he in? No, but he will be any minute. And for the boss. This hat, I believe, is his. What blonde's apartment did it turn up in? It was found in a gutter in Flatbush. Well, Flatbush is a little out of his territory, but the gutter sounds familiar. It's that stain all over it. Blood? Does your husband bleed a lot? Not recently. We've been getting along. Are you from the police? I'm a detective. Oh. Come in. Mm, I'd hate to be selling brushes. I'd have slammed the door on your face. Oh, well, then I made an impression. Perhaps. Let's just say you're waiting for a sacrifice to move you to second base. Won't you sit down? Thanks. What happens when I round third? And that depends on your batting average. Mr. Diamond, Mrs. Calmus. That's it. 
Now, getting back to a very dull subject, does this hat belong to your husband? I don't know. It looks like one of his. Has it got any initials in the band? Mm Mm-hmm. B.K. When did you find it? I didn't. The cab driver picked it up this morning. And it isn't my husband's blood. He left about a half an hour ago to do some shopping, and he was very bloodless. No cuts on his head? No cuts. He came in around two this morning. He'd been drinking, but he wasn't cut up. Oh, there he is now. I hope he can discuss baseball and the time. Oh, I got all the things you wanted in it. Um, Bert, this is Mr. Diamond. He's a detective. Yeah? Well, how are you? Fine, Mr. Calvins. Tell me, is this your hat? My hat? Let me see it. Why, no. No, it isn't. The hat store on Fifth Avenue says it's older to you. Well, I can't help what they say. That's not my hat. Are you sure, darling? It was found in a gutter. I don't care if they found it on a Yale man in the Harvard Club. It's not mine. Well, I guess I'll have to take your word for it. Uh, wait, wait. Isn't that blood on the hat? Mm, yeah. Well, goodbye, Mrs. Calmus. Mr. Calmus. Nice meeting you both. I'll see you to the door. I can do it. I know you can, dear. Coming, Mr. Diamond? Sure. Goodbye. Come back again, Mr. Diamond. Well, goodbye, Mr. Calmus. Where? Where can I call you? What? I can't explain now. Where can I call you in about a half an hour? My office. It's in the book. You'll hear from me, but please, please don't do anything until then. Okay. Half an hour. Then I go to the police with this hat. Bus. Mr. Diamond, this is Bert Calmus. Yeah. Yes, I, I couldn't say anything to you in front of my wife. That is my hat. Oh, I thought so. Why did you deny it? Well, I was out with a pal last night. There was a fight over a girl. I didn't want to mention it in front of my wife. Oh, how did the blood get on the hat? My friend got hit on the head, and I loaned him my hat to cover up the wound. What was it doing in a gutter in Flatbush? I really don't know. My friend left with the girl, and I went right home. Mm. Well, who is this friend of yours? I think something may have happened to him. Well, I called him this morning, and he seemed very nervous about something, and he asked me to come over. I'm in the lobby of this hotel right now. Ah, uh, he's probably just worried about the girl he picked up. As long as the blood on the hat was from a cut on his head, I don't think there's too much to worry about. No, no, Mr. Diamond, I, I think it's more than that. He's my employer, and I know him pretty well. I do wish you'd come over. Well, all right, Mr. Calmus. What's the address? The Whitsitt Hotel on East 54th Street. I'll meet you in the lobby. Don't ask me why I started getting that lousy feeling when all I had was a bloody hat, a gun, and a pretty good explanation for one of the items. But there it was, that jammed up feeling in the pit of my stomach like I just swallowed a whole pineapple. Something was wrong, and I wanted to find out what. So I hurried over the, to the Whitsitt Hotel and met Calmus in the lobby. I'm glad you came, Mr. Diamond. I just put in a call to George's room and someone else answered. So what? Well, the man asked a lot of questions, like who I was and why I... What did I want with George? And... Oh, uh, I take it George is your friend of last night. Yes, George Watkins. He's the president of the firm I work for. Well, let's go up. When someone starts asking questions like that on the phone, it begins to sound like the police have moved in. Come on. Yeah. Oh, hello, Walt. Rick, what are you doing here? Fair question. I'll answer yours if you'll do the same for me. I came up to see a Mr. George Watkins. So did I. Well, what's the matter? Is George in some kind of trouble? Who's this guy? Oh, he's a friend of Watkins. Works for him. Oh, yeah? Well, come on in. George. George, what's going on here? You better let the lieutenant tell you, Bert. I can't think anymore. What's the charge, Walt? Murder. But... Hmm? Murder? You got a call from a girl last night who said a man named George Watkins killed someone in her apartment. When we got over there, we found the girl there, too. Oh, well, you must have the wrong man, Inspector George. Lieutenant. And I'm sure you think George wouldn't, but he just confessed. George? Yes, Bert, I killed the man. But I I didn't kill her. The man came in and tried to strangle her. She told me to get the gun in the drawer, and when the man wouldn't let her go, I shot him. That isn't what the girl told us. She said she took this gun home, this guy home, after he'd been in a fight, and when they got to her apartment, he made a pass just as her boyfriend came in. Then Watkins shot him and ran out. We figure he got excited, and when he had time to think about it, he went back and killed the only other witness. I didn't kill the girl. I never went back there at all. I came straight here. Uh, Walt, Mr. Kalmus here was with him up until the time he left with the girl. Is that right, Mr. Kalmus? Why, yes, sir. Now, there was a previous fight, and Watkins got that cut on his head. Mr. Kalmus loaned him his hat to cover the wound. That's right, sir. 
And, uh, oh, by the way, Walt, what caliber was the murder weapon? Thirty-eight, but we haven't found the gun yet. Here, yeah, check this one with ballistics. How'd you find this? Cab driver named Hennessy brought it into me this morning. Found it lying with a hat. Did you ever see this gun before, Watkins? No, I, I told you I don't own a gun. Walt, what time do you figure he killed the man and the girl? The coroner fixed the time of death about one o'clock this morning. Hmm. How long were you at this girl's apartment, Mr. Watkins? Why, about five minutes before her boyfriend came in. I shot him and left immediately. And you don't remember taking your hat or the gun? What are you getting at, Rick? This is an open and shut case. He admits killing one of them, but he won't admit the other killing because he knows it was premeditated. Oh, just a hunch, Walt, just a hunch. Mr. Watkins, would you mind telling me just what happened after the girl's boyfriend started choking you? Well, I grabbed a gun out of the dresser near the kitchen and I shot him. And the girl told me to get out, that she'd take care of things, so I dropped the gun and ran. Did you hear anything else? Anything unusual? No. But, yes, now that you mention it, I did hear something that had slipped my mind until now. What did you hear? Well, I, I don't know whether I can describe it or not. It uh, sounded like someone had opened a bottle of flat champagne. What are you getting at, Rick? Oh, wait a minute, Walt. When did you hear this noise? Right after I shot the man. I remember wondering if someone hadn't opened a bottle in the kitchen. Is that where the noise came from? Uh, yes, I think so. Mm. All right, if I go over and case the scene, Walt? We've done that. Yeah, but you weren't looking for something. Why don't you come with me, Mr. Calamus? I'd like to talk with you. What's the address, Walt? 16 West 113th Street. Well, now, look, don't worry too much, George. I can handle the business, and in the meantime, I'll do everything to get you off. Thanks, Bert. Now, you wait a minute, Rick. If you think you know something... Walt! Yeah? Bye. Calmus and I went downstairs and took a cab over to 16 West 113th Street. It was a middle-class apartment house in Flatbush. A four-story brownstone. I let Calmus pay the fare and we went in. I wonder what floor it's on. Well, she'll tell on the mailboxes. Yeah, here it is. Nan Phillips, 206. Well, let's go up. Oh, uh, what do you do for Mr. Watkins? I'm his vice president. That's why I took him out last night. I wanted to interest him in a new account. I just can't imagine him killing anyone, but I guess people do funny things when they lose their heads. Oh, no. 206. Oh, well, here it is. Yeah? Hello. Oh, no. Good afternoon, Sergeant Otis. What do you want, Diamond? Well, I want to stand out here in the hall and count the hairs in your five o'clock shadow. Now, let us in. The lieutenant said it was all right. Okay, comic. Mr. Calmus, meet Sergeant Otis. How are you? Hello, Sergeant. Otis, make like a policeman and point out the circumstances in this killing, will you? Well, I don't know why I should, Shamus, but if the lieutenant sent you over, I guess I'll have to. Mm. Two bodies was over there by the window, lying pretty close together. Uh-huh. The killer, that Watkins fellow, was standing about here in the center of the room. With his back to the kitchen door? Yeah. He shot them both from about here. Hey, what are you looking for? Oh, I like to get down on my hands and knees. It's cooler. And it won't do you no good to start looking for fancy clues. The guy already confessed. Well, 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 well. Hey, what do you got there? Just a wad. So, you got some wadding from the murder gun. You better give it here. Sure. But hang on to it, Otis, and be sure to give it to the lieutenant. Maybe you haven't noticed, but murder guns don't throw this much wadding unless you can kill someone with a blank cartridge. What? Uh, don't let it throw you. Mr. Calmus, I've got some things to do. Can I drop you somewhere? Well, no, thanks. Now that Mr. Watkins can't take care of the office, I'd better go down and check over some things. But I'll keep in touch with you, Mr. Diamond. Uh, you do that. Uh, now, wait a minute, Diamond. Oh, stop trying to figure it out, Otis. You'll snap your wig. I was getting close to something. I wanted to tie the ends together before it caught up with me. I had a big, fat hunch that Watkins had been framed good. And the more I found out, the more it looked like a killer was still loose. The whole setup had been screwy from the first. Why would a guy lose his hat and drop his gun in the same place? Or, if he threw them both away, why wouldn't he burn the hat and throw the gun in the river? Nobody's frightened enough to lay them side by side in the gutter. I learned a lot since this morning, and I was certain of one thing. The killer tried to make it look good. But he was an awful amateur. I knew something else, too. Amateurs can be awfully mean sometimes when you corner them. I put in a call to Walt and told him what I had, and then I asked him to give me half an hour and, and meet me at Mrs. Calmus's flat. I grabbed another cab, and 20 minutes later, I was sitting on a long couch next to Mrs. Calmus. 
It's easy to get that crowded feeling, even on a long couch. You just both sit on the same cushion. Comfy? Oh, yeah. Uh, what kind of perfume is that? My sin. Past or future tense? A rounding second. Mm. It brought you back, Mr. Diamond. Oh, I, uh... I want to ask a couple of questions. Past or future tense? What time did your husband get in last night? I told you, about two o'clock. Why? Do you know if he knows a girl named Nan Phillips? I really don't know. Oh. Well, all right. Just a few more questions, and then we'll get back to that perfume. I'll think you heard. You said you'd been getting along with your husband. Would you mind explaining that? Certainly. I like nice things, and lately he's been buying them for me. Oh. What's your husband's salary? About 15000 a year. Oh, could he afford to buy you these things? Well, he told me he was getting a raise, and then he'd gotten a bigger plan. What's this all about? Maybe I'd better tell you. Bert, I didn't hear you. I did. What are you doing with that gun? I'm going to use it. I found Mr. Diamond making passes at my wife, and I shot him. Are you crazy? Don't ask him that. He's allowed to start thinking about it. You can't shoot me and get away with it, Calmus. What are you going to do with your wife? She won't back you up. No. No, I guess she wouldn't. All right, both of you, get up and walk downstairs to my car. Bert, what are you doing? Your husband killed two people last night, Mrs. Kalmus, and I was going to try and cover because he guessed I knew how it was done. You're not going to kill me, too. Get moving. Bert, please. Go on. That's what he says. Why did you kill anyone, Bert? He wanted to frame his boss. I'll bet when the company checks, they'll find out he's had his hand in the till. They won't find out, Mr. Diamond. With Mr. Watkins' book for murder, I'm next in line for president. I'll be able to fix the book so it will look like he took the money, too. Is that where you got the money for all those things you've been buying for me? You shot the man and the girl from the kitchen with a silencer, didn't you, Bertram? That's right. I knew you were onto something when you discovered that wad from the blank cartridge. I was onto something a long time before that. Yeah? All right. Come on. Over to that gray sedan. And remember, I've still got this gun in my pocket. Ah, uh, you're an amateur, Bertram. Yeah, is that right? Sure. I knew you had something to do with it when we got over to the girl's apartment. I didn't know what floor it was on, and you looked in the mailboxes. That's the best way to find an apartment, isn't it? Yeah, but not once at any time did anyone mention the dead girl's name. But you knew it and found it on the mailbox. All right, stop right here. <laughs> Open the door, Jean, and get in first. The front seat. Bert, please. Get in. All right. Now you, Mr. Diamond... You're going to drive. You know, I left my license in my other suit. Stop stalling. I had to do something to stall for just a second because over Bertram's shoulder I spotted a prowl car sliding up to the curb and good old Walt was climbing out. Uh, uh, Bertram, would you mind answering just one question? What is it? The gun that Watkins thought he killed the man with was loaded with blanks, wasn't it? Sure. I killed the guy from the kitchen with a silencer. The whole thing was rigged, huh? The man and the girl were supposed to stage that fight, and Watkins was supposed to shoot the guy with the dummy slug. You said one question. Now get in the car. All right, Thomas, don't move. What? Why, you... Duck, Rick! That was a close one. You're so right, Walt. Take his gun. I think you'll find it's the one that Watkins fired the branks from. How is he? On his way. Hey, Bertram. I'll go call the wagon. Bertram. Yes? You want to tie the ends together? I paid the girl and the man to stage the fight. I told them I wanted to frame George and blackmail him. So you framed him with a double murder instead. Why? I've been stealing money from the company. How'd you know it was me? Well, knowing the girl's name, for one thing, and your wife told me you'd gotten in about two. Oh. You told me over the phone you went straight home after the fight in the cafe. The killing took place about one. Watkins uh, said he'd been at the girl's for five minutes. About 15 to get to her place, so that meant you all left the cafe around 12.30. It doesn't take an hour and a half to get... Hey, Bertram. John. Huh? I don't think Bert can hear you. Yeah. Well, it was a pretty dull story anyway. <laughs> Well, the wagon got there, and I briefed Walt on everything that had happened. They took Mrs. Calmus home and released Watkins. 
It was a stinking hot afternoon, and I needed something cool to bring me down to normal, so I headed for 975 Park Avenue. A tall lemonade with a mind of its own, and a curvaceous redhead with the same gimmick. Yes? Oh, good afternoon, Mr. Diamond. Afternoon, Francis. Miss Asherin? Yes, sir. She's in the study reading. Thanks, Francis. Oh, uh, how about something cool? Yes, sir. Right away, sir. Hi. Hi. Well, you look cool enough. That's a nice getup. You like it? It's the newest thing. Yeah, I uh, saw it in the magazine. What do you do if it shrinks? Oh, silly. No, no, I'm concerned. You might get raided. Don't you like it? Yes, ma'am. What do you think of me? Ah, oh, you're adorable. You're beautiful and you're cute. Too. Hey, that sounds like a song. Uh-huh. Come here. No, not now sing it. It's cute. That's too hot. I'm rather cool. Well, I was only lukewarm until I spotted that play suit. Go on. A, you're adorable. Okay, but uh, then I want to play. <laughs> Get it? Play? Play suit? <laughs> that was then. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, no. Go on. A, you're adorable. B, you're so beautiful. C, you're a cutie full of charm. D, you're a darling. And E, you're exciting. And F, you've got feathers on your oh, arm. Oh, Rick. G, you look good to me. H, you so heavenly. I, you're the one I idolize. J, we're like Jack and Jill. K, you're so kissable. L, is the love light in your eyes. Rick. M, hmm? You want me to finish? I love you. Oh, you're sweet. Come here. Mm-hmm. Hey, just one moment, sir. Uh, yes, Francis? I'm not going to be embarrassed again. Here's your lemonade. Oh, thank you, Francis. Oh, it's nothing, sir. A, you're adorable. B, you're so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Byron Kane, Lorene Tuttle, Paul Fries, and Wally Mayer. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Hello there, this is Diamond. I have a little office on Broadway at 53rd Street. And if you happen to be in the neighborhood sometime, you might notice a sign on the door. It reads, Diamond Detective Agency. Yeah, that's how I make a living, such as it is. I sit at my desk behind that door and wait for someone to come in and hire me. Eventually, trouble works its way into someone's life and gives him a shove in my direction. He tells me about it, and I listen with the attitude of a father confessor. When he's done, I dry my eyes and tell him what I think. What I think really doesn't matter, because it's just a shortcut to $100 a day in expenses. Sure, you can hire a guy for less money, but when I work, it's for a price I figure I'm worth. It's got to be that way because sometimes it works a little dirty, and I have to swallow a lot of pride. I get mixed up in everything from simple divorce to muscle-bound homicide, and when trouble can't find me a client, it starts working on yours truly, and I wind up in a corner. I guess trouble figured I was just about due for a squeeze play because one night last week, two lifers in the state pen started working me into their plans. Well, 
What about it, Walsh? Shut up. Wait until the guards pass. Okay. Drag out the cards like we was playing. Sure. Is it uh, set for the night? Yeah. I got the car and everything. Yeah. We'll head for Florida and get across to Cuba. Oh, well, I'd be glad to get out of this uh, three lousy years. Yeah, I got eight behind me. I used every minute figuring how I'm going to take care of a guy. Oh, Walsh, you're not going to start that again. Forget it. Be glad you're getting out. You knock off that guy and you'll never make it to Cuba. Now, look, I figured this whole thing out. I paid out a lot of dough just to make it come off. And when it does, I'm going to kill an ex-cop. And you're going to help me. Me? Yeah. Unless you want to rot here. Oh, you're out of your mind. If this break comes off, it'll be the neatest trick in years. And you want to louse it up by knocking off some guy on the outside? You can stay here and rot if you want to. The only way I take you along is you help me to get a guy named Diamond. Yeah, but you waste a lot of time in New York. They'll have the roads covered by then. Look, just because this diamond guy knocked off your brother in that bank job... You see, you, you bust out of here, it's on my terms. I... Now, make up your mind, it's getting late. Okay, give me the layout. <laughs> What is it, Otis? We just got a call, Lieutenant. Two prisoners busted out of Sing Sing, killed two guards. Who are they? Big time. Bob Wells and Charles Walsh. Charles Walsh? Yeah, life. I know, I know. Diamond helped send him up before I took over this department. Otis, get Diamond on the phone. Diamond? Yeah, Diamond. Who'd you think I meant? Little Red Riding Hood? Yeah, yeah Lieutenant. Mm. Oh, Diamond, Otis. Bring me my bike, Cardinal Otis. Someday I'm going to get good and sore. What did you say? Uh, nothing. Ah, uh, nuts. Now, what's the matter? His office don't answer. Give me that phone. Huh? We've got to find him before Walsh does. Maybe he's over at Helen Asher's house. All right, Otis, stop standing on one foot. You can leave. Miss Asher's residence. Hello, Francis. This is Lieutenant Levinson. Is Diamond there? Why, no, sir, but Miss Asher expects him. Oh, oh wait a moment, sir. Here's Miss Asher. It's Lieutenant Levinson for Mr. Diamond, Miss Helen. Oh, thank you, Francis. Hello, Walt. How are you, Helen? I was looking for Rick. Oh, I was just talking to him. He should be here in about 20 minutes. Why? Uh, will you have him call me right away? Is something wrong? No, no. Just tell him... Tell him an old friend of his is in town, and I have to talk to him about it. Oh, all right, Walt. I'll tell him. Well, thanks, Helen. It'll be at least 20 minutes. He's walking over from his office. Okay, Diamond, hold it right there. <laughs> Start walking over to that sedan. Don't you know it's not polite to point? Look, laughing boy, I got a big gun in my pocket. Well, I'm proud of you. I thought it was a crossbow. Get moving. Okay. I'd never seen him before. He was a tall guy with a scar on his chin. He walked me over to the sedan and opened the door. He moved in close and shook me down. He relieved me of my 38 and motioned me into the front seat. I slid in and he started to follow, so I kept one leg out in front of me and kicked him in the face. I couldn't get enough leverage to cool him, but it gave me enough time to get out the other door and start making like a miler. I looked over my shoulder and saw him climb out holding a bloody nose. I knew he wouldn't take a shot unless he got close enough to make it count, so when he started after me, I ducked into the subway. I found a dime and went through the turnstile. A train was getting ready to pull out, so I pushed my way on just as the gonnet came down the stairs. He said he wasn't happy to see me go. He didn't even wave goodbye. Wait a minute, you! Wait! Oh, nuts. I know it. Got all the way from me. How do you like to call that guy? Yeah? Yeah, you and your swell ideas. What's the matter? I waited for Diamond outside his office, like you said. I started to hustle him in the car, and he kicked me in the face. Oh, I think my nose is you broken. You stupid... I told you to be careful. Yeah, sure you did. You think I like getting booted in the nose? 
Look, if you want diamonds so much, you get them yourself. Maybe you can tell me how you're going to get to Cuba without me? Huh? Oh. Well, what do you want me to do now? I still want diamond. Yeah, but he jumped the subway train. How am I supposed to find her? I found out he's got a dame over in Park Avenue. Pick her up, bring her over here. Pick her up? I'd have give you the chair for kidnapping. I'll use her to get diamond. Pick her up if you want to get out of the country. Yeah, but a now, snitch... Look, I it... busted you out of store. I can bust you right back in. No. Now pick her up. Her name is Helen Asher. She lives at 975 Park. Well, what if someone else is there? What if there is? You want me to stop over making a fourth for bridge? Get him out of the way and bring the dame to me. <laughs> Hello, Otis. Well, Diamond. Lieutenant's been looking all over the city for you. I bet you've been a nervous wreck. I wouldn't care if you fell off the George Washington Bridge, Shamus. Why, Otis? After all, we've been to each other. Uh, nuts. You better go on in and see the lieutenant. Sure. Hey, uh, Sergeant. Yeah? When are you going to get some new shoes? If yours turn up anymore in front, you'll have to ski to work. Uh... Hello, Walt. Rick, we've been looking all over for you. Why don't you cops get on the job? It's getting so it isn't safe for a citizen to walk the streets at high noon. What are you yakking about? Well, I leave my office to go to see Helen and some goon tries to hold me up. Well, you're lucky you didn't get it right then. Do you know who busted out of jail last night? Go on, scare me. Charles Walsh. He swore if he ever did bust out, he'd get you. Well, that explains something. Why, what happened? This character tries to hustle me into a car, so I shoved my foot in his face and beat it into a subway. But it wasn't Walsh. Might have been Bob Wells. He busted out with him. I can tell you in a minute he got a file on him. Sure. Otis, bring in the file on Bob Wells. Right away, Lieutenant. Oh, Walt, do you mind if I use your phone? Now, go ahead. I better call Helen. Tell her I'm going to be a little late. Well, I just talked to her and asked her to have you call. Where is everybody? Yes? Francis? Oh, Mr. Diamond... Please, hurry over here. Something's happened to Miss Asher. What are you talking about? Miss Asher's been kidnapped. What? Yes, sir. A man came in and made Miss Asher go down to his car at the point of a gun. He also hit me over the head. Was he a tall man with a scar on his chin? Yes, sir. That's right. We'll be right over. Walt, I think the guy that tried to push me around has kidnapped Helen. Oh, no. He pulled a gun on her and slugged Francis. We better get over there. Now, if Charles Walsh is loose... And he's trying to get me, then snatching Helen is a sure way to get me to come around. Hey, uh, where's that file on Bob Wells? Wait a minute. Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant. Haven't you got that file on Wells yet? Yes, sir. I was just bringing it in. Well, step on it. Otis is bringing it in. Here you are, Lieutenant. Let me see it. Hey, now, wait a minute. Oh, shut up, Otis. This is the guy, all right. He's the one who tried to pick me up. Uh, uh, may I take one of these pictures, Walt? Sure, but what are you going to do? I'll see if I can find him. You go on over and talk to Francis. See if this is the same guy who took Helen. I'm going to go down to Skid Row and talk to a wise old owl who knows about things like this. I got out of the 5th precinct in a hurry and grabbed a cab for Skid Row. I knew an old deadbeat down there who had a line on every crook in the underworld. And there was just a chance he could tell me where Bob Wells was hiding out. His name was Wilbur Truitt, and he hung out in a shabby dive called the Parrot. Hello, Wilbur. What? Again? You at the piano strike up a chorus of my buddy, for the wandering boy has returned. Look, Wilbur. I, I would rise and bow from the waist as befits the occasion, but I fear that some sterno I accidentally came in contact with has rusted my spine, and I am forced to remain in a sitting position. I haven't got time to listen to the routine, Wilbur. I- I'm looking for someone. Here, take a look at this picture. Ever see this guy? Unless I have my morning constitutional buck, I can bring nothing into focus but a large bottle and a straw. Oh, oh, waiter. Waiter, uh, give me a bottle. You have arrived in the nick of time. I get that wonderful warm glow when you ask for a whole bottle. A snap comparison would be that of a happy mother smiling blissfully at a nursing bay. Okay, Wilbur, now tell me, uh, 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 do you know this man? One sip of strength, and I shall have the eyes of a carrot-stuffed feline. <laughs> now, now, yes, I can see the gentleman clearly. In fact, my vision has so greatly improved it begins to take on the functions of an X-ray. 
For instance, I can readily perceive that the man in question is addicted to false stimulants, and his low brow and squinty eyes tell me that he is indeed a person of some doubtful character. You're looking in the mirror. Yeah? No, here. Here's his picture. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Mr. Bobby Wells. The description is flexible. Know where I can find him? Up until yesterday, he was residing at an institution upstate. Sing Sing, I believe. It is very possible that he is hiding out in one of his old haunts on 23rd Street, but uh, I couldn't say for sure. Oh, why not? Uh, this bottle you purchased entitles you to one of my best guesses. To be absolutely accurate, I would need further inducement. It's the risk, Bucko. Uh, bring me another jug, bartender. Ah, bless you. Try looking in a rooming house at 533 West 23rd Street. Now, if you don't mind, I shall forget the necessity for long conversations and begin to concentrate on the work ahead of me. Goodbye, Bucko, and stop in again. Say tomorrow morning if you wake up feeling charitable. <laughs> I left Wilbur trying to figure the best way to parlay the two bottles and headed for the address he'd given me. It was a typical apartment house of the district, a four-story building with a high premium insurance policy. I asked the landlady if a Bob Wells lived there, and she told me a man answering his description had taken a room there that morning. She told me he'd gone out a few minutes before, and she'd let me into his room. I told her to keep a lookout and warn me if he showed. Then I started looking. I tore the place apart but I didn't come up with a thing. I spotted the phone and started to call Walt, and that's when I saw it. A pad lying by the base of the phone with a heavy imprint left from the writing on the top sheet. I pulled an old trick. I took a pencil and rubbed the lead lightly over the imprint, and up came one telephone number. I dialed it and waited. Weinberg's delicatessen. Oh, uh, is Bob Wells there? Oh, Bob Wells. Never heard of him. Thanks. Well, it's like that. One minute you think you've got a lead hot enough to melt your change purse, and the next you find yourself looking like a tree surgeon in Death Valley. But in my business, it takes a conventional three to strike you out. So I found the address of the delicatessen, and 15 minutes later, I was standing between a smoked herring and a three-foot salami talking with Mr. Weinberg. What can I do for you, sir? Oh, uh, I had talked with you, oh, say, 20 minutes ago about a Mr. Bob Wells. Bob Wells? Oh, yes. Never heard of him. Uh, take a look at this picture. Maybe you know the face and not the name. It's familiar. Yes, I think I've seen him somewhere. Think hard now. This is important. Are you a policeman? Detective. Oh. How about it? Oh, yeah, yeah. As long as you're a cop, sure I remember him. He came to my store last night. I remember because I had already closed and he kept pounding on the door. Finally, I let him in. He was very rude. He bought a lot of groceries, but... Very rude. Have you seen him again? Sure, he came in this morning about locks and bagels. Still rude. Hmm. Where's your phone? In the back. Has, uh... This Mr. Wells done something? He left Sing Sing without saying goodbye to the warden. Ha! <laughs> now, look, uh... I'm going in the back and use your phone. If Wells happens to come in while I'm back there, stall him and come back and tip me off. I'll do my best. But he better not be rude. Hey, Walt, I'm in a delicatessen over on 24th Street. Yeah, Rick. I traced Wells this far, found out he's been buying food here, probably for Walsh. You think Walsh is hiding somewhere in the neighborhood? Yeah, yeah, that's my guess. They probably took separate places so they could move in a hurry if one hideout got hot. I'll be over there right away. Good. Comfortable, honey, but no yelling. Or I'll have to stuff up that pretty mouth. I don't understand this. Why did you kidnap me? I've been having a hard time getting in touch with your boyfriend, Diamond. Figure if his girl's in trouble, he'll come look. I, I don't have a boyfriend. <laughs> sure, sure, play it straight. But you watch. Tonight I call your butler and tell him we got you. If Diamond wants you alive, he comes to a spot I got picked up. And he comes along. I don't know any diamond. Ain't she cute, Bobby? Yeah, cute. 
Want me to fix her so she forgets how to lie? No, I don't care if she claims Diamond's her uncle. <laughs> Go on down to Delicatessen and get some food. I'm getting hungry. Okay. But I still think we ought to be getting out of town. In one hour, I call this dame's house. At 12 o'clock, I meet Diamond in the park. Then we get out. Why do you want to see uh, this Diamond? Oh, we're old friends, baby. He sent me up for life. And he shot my kid brother full of holes. I just want to see that Diamond gets everything that's coming to him. You talk too much. You've got some bad habits yourself. Now get that food. And if you're too lazy to walk downstairs, I'll show you a shortcut. Uh, Three floors, straight down. You can jump for it. Okay, okay. Good evening, gentlemen. What can Weinberg do for you? Hey, Lieutenant, that chopped liver sure looks good. Keep your fat hooks off of that, Otis. Walt. Oh, yeah, Rick? Back here. All right. The storekeeper is watching out for Wells. If he shows, he'll come back here in Tempest. I parked the squad car two blocks over. I didn't want Wells or Walsh to think something was up. Where's Otis? Otis! I'll be right with you, Lieutenant. I'm just buying something to nibble on. Hmm. His nibble would grind up a whole cow. If Wells comes in and spots a cop, he'll take off like a jackrabbit. Hold it, Walt. What's huh? the That guy coming across the street. Looks like Wells. Oh. Otis, get away from that door. Huh? I can't hear you, Lieutenant. A man's coming in the store. Get away from the door. He is? You want me to hide? No, you idiot. Just play it smart like you didn't know him. But get away from the door so he'll come in. Oh. Okay, Lieutenant. Leave it to me. Oh. Walt Duck. Good evening. What can the Weinberg do for you? Uh, I'll have a couple of sandwiches. Hey, try the salami. It's great. Huh? Oh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, make it salami. Call slot. Uh, pickle beer. Nice pickle. night. Listen uh, to that idiot. Yeah, sure. Master. Uh, he's doing fine, no, Walt. Just... Relax. You live around here? Oh. Huh? No, uh, just seeing a sick friend. Yeah. Uh, maybe that salami ain't such a good idea if your friend's sick. You know, I had an uncle with ulcers. He couldn't touch the stuff. It's too much garlic. Ketchup? No. My friend's got a cold. Oh. Well, then I don't guess it'll hurt him, but... You know, the best thing for a cold is good mustard plaster. And now you, you, you take the Here's plaster... Here's your sandwiches, sir. Sixty cents. Sixty? Here you are. Thanks. Thanks. Hope your friend gets better. Yeah. Whew. Yeah, come on. How did I do, Lieutenant? Well, one thing is sure. He thought you were too stupid to recognize him. Can you still see him, Rick? Yeah. Yeah, he crossed the street and he's starting to walk west. I'll tell him. He knows you. Good. When you spot the place, call me here. Think I should throw a net around the neighborhood? Not till we spot the hideout. Right. Hey, Diamond. They got your girl. How are you going to get her out? They probably use her for a shield. That's a good point, Sergeant. Believe me, I've been thinking about it. Here's the sandwiches. Swell. Hey, hmm. you only got two. Oh, there was a cop in the delicatessen. A cop? Yeah, big stupid one. Listen, I, I told him I'm getting food for a sick friend, see? And he starts giving me all kinds you of remedies. you sure remi- you weren't tailed? Tailed? No, who tailed me? The cop stayed in the delicatessen. Okay. Yeah, honey, have a sandwich. I'm not hungry. Oh, suit yourself. Here, Bobby. Oh, thanks. Hey, when are you going to put in that call to this dame's butler? Right after we eat. Then we go to the park and wait for Mr. Diamond. Yeah? I'm in a drugstore across from the building that Wells went in. It's about a block away. Nifty drug. Block west on your side of the street. I'll wait inside. We'll be right down. Come on, Otis. The lieutenant hasn't spotted. Okay. Thanks for the bagel, Whiteberg. That's all right, officer. Come back again when you can pay for it. Come on, Otis. Move your big feet. Okay, okay. Hey, you got any brilliant ideas how we're going to get Helen out of there in one piece? No, I got to admit I'm stuck. Why don't you get that bear trap mind of yours working and make yourself a hero? Uh, Well, maybe we could start a fire in the building. It'd have to come out. Oh, swell, swell. There's nothing I'd like better than a well-done girlfriend. Well, I was trying. Yeah. Hey. Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? Otis, remind me to kiss you on both cheeks. Hey, 
What are you doing? That's a firebox. I'm turning in an alarm. There. Oh, we're going to start that fire? No, but Walsh and Wells won't know there isn't one. When the trucks come and the firemen bust in the place, they'll think it's burning down around their ears. Yeah, maybe then they won't watch Helen too close, huh? Yeah, that's the idea. Well, here's the nifty drugstore. Yeah. Rick, I've been worrying about something. Yeah, I know. How do we get Helen out? Yeah. Well, relax. Otis came up with a solution. Otis? Yeah, I turned in a fire alarm. Now, when the trucks get here, you can tell them what's up and they can go in the building and make like it was on fire. Well, won't Walsh know it's a phony if he can't smell smoke? The chief can tell him it's blazing in the basement. When they hit the street, we can get enough firemen to shield Helen and then take Walsh and Weld. I'll call a precinct and have the blocks around it. We'll need lights if they make a break for it. Uh, which apartment house are they in? That one, across the street. After I call the boys, we better go over and find out which room they're in. Quietly clear the rooms on both sides in case the shooting starts before we expect it. <laughs> I like to upset my stomach. How about that call? Yeah, right. Well, what's your phone number, baby? It's in the book. Oh. She gonna be troubled, Bobby? <coughs> he wants your number. Now, come on. We ain't got all night. All right. Evergreen 54308. Oh, that's better. You ought to be more careful, Bobby. Your lip's bleeding. Yeah. Hey, Walsh. What's that? Sirens. Maybe that's the cops. If somebody tailed you, you... I told you I wasn't tailed. All right, I'll go see. That's fire trucks. They're coming down a block. I don't smell no smoke. Hey, they're pulling up in front of this building. The joint must be on fire. Let's get out of here. Uh, maybe it's the building next to us. No, they're bringing the hoses right in front of the door of this joint. I'm getting out. Sit still. Maybe it ain't a big one. We can't go busting out in the street. Well, maybe it ain't a big one. But if it is, I don't want to end up like a pound of spare ribs. <laughs> Why, you... Yeah. All right, now, come on. Hey, what's that? Yeah, what is it? Fire department, we're back here from the building. What are we going to do with the dame? Shove her in that closet. Just a minute, we'll be right with you. Hurry, Tom, there's a fire in the basement. It's nearing a gas man. The whole place may go up any second. Did you hear that? Yeah, step on Okay. Hey, better step on it. Down these stairs. We can find our way. Hey, there's a couple of prowl cars. Yeah. Separate. We'll meet at the other place. Okay, Walsh. That's far enough. Ah. It's the shamus. Get him, Walsh. Don't reach for it, Walsh. I owe you something, Diamond. You all right, Rick? Yeah, Walsh. He's a worse shot than his brother. Where's Wells? He made a break for it, but he won't get through. All right, Wells. You can't get through. Drop your gun. You won't take me, copper! Well, that's that. What about Walsh? Uh, he's pretty dead. Come on, I want to find out what happened to Helen. Well, Walt and I went up to the room and found Helen in the closet. We took her downstairs and she cried a little on my shoulder. I like that. Makes me feel so protective. Walt cleaned things up and dropped Helen and me off at her place. An hour later, Helen got back to normal and we relaxed on the couch and forgot about Wells and Walsh. <sighs> How do you feel now, baby? Daddy. Want to get Francis to fix some dinner for you? Oh, no, I'm not very hungry. You can have some if you want. Mm, no, no. Want to play some canasta or something? But you always said it was a bad 200 game. Yeah, it is. Well, I forgot my jack. <laughs> Silly. Want a neck? Ooh, what you said. Come here. No. Helen. No, I'm mad. Mad? What for? Because those two thugs ruined a wonderful evening. What's the matter? Want me to go? Oh, you idiot, of course not. But I had a big surprise planned. You did? Yes. Believe it or not, I had two wonderful seats for South Pacific, and now it's too late to go. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Oh, well, I'm sorry, baby. I'd love to have seen it. Me, too. Well, I'm not exactly it's your pinza, but I'll try to make it up to you. Oh, Rick, that's a wonderful idea. Well, what'll it be? Uh, some enchanted evening. Oh, really? Me, 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 me. Hmm. A some enchanted evening. You may see a stranger. You may see a stranger 
Across a crowded room. Rick. What's the matter? I was just trying to make like pizza. But, honey, it's safer for you to make like diamond. Oh. And somehow you know. You know even then. That somewhere you'll see her again and again. Oh, you're not Pinza, but it's wonderful. Thanks. Some enchanted evening, someone may be laughing. You may hear her laughing across a crowded room. And night after night, as strange as it seems, the sound of her laughter will sing in your dream. Rick. Who can explain it? Who can tell you why? Ricky. Fools give you answers. Wise men never try. Oh, Oh, honey, what's the matter? I was just falling in love with myself. Come here. You never let me finish. Do you mind? Oh, well, no. And I'm sure Mr. Pinza doesn't either. have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Paul Fries, and Larry Dobkin. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. Now this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This program has come to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. As Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there. This is Diamond. Hey, what about this heat? I can think of a lot of times I've been uncomfortable, but this runs itself right up to the top of my list. But the only thing good I can say about it, get your laundry dry in a hurry. I usually wash a few things out in my office because the soap's free. Come to think of it, I was scrubbing a pile of things the day we had that big wind. 97 degrees in New York and we get a tornado to cool us off. I had so much dust in my office, I could have supplied mud pies to the whole neighborhood. And after it was all over, the cigarette ad on Broadway was blowing smoke rings through the trap door of one of my scattered longies. The waves in Long Island Sound were so rough a friend of mine capsized, and when he came up, he found three terrified herring hiding in his nose. Oh, it was swell. One minute it was so hot you couldn't move, and the next, a 58-mile-an-hour wind was doing the moving for you. Then to top it off, I got mixed up in one of the grisliest cases I'd ever worked on. It all started one evening. The car was moving down a lonely road, two people in it. In a couple of minutes, one of them would be pretty dead. What are you stopping for? <laughs> what are you doing? Let me go. Get your hands off me. No, help. Please, please. Ah! Uh, 
Hey, Ed. Huh? Stop the car a second. What for? I thought I saw something lying back there on the road. So what? Probably a dead dog. No, no, no. Hold it. Too big to be a dog. Oh, for Pete's sake. Back it up about 20 yards. <sighs> that, 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 that's good. Okay, where is it? Right over there. Yeah. Hey, come on. Hey. Holy cow. Yeah. She dead? She's wrecked. I think I'm going to be sick. Me too. Uh, uh, let's get to a phone call of cops. Knit one, pearl one. Hmm. Knit one, pearl one. Ah, there, you little fiend. Now, what does it say about the heel? Mm-hmm. Turn the heel. Hmm. Oh, I dropped a stitch. Now I gotta go back and pick it up again. Yeah? Rick, what's the matter? Oh, Miss Asher? You and your bright ideas. What did I do? You did plenty. I'm a nervous wreck. What from? You remember you said I ought to take up something to keep me busy in the office? Yes. You remember you mentioned knitting? Oh, no. Oh, yes. I've dropped more stitches than the cross-eyed surgeon. You idiot. I was only fooling. Well, I wasn't. I did it up right. Book of directions, enough yarn to wrap up King Tut and all, all his handmaidens, <laughs> and two of the finest bone needles and gimbals. <laughs> now, don't laugh. I was making Francis a pair of screaming argyles. Well, keep with it, strong heart. You went out. Yeah, you darn right. Oh, what I said. Darn. Get it? Helen, are you still there? Yes, Rick. Wasn't funny? No, Rick. Okay, come on over. Let's neck. Yes, Rick. Shame on you. Yes, Rick. Is that all you can say? I love you. And I'll see you about eight. Oh. You don't sound very happy. Well, that's such a long way off. I'll give you time to make plans. Bye. Bye. Now, let's see. I got to take out one, two, three, five rows. Yeah, what is it? Rick? Oh, oh, how are you, Walt? Very unhappy. Well, you should see me. I got to take out five whole rows just to pick up one lousy stitch. What? No, oh, forget it. What are you unhappy about? I'll tell you about it when you get down here. The 5th Precinct's 20 blocks. Can't you give it to me over the pipe? I wouldn't ask you if it wasn't important. And I'd rather not say anything over the phone. Okay, okay. Stop making like Porsche face in life. I'll be down as soon as I finish this heel. Heel? Yes. If you must know, I've taken up knitting. Coming from you, I am unmoved. I don't care if you're building Sergeant Otis a fur-lined money belt. Get down here as fast as you can. All right, Walt. But you'll be sorry when it starts getting cold again, and I won't knit you a sweater to cover your little old blue stomach. Oh. Bye, Walt. Getting Walt's goat was a sport with me, and whether he'd admit it or not, he got a kick out of it, too. Sometimes I wouldn't stay on the rib as long as I usually do, but that was only because Walt always starts sounding just a little bit worried. Then I know it's time to lay off and get serious. Don't misunderstand me. I never lay off entirely, and I never get completely serious. Those are two habits that don't help find the solution any quicker. They just fit you with a mess of ulcers, and you still end up too worried and too serious. I closed my office and headed for Walt's precinct. When I walked in, I spotted Sergeant Otis leaning back in his chair with his number 12s resting on the desk. Hello, Otis. Well, how's the big private detective today? Just fine, Otis. And how is the flash of the 5th Precinct? Yeah, don't you worry about me, Diamond. I'll get along. Better go on in and see the lieutenant. He wants to see you. <laughs> hey, what's it about, Diamond? You need someone to help you from the police force? You know, Sergeant, you've got a fine head on your shoulders. <laughs> well, I'm glad you noticed. The one under your arm isn't so bad either. Uh... Hello, Walt. Rick, why don't you leave that poor guy alone? After you leave, he comes running in here and cries all over my desk. Otis? Ah, he wouldn't shed a tear if he was standing in an onion warehouse watching his grandmother set fire to herself. Yeah, well, give him a rest for a while. I got a big problem I want to talk to you about. All right, Walt. What's on your mind? Well, I don't know quite how to give it to you. It isn't strictly kosher for the police force to go around asking for help. Now, wait a minute. I don't want any apology routine. If you want a favor, you came to the right boy, and you know that goes without saying. Yeah, I guess I do. But this is a pretty big favor, Rick. The, uh, 
commissioners on my back. So is everyone else that's got anything to do with this city's government. Sounds rough. What did they do? Find out you were hiding a chimpanzee in a cop's uniform and calling him Sergeant Otis? Oh, now be serious for a second, Rex. Sure, if you'll get to the point. All right. I guess you've been reading about these homicides you've been having for the past three weeks. Yeah, pretty messy. Well, the powers that be say, solve them or turn in my badge. Oh, well, now wait a minute. Don't they know that this is the toughest kind of a killing? The killer's obviously got a lot of screws loose, and a maniac doesn't need a motive to kill. Don't those swivel chair bigwigs know that a crime without motive is the toughest job in the world to crack? Sure, sure, they know all that, but the public and the press is yelling its head off, so the pressure is on. Well, what do you want me for? You've got one of the best departments in the state. When you were on the force, it was the best department in the state. Now you stop that. Then stop twisting my arm. What do you want? I want help. I've got to crack this case by next week or I'm out of my ear. You're the best detective we had on the force, and you're the best private gumshoe in the city. Oh, no, that's better. Now, what about these killings? Now, each time they find some dame looking like the last of a hamburger sale... It... Oh, excuse me a minute, Rick. Yeah? Lieutenant? No, Jack the Ripper. What do you want, Mallet Head? Uh, we just got a report from a guy out in the river road. Another one of them butcher killings. What? Yeah, some dame all hacked up and lying beside the road. Okay, get the car out. I'll meet you downstairs. Oh, did you hear that, Rick? Mm-hmm. Well, come on. You want me along? Of course. I can brief you about the whole setup on the way over. Oh, I don't know whether it's such a good idea to get mixed up in this. Why not? Well, it looks like whoever gets close to this killer doesn't have much of a future. Well, you can't live forever. Oh, aren't you the sweet one? No, that's not what's worrying me. Well, what is then? When I go out, I want a nice, comfortable place to lie down in. The way this nut goes to work with a knife, I might end up in a freezer. <laughs> All right, all right, everybody's back. Go on through, Lieutenant. Show him your biceps, Otis. Ah, uh, How did all these people get out here? This is ten miles from anything. Uh, someone must have heard me call the police. Uh, when I left the phone booth, the whole crowd followed me out here. Who are you? Uh, my name's Ed Cody. Me and my friend here found the body. Where is it? Right over here, Walt. Well, how does it look? The way you thought it would. Oh, Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant. Yeah, here's your bicarb. Now you see what I'm up against, Rick. Pardon me. This is the third killing like this in three weeks. Oh, I don't feel too good. Let's walk over this way. Yeah. Cody, you and your friend come along. We want to ask some questions. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, whoever the guy is that's pulling these murders is a complete lunatic. Are they all like that, Walt? You should have seen the last one. How'd, uh, how'd you guys happen to spot the body? Oh, well, I saw it first, and I told Ed here. Yeah, yeah. We were just driving along, and Max spotted something lying beside the road. I backed her up, and we got out. I saw what it was. I left Mac here and went back to town to call you. What's your full name, Mac? McCarthy. John McCarthy. Okay. Now, what are you doing, Rick? Uh, looking at the road. Hey, uh, that your car up there, Cody? It's Max. I was just driving. You went ahead how far? Oh, I'd say about 20 yards. Then we backed up and left the car where you see it now. You won't find much even if the road is soft. Their car and any other car would have blocked out the killer's tracks. Uh, maybe he didn't use a car. Maybe he walked her out this way and then killed it. No, this place is 10 miles from anything. He drove, all right. And this crowd has ruined any footprints for sure. Oh, here come the boys. Come on, Rick. As soon as they start examining things, we can get back to the station. Yeah. I want to go through the whole file on the last two killings. You won't find much. Well, a change of reading never hurts anyone. I'm getting tired of reading those dime novels. Too bloody. Well, that's the whole mess. No leads at all, huh? Not a one. I'm getting nearsighted from looking at all the lineup. We've picked up everything from drunks to safe crackers. Not a lead. Same type of crime in every case. Hmm. This killer's got a crazy streak as wide as Broadway. Oh, wait until the commissioner hears about this one. Well, yeah? Give me a pencil. Now, tic-tac-toe is out. I got a headache. Stop waving your gills and give me a pencil. Now, here. What are you doing with that map? Drawing circles. Now, you stop that. That's a scale of this city, and I don't want it loused up by your doodling. Look at that. So you make a dandy circle. Thanks. 
What's it for? How should I know? You drew it. Drew what? The circle. Wasn't that a little foolish? Of course it was. That's what I'm yelling about. Well, that's bad for you. What is? Yelling. I know it. I thought you said you didn't know. Know what? About the circle I just drew. What circle? The one on the map. That's what I was yelling about. Why? You didn't draw it. I know I didn't. You did. What for? How should I know? You're a policeman. What in blazes has that got to do with it? You were a rookie, weren't you? Of course I was. You worked your way up to sergeant and then to head of the homicide, didn't you? You know very good and well I did. Wasn't it a little tough? You bet it was. I pounded the beat for four long years. Did it by the sweat of my... Br- now, wait a minute. How did we get into this? You asked me about this circle I drew. I did? Yes, Walt. But you didn't know what it was for. Oh, yeah. What is it for? It's for you. I get... Yeah, it's not bad. Oh, I knew it. I knew it. You low life, you conniving, dirty, underhanded louse. You always do this to me. I think you sit around nights and pull the wings off of flies. Moths. All right, moths. Sit around and dream up little monstrosities to pull on the police force and use me as a... a, a, a guinea pig. A, right, guinea pig. You call me, Lieutenant? No, get out of here, you idiot. Yeah, Lieutenant. Diamond, for once I'm going to find out what's at the end of this merry-go-round. I want to know about that circle. And I'm going to get it out of you if I have to shove that map down your throat. Huh? This happens to be the commissioner, Oh, uh, not you, Commissioner. Are you on the time, Yes, Commissioner. I'm the commissioner of this Yes, Commissioner. Well, I just went out and looked at the body. Yes, but, 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 your motor's running. You shut up. Oh, no, Commissioner, somebody else. Well, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, who was it? I am not talking to you. Don't you want to know about the circle? No. Fine. When I was looking over the reports on the killings, I noticed something. You don't say. Say what? Mm-hmm. Okay, if you don't want to play, be a sorehead all your life. Well, I noticed that all of the killings, including the one we looked at this afternoon, were within at least ten miles of each other. And the first one, this one, this one right here, was exactly in the other direction from the last one. Bully for you. No, it's nothing. Well, using the first and last homicide for the edge of the circle, we find that the other killing also fall within the sphere. Okay, so what? Mm -hmm. Getting interested? No, I'm not. Well, the girl this afternoon had been dead for about 14 hours, wouldn't you say? Yeah, but the coroner can come closer. Well, about anyway. Now, in the other two cases, it says that both girls met their deaths about 3 in the morning. Now, if the last one was dead 14 hours, she comes close to that time, too. Okay, okay, what does that prove? Not a thing, but it's something to go on. This is a wild one, Walt. But... Let's say that our killer started off with his victim somewhere within that circle. To drive five miles, half the distance of the circle, it would take him, oh, about... uh, Fifteen minutes. Okay, fifteen minutes. Now, that means he left his starting point around 2.45. Now, that's a funny hour to be so consistent. You're right. Bars close at two. Forty-five minutes to talk a dame into a ride. Hmm? Might be. I'll be done. I may be all wet. The killer probably started from somewhere outside the circle, but we can start by eliminating the idea of the night spots anyway. Yeah, Lieutenant? Check on all the night spots from... uh, 45th Street and Broadway, the center of the circle. From 45th Street and Broadway for 10 miles in every direction. Yeah, Lieutenant. That means cafes, bars, bowling alleys, anything that stays open until 2 or after, and step on it. I hope we're right. So do I. I don't like walking on eggs. Then sit down. Who knows? You might hatch something. Walt found out the name of the last victim, and the family supplied us with a picture. Her name was Martha Kirk, and her family knew nothing of her whereabouts the night of the murder. You can't really appreciate a police department until you really see them in action. Inside of two hours, Walt had every dive, bar, and night spot in the ten-mile circle tagged. They spread out, one man to every five blocks, each with a picture of the three murdered girls. Because it had been my idea, Walt wanted me to swim with it and maybe sink. I took a little section from 48th Street to 46th Street, and by late afternoon, I'd covered most of the likely prospects. You guessed it. The bottom of the barrel was coming up fast, and it was emptier than a ballpark during a thunderstorm. No one had ever seen the three victims. The last spot on the list was a bowling alley. I walked in and spotted a cocktail lounge. When I climbed up on one of the stools, a bartender with a head that should have been out on the alleys walked up to me. Yeah, what'll it be? Uh, how about a glass of milk? Glass of milk? Think you can stand it? Well, if you're worried, water it a little. I don't want to pass out on you. Uh, get him, he made it funny. So did your family. 
You looking for trouble? Only if I get pushed. I'm looking for information. Place door on the left. Yeah. Ever seen any of these girls before? What are you, cop? Well, let's say I'm nosy and that I've got a badge to keep me in the spirit of the thing. Oh, why'd you say so? Uh, uh, let me see him. All right. Here's the first one. No, no, no. I ain't never seen her. How about this one? Uh-uh. And this one? Nope. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Eh, sure, I know this one. Comes in here about twice a week. Was in last night. Gets lushed up, cries about how tough a family is on her knees. Uh, uh, Kirk? Yeah. Uh, Martha. Uh, Martha Kirk. Nice looker. She was. Huh? Uh, did she ever come in with a man? No, but uh, sometimes she leaves with one. Same guy every time? No. Do you remember her leaving with a man last night? Uh, yeah, yeah. Come to think of it, she did. What time? No, oh, about 2.15. Uh, we stopped serving the two right on the dot. That we do. That you do, yeah. Okay. Think you'd know the guy if you saw him again? Oh, sure. He comes in a couple times a week, too. Uh, I seen him pick up a couple of strays. <laughs> I guess you call him a wolf. Yeah, <laughs> with a hatchet. Huh? No, forget it. Where's your phone? Uh, right over there. Hey, here, use a slug. It's on the house, officer. Thanks. Hope nothing's happened to Martha. She was a rotten drunk. What a wonderful kid. She was, huh? Give precinct, Sergeant Otis. Otis, let me speak to the lieutenant, and if you crack just once, I'll come over there and shove your head so far down you'll have to untie your shoelaces to cough. Okay, okay, Diamond. You don't have to get nasty. Lieutenant Levinson. You can forget about retiring, Walt. You got something? Yeah, looks like. What did your boys turn up? Nothing yet. What is it, Rick? Don't play games now. Get over to 47th and 9th, the bowling alley in the middle of the block. I'm in the bar. Want me to bring the boys? No, no. This is one we've got to play quietly. I don't want to scare our ghoul off. I'll be right down. Hey, what about that milk? Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, coming up. Uh, hey, uh, is there going to be a pinch? Uh, there is, Buster. There certainly is. Walt romped in about a half hour later and he talked to the bartender. He finally looked satisfied. He had to because it was the only lead that had turned up. We told the bartender to tip us if the guy showed again and we sat down to wait. Maybe my rabbit's foot started thinking it was back with the quartet because around 1 a.m. it started kicking. The bartender gave us a nod just as a big guy wandered in and sat down at the bar. He weighed in at about 2.20 and his clothes were sloppy. He ordered a drink and started eyeing a cute little number sitting at the other end of the bar. Let's take him. Hold it, Walt. He's making a pitch. What? The dame at the end of the bar. So he's making a pitch. What do you want to do? Wait around till he takes her out of here? Maybe you'd like to help him sharpen his axe. Look, you haul him in now, you'll have to beat it out of him. You want him to pick the dame up? Well, is that against the law? Arrest me. Now, you stop clowning. You'd rather catch him with the goods, wouldn't you? Yeah, but... Now, don't start that again. You butted the commissioner to death. Just relax, and maybe you can pick up a few pointers. Our big boy moved all right. Right up to the seat next to the cute little girl. She was under full sail, didn't seem to mind it at all. He landed at 1.15. At 1.30, he'd established a firm beachhead, and by 2 o'clock, there was a flag raising. Okay, he scored. Now, joint's closing. Now, they're leaving. I'm going to tail him. How? He's probably got a car. And if he gets away with that girl, he may kill her. Look, Walt, I promise you, he won't get into that car unless I go, too. Now, come on. We'll both stick close to him until I can think of something. We followed the man and the girl outside and walked a few yards behind, making like we had a little load on they headed for a big parking lot, and that's when I got the idea. The parking attendant yeah. was just walking up to him when I stumbled forward. Hey, boy. Rick, what are you doing? Stay with me, Walt. Yeah? Uh, son, I, I want my car. Hey, just a minute. I was here first. Sure, honey. Don't let him get away with uh, it. Look, old man, my, my friend here is late getting home. He's got a wife that's ten feet tall. You mind if I get my car first? <laughs> ah, go ahead. Some nerve. Relax, honey. You're going to take a little drive, huh? Yeah. Okay, let's see your ticket. Well, uh, we'll go here someplace. Well, come on, we'll walk up. I know where the car is. Okay, but you got to have a ticket. Rick, what's going on? Keep walking. Hey, I thought you was loaded. Keep going. We're the police. Huh? That's right. Oh, what's wrong? Which one is that guy's car? You mean the guy back there with the dame? Yeah. 
Uh, he gave me his ticket. Uh, right over there, the coop. Rick, come on. I'm going to climb in that trunk, and you're going to put in a general alarm, Walt. Then you're going to get in your car and tail us. But stay far enough behind so that he doesn't spot something. Okay, but I think you're crazy. Is the trunk open? Yeah. Now get going. Well, they'll see me coming back. Tell them you forgot something in the bowling alley and that I passed out my car. All right. Uh, and son. Yeah? Don't let on that anything had happened. We think that man is a killer. Oh. I squeezed into the trunk and waited. About two minutes later, the lovebird showed up and got in the front seat. We roared like that for about 15 minutes, and it wasn't bad until we hit the dirt road. Then my inside started bouncing around like a pound of rice in a wind tunnel. We drove for about 10 minutes more and came to a stop. I raised the trunk just enough, just enough to get some fresh air and listen. I didn't want to climb out because they'd feel the movement up in front. I was sure they could hear my breathing. What are we stopping for? Well, I, uh... Uh-uh. <laughs> I, uh, just wanted to look at the pretty scenery. How can you? Too dark. <laughs> I can see you, baby. <laughs> You're nice. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh... Thank you. They went on like that for another half hour, and I started thinking I'd picked the wrong guy. Then the conversation changed. What's the matter? That's so funny. Don't you know? No, and I don't like the way you're acting. Women. That's what's funny. They're all the same. Huh? Just like my wife. She was like all the other women. Hey, let's get out of here. You're talking funny. Funny? Yeah. See a man and you like him. Any man. You're all alike. Now you stop that. I just came along Come because... here. No, you let me go. You ain't no different. Come here. No, stop that. Let me get out of the car. Sure. Go ahead, go ahead. I don't want no blood stains on the seat anymore. Run. Go on, run. It right down the middle. I rolled out and didn't forget to take my 38 around. I spotted him in the moonlight, moving after like a big animal. He was laughing. I could see something in his hand. It was a knife. She tripped and fell, and he moved in. He gave me goosebumps bigger than grapefruit. When he was nearly on top of her, I closed in. Okay, hold it! You shut up! Drop the knife! I'll kill him! I'll kill her like the You all right, honey? No, no, no. Just take it easy. Take it easy. It's all over. I'm so glad you got here. Come on, now. Let's, let's get back to the car. Easy. You sure you're all right, dear? You know something? No, what? I think that man was crazy. <laughs> Well, Walt finally got there, and we sent the girl home. The wagon came and cleaned up things. I found out later that Walt was blessed by the commissioner, and I got an assist. I needed calming down, so I stopped off at 975 Park Avenue, the home of the best remedy for bruised nerves I knew of. Oh, good evening, sir. Good evening, Francis. Is Miss Asher in? Yes, sir. She's in the study, knitting. Knitting? Knitting. Thank you, Francis. Knit one, curl two. Knit one, curl two. That's like taking stupid pills. Rick. Hello, baby. Oh, look what I've gotten into. I'm a nervous wreck. Oh, that'll teach you. What are you building? Well, it was going to be a surprise for you. Oh, a whole suit. <laughs> oh, silly. Ricky. Yes? 
I need relaxing. You need relaxing? Oh, swell. Ricky, come here. I know just a thing. No, come over here. There's an old spinning wheel in the parlor. A spinning dreams of a long, long ago. Ricky! What's the matter, dear? Uh, what about this? Cruising down the river on a Sunday afternoon. Ricky. With one you love, the sun above, waiting for the moon. Ricky. The old accordion playing. Ricky. A sentimental tune. Rick! Oh, honey, what's the matter? You can sing later. Oh. Please. What is it, really, baby? Come here. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know something? What? I may never sing again. Okay. <laughs> You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Bill Conrad, Lorene Tuttle, Jack Crucian, and Sidney Miller. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. Dick Powell will next be seen in the motion picture Mrs. Mike, based on the best-selling novel Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there, this is Diamond. About the most strenuous effort I might give out during a working year is maybe chasing some thug up the escalator at Bloomingdale's department store. But last week, I really outdid myself. The all-stars of the police force challenged the private detectives to a baseball game for the benefit of the vice squad. And I wound up stiffer than a pair of starched overalls. Because the private detectives are quick to take advantage of the slightest opportunity, by the eighth inning, we realized the need for some immediate strategy. The score at that point was six to four, the cops leading. So I got a hold of a little blonde I knew and had her walk across the infield in a sweater. The idea was to disturb the opposing team and take their minds off the game. It would have worked, but it seemed that since I had last seen my little blonde friend, she'd become quite a favorite with the police force, so they just waved hello and went about their business. My drooling colleagues, however, had not come in contact with said hunk of fluff, and before the game was over, three of them had picked up the bat boy and tried to bunt with him. You may have read where the police force finally beat us, Close game, 37 to 4. But I want to say right here and now, they never could have done it without that sweater. And oh, yeah, I got mixed up on a little honest murder the next day. It all started in the back booth of a middle-class nightclub. A couple of people were busy trying to think up the fastest way to make a homicide billiard. Oh, uh, that's the three-cushion variety. Chilling to frame up to the electric chair. Leon, are you sure this will work? You want to get rid of that old man of yours, don't you? You know I do. Well, I got a wife that I want to dump, too. This letter from her is going to fix it so we both end up very unmarried. Are you sure they'll blame it on Martin? Sure, I'm sure. When they find him with this letter and his own gun and the dead body of my dear little wife, they'll slap him in the chair so fast he won't know what happened. Who's going to find him with the body? That's your job, baby. I'll get the letter to your husband and you swipe his gun and get it to me. 
Then you go get yourself a private detective and tell the shamus that you suspect your husband of running around with another girl. You and the shamus tail your husband. I'll have a time so you catch him with the goods right after the killing. Well, all right. I hope it works. It will if you want it to, baby. I want it to. Because I want you. Yeah. Yeah, and all that nice money your husband's going to leave you. Leon. Come in, June. Yeah. Come in. Mr. Diamond? That's right. I want to hire a private detective. Well, good for you. Sit down. Thank you. What is your fee? Hmm? What's the matter? Oh, stand up and sit down again. They're 52 gauge, Mr. Diamond. Like them? Oh, you'd look good if they were sweat socks. I don't think they'd go with a high heel. Uh, you've got a point. Now, uh, <clears throat> what were you saying? I wanted to know what your fee is. Oh, uh, 100 a day in expenses. Uh, isn't that a little high? I stopped eating at the automat six years ago. All right, I'll give you a retainer. Oh, uh, wait a minute now. Wait a minute. What's the job? I think my husband is running around with another woman. Uh, what do you want me to do? Hustle him off to the nut house? Oh, aren't you nice? I want you to go with me as a witness. You know, uh, any other time I might get shy, but I'm really interested in seeing a girl who could beat your time. Hmm. When do I start? Meet me in front of my house at 10 minutes to 8. My husband leaves around 8. What's the address? 521 East 58th Street. My name is Hires, Mr. Diamond. Uh, June Hires. All right, June. I'll see you at 10 to 8. Now, uh, uh, excuse me, but about that retainer. Oh, yes, that. Um, here's $100. Is that enough? Uh, it'll keep me interested. What's your husband's name? Martin. I'll see you this evening, Mr. Diamond. Oh, uh, one more question. Yes, why haven't you and your husband been getting along? Uh -huh. A lot of reasons. By the way, Mr. Diamond, how old are you? Hmm? No, oh, well, I'm frisky, but I passed the foolish mark when I was three and a half. Mm -hmm. Did you? Goodbye, Mr. Diamond. I wonder if I did. Diamond Detective Agency, with men who know the corpses best, it's Diamond, two to one. Rick. Oh, oh, Helen. Hello, baby. What are you doing? Uh, what gauge nylons do you wear, dear? Fifty-two. Why? Oh, nothing. Oh, Rick, are you going to buy me a present? Oh, you never can tell. I was just looking at a pair a few minutes ago. Rick. Yeah? Where were you looking at them? Now, uh, what kind of a question is that? A very good question. Have you got a girl up in that office? Helen. Don't you, Helen, me, have you? Well, I give you my word, I haven't. All right. Was there a girl in your office? The, the... Was there? Well, a client... I got a hundred dollar retainer. I don't I... care if she gave you the George Washington Bridge. You were obviously looking at her leg. Well, I couldn't help it. She sat on that way. Now, look, honey, she's just another client. Mm-hmm, with 52-gauge nylons. Would you do count the threads? Oh, can you do that? Oh, you wolf. Yeah, but you're the only one who gets the benefit of my talents. You can put the soft soap away. How am I going to see you? Well, I got some business at eight. I'll, I'll be over later. Well, I'm going to stay mad until you get here. And you're going to tell me all about those nylons. I'll be sure and do some research. Bye. Well, there you are. You sit around and wait for a meal ticket to come in, and just because it happens to be fitted with curves, your best girl digs up the green-eyed monster. I don't know why gals get sore at a guy just because they catch him panting a little. <laughs> After all, it's hot in New York. I spent the rest of the afternoon trying to hit a big horse fly with a rubber band and some paper clips. And by six o'clock, we shook hands and called it a draw. I closed the office and went home. I got into some clean clothes and grabbed a bite to eat at the corner drugstore. At ten minutes to eight, I was sitting in June Hire's car, parked across the street from her front door. Mr. Diamond, how did you ever get to be a private detective? Uh, Mrs. Hire, how did you ever get to be a housewife? You think things up in a hurry, don't you? Only when I got competition. You like competition? Uh, yeah, up to a point. After that, I get tired of the struggle. <laughs> I feel like I was back in college, sitting in a parked car with a good-looking man. Your education must have been pretty tame. I haven't moved once. Well, I really started to study after I graduated. Oh, I bet you got straight A's. 
Must you top everything? I play around with a lot of trouble, Mrs. Hyen. I've got to stay one step ahead of it. Do I look like trouble? When's your husband coming out of that house? Any minute now. You didn't answer my question. I'll tell you as soon as I see your husband. Well, how will that tell you? If he's wearing a beanie with a propeller on it, I'll know you've been giving him a lot of trouble. So I've been giving him trouble. Does that mean I'll do the same for somebody else? Well, what's the difference, a husband or a private detective? They both got their names from a guy named Adam. Oh, look. A cab pulled up to the front door. Yeah, I see it. And here comes Martin. Mm, he's getting into the cab. Well, what do you know? What's the matter? No beanie. We both sat and watched while Martin Hire got into the cab and it pulled away. Mrs. Hire put her car in gear and we started the tale, giving her the safe distance. He led us across town to a middle-class apartment house and we stopped the car and waited up the street. He's getting out and going into that building. Come on. Oh, what for? Shouldn't we let him get up there first and, and then... Look, look, baby. Do you know who, who this gal is? No, no, of course not. Well, then come on. I want to see what door he goes in. But, well, won't he see us? Honey, I don't tell you how to put your lipstick on. Now, don't tell me how to make like a bloodhound. Well, the, the lobby is empty. Well, watch the elevator. Oh. It's stopping on the fourth floor. Hadn't we better go up? Look, uh, look, lover. The fourth floor probably comes equipped with a lot of doors. Now, if you want to just knock on any of them, go hire yourself Humphrey Bogart. Well, then what do we do? You stand by and watch like you... Uh, make like you knew what I was doing. See, the little old elevator's coming back down. Now, you just hold it there while I look at the mailboxes. Oh, Mrs. B. Callahan. Mrs. Lillian McEdward. Mrs. Mike. Well... And Miss Sally Maxwell. Okay, now we push the button for the fourth floor and away we go. Fun? Um, how do you know where to go? I got the name off the mailbox. But you said yourself there must be a lot of people on the fourth floor. Elementary, my dear girl, process of elimination. We're lucky this time. Only one single girl on the fourth floor, Sally Maxwell. Come on, it's 406. What if there'd been more than one single girl? So I make some new friends. Now stop asking questions and stick close. Mm, I'd love it. Now, here it is, 406. Now hold it down. Can you hear anything? No. Yeah, somebody's moving around. Oh? Uh oh, duck. What? Too late. What? June. Uh, good evening. I represent the Great Nothing Life Insurance Company. What are you doing here, June? I might ask you the same thing. Do you mind if we come in? I'd like to interest you in our indemnity clause. Stop pushing. Get out of my way. Oh, you don't know what you're missing. You get $3 million if a python bites you in the middle of Times Square. You can't force your way in here like that. You... Oh, now you've hurt my feelings. Uh, take your hands off me or I'll strike you again. Sure, but you need two more to put you out. Here, have one on me. <laughs> Now, the next time you go striking people... Mr. Diamond, look. I looked past the little guy and spotted the body. She was blonde, and I didn't know why she was hanging onto the rug that way. She wasn't going anywhere. All right, you. Get out of my way. Huh? Oh, what a lovely gun. Martin, you killed that girl. No, I did not. I came in here and found her like that, but I didn't kill her. She had been shot. I know that. I found the gun by her body. You don't think I'd kill her? I was in love with her. Martin! Is that the gun that did it? Yes. I mean, no. I, oh, I don't know what I mean. But you stand right there. Don't take another step. That's your gun, Martin. Don't shut up. I didn't kill Sally. But I know I haven't got a chance of proving it, so if you come any closer, I will most certainly shoot you. I hate to look like an idiot, but it's against the law to shoot people. Mr. Diamond, be careful. Come on, Martin. Give me the gun. You don't think I'll shoot, do you? Come on, give it to me. Just one more step. Look out, he's going to shoot. Come on, open uh, up in there. What? Better drop it, Martin. You've got company. Stay back. Stay back. This is the police. Open up and we'll break the door in. Police. Uh, give me the gun, Martin. No, no. Let, yes. let him in, June. Before Levinson tears down the whole wall. I've got Martin. Yeah, yes, all right. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. What's going on in here? Uh, hello, Walt. Hey, Lieutenant, look. It's the gum shoe. Rick, why do you guys always have to break down doors? Why don't you try turning the knob first? Otis, didn't you see if it was unlocked? Uh, I forgot, Lieutenant. You mallet head. We got a report that someone heard a shot from this apartment. There's the body, Walt. Who's this guy? Uh, Martin Heyer. Here's his gun. He was going to use it on me. I didn't kill her. I came in and found her that way. Oh, shut up. Who's the girl with you, Diamond? Uh, this is Mrs. Heyer. 
Martin is her husband. You don't say. The old triangle, huh, Rick? I engaged Mr. Diamond to follow my husband. That's right, Walt. We caught Martin trying to sneak out on the corpse. I told you I didn't kill her. And I told you to shut up. Is this your gun? Uh, yes, but I found it lying by the body. I knew I'd be blamed if someone found my gun, so I put it in my pocket. You search him, Rick? Haven't had time. Shake him down, Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant. I want my lawyer, and you get away from me. You open your trap just once more. Okay, butthole. Please, still. Mr. Diamond, I'd like to get out of here. Sure. Okay, Walt? Yeah, but I want to talk to both of you down at the station later. Yeah, here's something, Lieutenant. What is it? Oh, a letter. Are you coming, Mr. Diamond? Uh, you go on down. I'll be right with you. Walt, what does the letter say? It says we can't continue this way. I've decided to break it off once and for all. It will do no good to see me, so please stay away and leave me alone. Sign Sally. Let me see that. Yeah. Well, what about it, you? Is the dead girl named Sally? Yes. I don't know why she sent it. We were both in love. Sure, sure. What are you going to do about your wife? I was going to tell her this evening. Then I received this note. I came right over to see Sally, but... Believe me, I didn't kill her. Tell me something, Martin. Is this the way you received the letter? Yes. Why? Now, you wait a minute, Rick. I'm very happy with what I've got, so don't start making like Sherlock Holmes. Oh, well, I, I guess you're right, Walt. He admits it's his gun, and this letter is certainly motive enough. Yeah. Otis, call for the wagon and put the cuffs on hire. Right, Lieutenant. Walt, why would someone send a letter after tearing off the top of it? Huh? See, the top of this letter is missing. The part that usually reads Dear Julius or something. So What? Do me a favor, will you, Walt? Oh, what is it? Give me three minutes and then have Otis fire a shot from this apartment. What? Is that all you can say? Have Otis fire a shot in about three minutes after I leave? I will not. The police department can't go around making like it was the 4th of July. You want to solve a murder, don't you? I have solved it. What more do I need? I got a suspect, the murder weapon, and a good motive. Uh, Walt, if you'd just killed someone and a guy caught you at it, what would you do? Ah, uh, Knock him off, too. Well, I caught hire in the act, and he didn't pull the trigger. Well, and you said yourself he was going to. But he didn't, and he took too much time thinking about it. Walt, I can't remember hearing a shot when I came in this building. So you didn't hear a shot. Maybe you couldn't. Well, that's what I want to find out. I was right behind Martin all the way up to this apartment, and I didn't hear a shot. Maybe he didn't kill her. That's right, I didn't. Please, I didn't kill her. You see, Walt? Oh, you always start something like this. Martin, did your girlfriend Sally have any enemies? No. At least she never told me about any. Now, where are you, brain trust? Just a little more sure of myself. First, Martin can't make up his mind about shooting me. Then he claims that the murdered girl didn't have any enemies. Does that sound like a killer trying to cover up? You've run into smart killers before. I'm surprised at you, Rick. I called the station, Lieutenant. I'm proud of you. Go on in the other room and shoot that cannon of yours off when I tell you. The what, Lieutenant? You heard me. Shoot it into a mattress, but don't muffle a shot. Uh, okay. But not till I tell you. Might think it's fun and blow up the whole building. Thanks, Walt. What are you doing? Oh, uh, just looking around this desk to see if I can find the top piece of this letter. Oh, uh, Martin, are you sure that your girlfriend didn't know anyone who might want to kill her? She never said she was in danger. But you might ask her husband. Her husband? Oh, swell. Why didn't you say something about her husband before this? You didn't ask. Oh. Who is her husband? His name's Leon Fisk. The gambler? Yes. Oh, Bye, Walt. Now, you wait a minute. Have orders start making like a Roman candle three minutes after I leave. What's that you've got in your hand? Huh? Well, it's a piece of stationery from the desk that matches the stationery this letter was written on. You can't take that letter. It's evidence. What is? That letter the murdered girl wrote to this guy. Well, how do you know she wrote it? Because this guy said so. Yes, but I'm not sure. It could be forged. See, Walt, maybe she didn't write it. Well, that's why I want it. The lab will be able to tell from other samples of her handwriting. Tell what, Walt? Who wrote that letter? Well, don't you know? Of course I don't know, but we found it on this guy, and it's police evidence. Why? Why? Well, because it just is, that's all. Well, anybody could have written it. You could have written it, Martin. Yes, I guess I could. And send it to yourself? Why would I send it to myself, Lieutenant? You wouldn't. That's why it's important. You mean the letter itself or the fact that he couldn't have sent it to himself? Both reasons. Well, if he couldn't have sent it to himself, that eliminates him as a suspect. It does? He didn't do it, did you, Martin? No. See, Walt? Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why do I always get into something like this? You asked me if I sent the letter to myself. You shut up. And you said he couldn't have. That's right, he couldn't. Then someone else did. Of course they did. Okay, then as long as you're not so sure it's important, I'm going to take it with me. Who says it's not important? Well, if he didn't send it to himself, then someone else did. And if someone else did, the murdered girl couldn't have, so anyone could have sent it. Isn't that right? 
Say that again. He said if I didn't send the letter to myself, then I couldn't have gotten it. No, no, no. He said you couldn't have sent the letter to... No, no, wait a minute. You couldn't have written it to... To to... myself. Yeah, so someone else wrote it and sent it to the murdered girl and... No, 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 no. Send it to me. You're crazy. I distinctly heard him say... Walt. Yeah? After you figure it out, be sure and have Otis fire that shot. I'm going to see Leon Fisk. Okay, okay. Now, let's start it again. If I didn't... If somebody didn't... If, if you didn't... If I didn't what? Lieutenant? Oh. <laughs> what is the matter, Lieutenant? He did it again. And you helped him. You rat, I'll see that you get the chair even if you didn't kill her. What did I do? You shut up. What took you so long? I had to get a merry-go-round started. Oh, um, can I drop you somewhere? Just relax for a second. I've got to think something out. Well, I, I didn't ever think Martin could kill anyone. Yeah. <gasps> what was that? Just, uh, just a backfire. Look, uh, drive me across town. I want to talk to a guy named Leon Fisk. Le- Leon Fisk? Yeah, runs a nightclub with an iron claw in the back room. Um, what's the address? Uh, 222 East 45th. I remember it because when I was on the force, I used to raid his place for exercise. Uh, thinking of doing some gambling? That's the way it'll probably end up. Let's go. She drove me across town, and ten minutes later, we pulled up in front of a low building with a flight of steps leading down to a basement door. A large sign over the door read, Cellar Club. I got out and thanked June for the lift and watched her drive off. I went down the steps and through the door. Something I can do for you? Yeah, I'd like to see Leon Fisk. Maybe you don't want to see you. What's the name? Just tell him Diamond. Okay. Uh, you got a phone booth? Yeah, right over there. Thanks. I found the phone booth and went in. In my business, you work with hunches, and sometimes they pay off. I knew that the torn letter had to be sent to someone the dead girl was going to slough. I didn't think it was higher, so the next best prospect was her husband, Leon Fisk. I didn't have a thing to pin on him, but a good bluff can open a lot of doors. I took out the letter and copied the handwriting on the other piece of stationery. I wrote the name Leon at the top, and then the words, We Can't Continue, so they'd correspond with the first part of the original. Yeah? What was your writing? What's it to you? You don't have to get sore. I just thought maybe you was getting a tip on the horses, and I sure could use a winner. The nags have been beating me to death. Oh, no tip. Okay, the boss will see you. That door right over there. Thanks. Well, Diamond, it's been a long time. I haven't missed you, Leon. What brings you here? Your wife was killed tonight. Sally? One's usually the lemon. Ah, that's too bad. How did it happen? I thought maybe you could tell me. I don't know anything about it. Hmm. Ever see this letter before? Hey. Uh, what's the matter? That's your wife's handwriting, isn't it? Yeah. It but... says, uh, Leon, we can't continue. Then the writing stopped. Well, so what? Well, the guy the police are holding got a letter from Sally, too. It started the same way, but it wasn't addressed to anyone. The top was torn off. You know what I think? No, tell me. I think she started one letter to you, then threw it away and wrote another one. I think you sent the second to Martin Haar after tearing off the name Leon. Go on, Diamond. You didn't count on her starting a second one, so you went up to her apartment and killed her with Martin's own gun. Oh, with his own gun. Uh, Maybe you can tell me how I got it. Oh, oh, I think so. You had to know a lot of things before you could kill your wife. What time Martin would arrive so the time of death would be close. You had to have his gun to leave by the body, and you had to have a witness who would swear Martin killed her. It had to be time, just right. You're talking yourself into a corner. How would I get all these things? By working with someone who was close enough to Martin. Maybe like his wife. You're crazy. Am I? She just drove me to this place. So what? A lot of people know this place. She told me she didn't. So I gave her an address eight doors down, but she pulled up right in your front of your door. Well, that could happen. It was too pat, Leon. Getting me to come to her place at ten minutes to eight and knowing her husband would leave close to eight... She had to know it because that letter was delivered just before I got there. Think you can prove it? You made one mistake. I didn't hear a shot when I got to your wife's apartment. I found out later that you could hear one all the way down in the street. Your wife was killed before Martin went into that building. 
Probably when you saw his cab pull up. Well, anyway, it's enough to hold you on, and I think we can prove later on that you've been seeing June Hires. You're a pretty smart shamist, I mean. Oh, you mean you admit it? Okay, baby, come on in. June, come on out of there. Leon, are you crazy? Well, well, well. I didn't know you kept your back room stocked with nylons, Leon. Yeah, yeah. I guess you two don't need any introduction. Why did you have to drag me into this? You heard what Diamond said. He knows all about it. You got the car out back? Yes. But what are we going to do with him? Diamond? Well, he's going swimming with a barrel of cement. Lieutenant Levinson wouldn't like that. He knows I came here. You're lying. Wait a minute. Maybe he isn't. Diamond was upstairs with him for quite a while. Okay, so we'll have to hurry things up. Leon, you you can't shoot him. Yeah. You should know it's not polite to point. I'm not going to knock him off here in the office. We'll take him in the car and do it later. No, Leon. What do you mean, no? It was your idea to kill your wife. I just helped get the gun. I'm not going to be along if you kill Diamond. You're going to be right with me, baby, because you're in this up to your pretty neck, and I need that car. I'm not going to do it. Oh, yes, you are. Well, you and Diamond go swimming together. Leon. Give me that gun. Uh, you... Let me let me go. Come here. on, drop it. You go to the devil. June, June, come back here. I'm getting off. You got me into this mess. Come back here, you, you dirty little tramp. Don't you take that car. You're not going anywhere, Leon. You want to bet? I'll... You diamond! He hit me with the butt of his gun, and I went down like the price of wheat in July. As I picked myself up, I watched him run for the back door. June! June, wait for me! You're not gonna leave me here to take a rock! I got my gun out and stumbled over to the window and looked out just as the car started up. I spotted Leon with a gun in his hand. He looked mean enough to start shooting with it. He did. I started running up the alley then. I suppose I could have said something like stop or I'll shoot, but I was too tired. I just rested my arm on the window and let him have it. Ah! Well, Walt finally showed and cleaned things up. I was bleeding again, so I headed for 975 Park Avenue and my usual first aid station. Yes? Hello, Francis. Miss Asherin? Oh, my goodness, Mr. Diamond. Come in, sir. Come in. You've been hurt again. I guess you'll have to answer the door a little quicker after this, Francis, or build a first aid station in the hall. The usual, sir? No, you can forget the plasma, Francis. I had liver for dinner. I can stand the loss. Just as you say, sir. Miss Asher is in the study. Oh, thank you. Why don't you go to bed? You look tired. Yes, well, good night, sir. Boo. Oh, oh, Rick. Yeah, isn't it awful? Oh, what happened to your chin? Oh, I got it caught in a thirty-eight. Want me to go? Want you to go? Why? Well, I thought maybe my poor little face scared you. Oh, I like your poor little mussed-up face. Well, thanks, sporty. How about some music? Oh, I'm too tired. Turn on the radio. All right. Now, let me look at that chin. Oh, that's soothing. Hey, oh, shut that radio off. I'm trying to sleep. Now, what is that? Oh, it's that crabby old neighbor. Oh, it is, huh? Now, Rick, don't get mad. I'll turn it off. You want something, Max? Yeah, some sleep. Is that too much to ask? Well, stick your head in a closet. Now, look, bud. You look. That radio wouldn't wake a two-year-old. Well, just pretend I haven't stopped teething, white guy. All I want is some sleep. Oh, you do, huh? Sleepy time, gal. You're turning night into day. Uh, you... oh. Rick. Oh, that guy upsets me. Well, right. He upsets you. That's too pretty a song to sing like that. No. Now you do it right or I'm going to be mad. Well, honey, then that's the last thing I want you to be. Now, now cuddle up on the sofa. You comfy? Mm-hmm. Don't be mad now, baby. Sleepy time, gal, you're turning night into day. Sleepy time, gal, you dance the evening away. Oh, that's wonderful. Before each silvery star fades out of sight. Please give me one little kiss, then let us whisper good night. It's getting late, and baby, your pillow's waiting. Sleepy time, gal, when all your dancing is through. Sleepy time, gal, I'll find a cottage for you. You'll learn to cook and to sew, 
What's more, you'll love it, I know. When you're stay at home, play at home, eight o'clock, sleepy time, gal. Well, how was that, baby? Helen. <sighs> Helen. Well, how do you like that? She snores, too. Hey, you! Max! Yeah, now what do you want? How about a game of gin? I'm lonesome. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg. Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Jay Novello, Joan Banks, and Stacey Harris. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. <laughs> This program has come to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Here is another in NBC's great parade of new shows. As Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there. This is Diamond. You know, I'm sure a lot of you people have never seen this big city of New York that I live in. But you ought to. It's really worth seeing. I don't mean a four-bit tour in a bus. I mean that one time that you stop along the way and really take a good look. Maybe it's from a building 40 floors up. You brace yourself against the stiff morning breeze and you lean out and watch the biggest city in the world wake up, stretch, roll up its progressive sleeves and go to work. Or maybe it's 6 o'clock in the evening and you're on your way home. You hold up at a busy intersection and you feel the Colossus even before you see it. You look behind, to the right, the left, and then up. And there it is. You could only take in three blocks maybe... But the pushing crowds and towering buildings are a common denominator for the Bronx, Park Avenue, and Flatbush. The rest you have to imagine because your dinner's waiting. Well, I'm lucky in a way. My dinner's ready when I start throwing nickels in the automat. My meals and my time are freelance, and my work is a ringside ticket to the biggest city in the world. Sure, it's lonely sometimes, and trouble walks the streets on a 24-hour beat. But that's how I pay my rent. Troubles my silent partner, and he sends me everything from divorce labels to some marked City Morgue, DOA, dead on arrival. One night last week, old man Trouble was sitting curled up on a doorstep watching two thugs hiding in the shadows of a building. Trouble had a big smile because he was cooking up a king-sized mess for yours truly. Hey, Lou. Yeah? Ain't he ever gonna come out? He'll come out. We just gotta wait, that's all. Hey, Lou. Yeah, what is it? I hope he comes out soon. That cop car is due in a little while. Yeah. Hey, hey, supposing they drive up the street just when he comes out. And we don't use the artillery. We don't? We follow him and get him someplace else. Okay, okay. Hey, Lou. What? Here he comes. Yeah. You ready? Yeah, sure. Hey, look, he's got his two big watchdogs with him. Get set. Now. <laughs> We'd better get going. Don't run, stupid. You think we was being clocked? Hey, Lou. There's that lousy cop car. Come on. Where are you going? In this club. Come on, hurry. Hey, Lou, supposing the cops come down here. Shut up. Table, gentlemen. Uh, yeah, for my friend and me. Right this way. Sure, like a souvenir 
picture to take. Lou, are you crazy? We can't sit down at no table. They'll have the whole neighborhood covered in a few minutes. We can sit for a second, and we'll go out the back door. Here you are, gentlemen. Is this all right? Oh, just standing. Yeah, this is just fine. Thank you. Very good, sir. I'll send a waiter right over. Oh, now, come on, Lou. Let's blow this joint. Wait till he gets further away. Please, Lou. Okay. Now you go first. Take your time, off, Molly. Picture, sir? Huh? No, miss. We don't want no photographs. Uh, yeah, we, we don't want none. Thanks. Just the same. Oh, that's okay. Picture? Like a souvenir picture to take home? Oh, yeah, thank you. Well, come on. Right behind you. Now, hold it right there. No, no, no. Don't move. Thank you. That will be the fellow. Hey, Mel, hold it a minute. Yeah, what is it? It's that dame. This is no time to start looking at dames. No, you fathead. The one with the camera. So she's got good-looking legs, but we got... Uh-oh. What's the matter? There's a cop in the door. Get going, but take your time. I'll tell you about the dame later. Oh, Lynn. Yeah? What is it, Monsieur Davis? Where are you going? Back to the dark room to develop these pictures. You always said not to keep the customers waiting, didn't you, Monsieur Davis? I'm glad to see you listen to your employer. I, um, I'll just come along to see how this batch turns out. This batch isn't any different from the last hundred batches. We'll just go along and see. Oh, that does it. I beg your pardon. I said that does it. You cornered me in that dark room once, and it was all I could do to keep you away from me. Lynn. If you think that just because you run this place, you've got a right to make passes at me, you better get yourself a new girl. Well, maybe that isn't such a bad idea. Come to think of it, I kind of go for it myself. And as long as I'm quitting, here's something you've been asking for for a long time. Oh, hey, what do you think you're doing? Now get out of my way. That phony French accent may fool the customers, but it doesn't fool me. You get out of here. Pick up your check and get out of here this minute, you, you little... <laughs> oh. Now, what were you going to say, Mr. Davis? Get out, get out. Diamond Detective Agency, if you've lost a body, let us dig it up. Oh, Rick, that's awful. Depends on who we dig up and how long he's been there. Rick. Hello, Helen, baby. You're simply gruesome. I know it, but my tongue matches my shirts. What do you do when you wear stripes? I tell everybody I've been licking barber poles. Oh. Nah. Thought you'd catch me, didn't you? No, I don't think I'll ever catch you. Oh, I think you're the prettiest little old gal in the whole dang breast of the state. Flattery will get you nowhere. Have we got a date tonight? Only if the elevator is still running. Mr. Diamond? Hmm? Oh, uh, I'll call you back later, honey. I think I just cited the client. Mr. Diamond, please, I I've got to talk to you. Well, honey, go back and shut the door. If too much smoke gets out of here, the ceiling will cave in. Hmm? Oh, yes. Oh, all right. Mm. Rick, did I hear a girl's voice? I think so. But maybe she just wears those clothes because her mother never had a haircut. What does she look like? I can't tell you right now. I'm parked behind a curb. Rick! There. The door is closed, Mr. Diamond. Now may I speak with you, please? Uh, Helen, I'll call you later. I don't care if she is a prospective client. You face the window when you're talking business. Well, there's a cigarette ad out there. Why look out at an ad when the slogan's right here in my office? Slogan? Yeah, you know. So round, so firm, so... Rick. Bye, baby. Now, uh, <clears throat> uh, you were saying... I, uh... I want to hire you to protect me, Mr. Diamond. I know an easier way. Wear a diving suit. Mr. Diamond... Put your eyes back in your head. And please listen to me. My life is in danger. There's an answer for that, too. But go on. Tell me the story. Well, my name is Knight. Miss? Yes. Yes. Uh, in the last two days, there have been several attempts on my life. Uh, by whom? Well, I don't know. Well, do you know why anyone would want to kill you? No. No, I don't. Well, now we're getting someplace. Don't be funny, Mr. Diamond. I tell you that twice an attempt has been made on my life. How? Well, the first time a man followed me home and tried to break into my apartment, I screamed and then frightened him off. Maybe he was lonesome. What about the other time? Well, I don't know whether it was the same man or not, but the next night a man jumped out of a car and tried to make me go with him. I kicked him and ran down the block. Sounds more like a kidnapping than an attempted homicide. Why didn't you tell this to the police? Oh, I did. They investigated, but I couldn't give them enough to go on, so they just put a man watching my apartment. I bet he has to stand in line. Didn't they give you an escort? No. They seemed to think I was after some kind of publicity or something. Mm. They told me it was all right to go out in the daytime, but to stay in my apartment for the next couple of nights. Sounds reasonable. Will you help me, Mr. Diamond? I'm afraid this will happen again. Uh, my dear, my my fee is a hundred a day in expenses. A uh, hundred a day? Mm. Oh, Mr. Diamond, I don't have that kind of money. Well, neither do I, but if I starve, I do it with dignity. I can't lower my fee, Miss Knight. I never have. Hmm. Well, then, I just 
We'll have to find another detective agency. There are a lot of good ones. I'm sorry, the rule might bend a little, but it won't break. If I took the job knowing you couldn't pay half the fee, ten minutes later, some guy from Texas with an oil-soaked wallet might want to hire me to count his gas stations. Ah, sorry, sorry, but it's a tough world, Miss Knight. Yeah. Well, thanks, Mr. Diamond. Maybe you could recommend someone? Oh, any of them are good. Just close your eyes and open the classified. Well, goodbye, Mr. Diamond. I'm sorry. So am I. My conscience just slit its throat. Like you said, Mr. Diamond, it's a tough world. Uh, yeah, the toughest. Goodbye. Yeah. No, nuts. Yeah, what is it? Diamond? He's hiding his head in the desk. I'll get him for you. Come on out, you heel. Look, I don't know who this is, but put Diamond on the pipe. This is Diamond. Wait till I get the bad taste out of my mouth. Look, you can wet your whistle later. I've always wondered what happened to people who said that. Is there a dame in your office named Knight? <sighs> well, there was. She left just before you called. Well, let me give you a little tip. If she hired you, you're going to start feeling overworked right now, so tell her you don't want the job. Oh, I am, huh? Yeah. Or your nearest relative is going to have to come down and identify the body. You know something? No, what? A couple of minutes ago, I proved that a good businessman can start looking like a big, fat heel for a lousy hundred a day in expenses. Huh? Don't work on it too long, but stop in sometime, Buster. I'd like to help you spit out your teeth. Better listen to what I say, Shamus. You're way out of your class in this one. I'm always out of my class when I talk with slobs. And if you don't like it, look me up. I'll be working for Miss Knight. I went out of my office in a hurry. When somebody tries to push me around, it's like giving a kid a slingshot in a hothouse. You can tell him all night not to do it, but by morning, he's busted every window in the place. I hoped I might catch Miss Knight before she got to the street, so I grabbed the elevator and went down to the first floor. I couldn't find her in the lobby, so I went out on the sidewalk. The street was crowded, but those curves showed up like a covered wagon on Madison Avenue. She was just starting across Broadway when a big black sedan pulled up and a guy climbed out after her. I took off as fast as my little 175 pounds would carry me and cut kitty corner across the street with an eye on the black sedan. The guy had her by the arm, and I knew when she stopped struggling, he'd show her his gun. I was on a dead run, gonna make like a big hero, but his 38 changed my mind. (laughs) He missed with the first one, then he shoved the girl away from him and tried again. I could hear the slug whine past my head, so I hit the sidewalk right next to the girl. He jumped for the car. I just lay there and watched him drive off. Did did you get the license number? No, it was covered with mud. Gee, I guess you must look pretty silly just sitting here. Yeah, got some jacks? I'm a wizard for Maybe you believe me now, Mr. Diamond. Yeah. Here, let me give you a hand up. Uh, Thanks. Now, come on, let's get out of here. We're collecting a crowd. Where are we going? I know a policeman who can't understand attempted assault. He says it's not necessary. And believe me, baby, he's got a cure for it. Come on. In just a moment, we will return to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. But first... The National Safety Council reports that in almost every motor vehicle accident, there is one or more violations of the law, speed, drink, and carelessness being the worst offenders. The difficulty is that people continue to think of the horror of accidents as always happening to someone else. It never occurs to us that we may be killed dashing out to lunch tomorrow. Yes, it can and does happen, for it's the careless little chances each one of us takes every day that cause the big accident totals. Every motorist and pedestrian is urged to support actively the safety movement in his own community. Be careful. The life you save may be your own. And now, back to Dick Powell and the second act of Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Diamond is hurrying with his pretty client to see Lieutenant Levinson, head of homicide. I hailed a cab, and ten minutes later, Len Knight and I were walking into the 5th Precinct Police Station. Sergeant Otis looked up and started to say something, but when he saw what I was with, he changed it to a low whistle. (laughs) Oh, stop puckering, Otis. You look like you've been unstopping sinks. Oh, very funny, wise guy. Um, How about the introduction? Uh, Miss Knight, Sergeant Otis. Homicide's answer to mercy killings. Hello, Sergeant. Don't pay no attention to him, Miss Knight. 
He was born with a nasty disposition. Is the lieutenant in, Sergeant? Uh, yeah, go ahead. He'll see you. Uh, nice meeting you, Miss Knight. Uh, nice meeting you, Sergeant. <laughs> Horace. Uh, yeah? Stop clucking. You'll have every rooster in town in here. Hello, Walt. Who's that with you? Uh, this is Miss Knight. Is she dead? Walt. Say something nice to the lieutenant, dear. After that last remark? Oh, look, Miss Knight, I'm sorry, but this guy you're with has a talent for finding homicides. I'm suspicious of everyone I see him with, because even if they walk into my office with him, he'd do it just to confuse me. Well, I'm quite alive, Lieutenant. Then let me give you a friendly tip, Miss Knight. Stay away from this guy. His sense of humor will turn your hair white. Oh, isn't he a dream? Walt, Miss Knight wants protection. Yeah, I see what you mean. Walt, now stop gnawing on the desk and listen to me. Miss Knight is in line for a murder or for kidnapping. I knew it. She wants protection, and you're going to give it to her. That's not my department. This is homicide, isn't it? Of course it is. But you know very well we don't go to work until you're dead. Well, honey, I guess you'll just have to roll it and get yourself killed. That's the only way. Now you stop that. Send her to another department. They'll give her all the protection she needs. She's been there. They stuck a guy out in front of her apartment. Now, look. I just saw Hood try to muscle her into a car. He took a shot at me, and you know bullets give me that let-down feeling. Now, put one of your boys with her until I can do something about clearing this thing up. What's your full name, Miss Knight? Uh, Lynette. Lynn, for short. Where do you live and where do you work? I live at 419 West 48th Street, apartment 309. I quit my job three days ago. Where was this job? The Circus Club on 52nd Street. I took pictures. Took pictures? Yeah, you know. Souvenirs of the customers. Oh. Why'd you quit? Well, my... Boss got grabby. I slapped him around. Hey, uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute, honey. Did did you say Circus Club, 52nd Street? Yeah. What about it? Walt, didn't somebody gun down Al Rigoletta and two of his boys right near there? Say, you are right. Three nights ago. You didn't see that shooting, did you, Miss Knight? Well, no, but I read about it the next day. Well, if you didn't see it, they couldn't want to get at you just because you were a witness. Oh, this is screwy. What have we got to work on? You just put a man to guard her. I'm going to see what I can do. All right, but only because I owe you a favor. Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant? Get in here. Otis? Yes, Otis. He's not as stupid as he looks. Want to bet? He couldn't be and live. Uh, you want me, Lieutenant? Not for keeps. I want you to stay with Miss Knight here until I tell you to come home. Somebody's trying to get rough with her. Got it? Yeah. <laughs> Walt, have you found any eggs around the office? Eggs? Otis, where do you hide your nest? Oh, Lieutenant, make this guy lay off for me. Yeah, Rick, lay off the poor guy. Otis. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, Lieutenant. Stop standing on one leg and wait outside, you mallet head. Oh, oh, yeah, Lieutenant. Uh, Walt, I'll keep in touch. Okay. Uh, Mr. Diamond. Uh, yeah? Thanks. I'll make it up to you some way. Don't strain yourself. I like an obligation to be fun. It will be. Rick. Yeah? Bye. I left the 5th Precinct and headed for the Circus Club. It was a small place with sawdust on the floor and colored decorations like the inside of a circus tent. The place was still closed, but a short, dapper little guy in a gray business suit answered my knock. Yes, you're from the police. Why? You need them? I just put in a call. Someone burglarized the place last night. Oh. You know a girl named Knight? Lynn Knight? That's it. I most certainly do. I fired her three nights ago. If she's in some kind of trouble with the police, she deserves it. You must run this place. That's right. My name's Davis. Would you like to take a look at the room that was broken into? I certainly would. What did they steal? That's just it. I don't know. They turned it upside down, but I can't imagine what they were after. It's a dark room. A dark room? Yes. I have several girls that take pictures of the customers. They developed the prints in the back of the cafe. Right this way. Uh, forget it. But I thought you wanted... I'm not from the police, Mr. Davis. I'm a private detective. Uh, tell me, did Miss Knight turn in all her film the night she quit? I fired her. Difference of opinion. Did she turn in all her film? Why, no. As a matter of fact, she didn't. She left with her camera, and several customers got rather angry when the pictures weren't developed. You mean her last role was still in that camera? It must have been. She didn't leave it in the dark room. I looked. Mm. Where's the phone? Right over there. Walt, I think I've got something. Diamond, I've got something, too. A sour stomach and headache. What's the matter? Otis followed that night dame halfway home when some guy stepped out of an alley and split his head with a sap. He's down in an emergency getting his skull crocheted. What about the girl? We don't know. Otis can't remember. 
Oh, that's dandy. I'll call you back. Now, you wait a minute. I can't. Bye. I had one of those muscle-bound hunches. And I had to work fast or Lynn Knight was going to get herself kicked around and maybe end up in the city morgue. I remembered her dress. And 15 minutes later, I was standing in front of room 309. I could hear the phone ringing from somewhere inside, so I waited to see if anyone answered it. On the third ring, I tried the door. Well, well, well. Hello? Uh, who is this? Uh, this is Diamond. Oh, thank goodness. This is Lynn Knight. Well, where the devil are you? Lieutenant Levinson said you'd disappeared. I'm in a bar on 50th Street. That man who tried to shove me into his car this afternoon hit Sergeant Otis on the head, and I've been running ever since. Now, how did you know I was here? Oh, I didn't. I called your office and got no answer, so I just took a chance. Maybe you'd gone looking for me. I was, but I was looking for something else, too. Tell me, baby, have you got a camera? Why, I did have. Did have? What happened to it? Well, I sort of uh, sold it. Oh, you mean you hocked it. I didn't need it anymore, and I did need the money. You stay right where you are, and I'll be down. What's the name of the place? Uh, oh, 2320 Club. Please hurry, Mr. Diamond. I'm scared. Okay. Uh, I want to ask you something else. Hello? Hello? I thought you'd hung up. No, I thought you... Lynn. Yeah? Is there an extension on this phone? Why, yes, in the bedroom. Say, you don't think... I don't know. Wait a minute. Hey, what are you guys... Mr. Diamond? Mr. Diamond, are you still on the... Okay, Mel. Let's go get the dame. Hey, that was pretty smart waiting around and listening in on the extension, Lou. What do you want me to do with the shamus? He looks like he can still hear things. Well, turn him off. Sure. Okay. Okay, let's go. What are you limping for? I kicked him with the wrong foot. I got a lousy, ingrown toenail. I laid there trying to crawl back to a more sensible way of life. He'd kick me so hard that it shook my eyes loose and they'd run back into my head to hide. Everything was suddenly crammed into a long funnel that disappeared into the floor and I felt pretty sick. I was stuck in an acre of colored molasses and trying to get myself loose was like pulling a pillar through a garden hose. When I finally made it, I stuck my head under a sink and let the cold water bring me back to normal. Then I headed for the 2320 Club in a hurry. Something I could do for you? I'm looking for a girl, but I don't see her. Ah, uh, they come and go. It's like that around here. She had on a green skirt and a jersey blouse. Couldn't miss her unless you don't like girls. Oh, her. Uh, she used the phone and then she left. Alone? No, a couple of ugly-looking guys came in and she left with them. Hey, you know her? Yeah. Well, she forgot her purse. You might tell her. Her purse? Let me see it. Oh, no. Here's the badge, Buster. Oh, okay. He handed me the purse and I went through it. Nothing much but a pawn ticket. I looked at it, and that hunch started biting my leg, so I took off for the pawn shop. Good afternoon. Uh, here's a ticket. I want to claim the article. Sure, sure. A11249. Here it is. Ah, lovely camera. Bingo. Did the girl sell it to you? No, she just wants me to claim it for her. Well, be careful. She said there was still some film in it. She wanted to come back and get it when she got a new job. Uh, Fifteen dollars, please. Yeah, uh, here you are. Is there a place around here where I can get the film developed? Right across the street. You can see it from here. Ah, uh, thanks. Here it comes. Yep, yep, it's coming up, but we'll, we'll leave it in a little longer. Say, maybe I'm nosy, but what's so important about this roll of film? I'll tell you better when I look at it. Well, I'll turn on the light. There you are. Yeah. Well, nothing on this one. Hmm. Mm. Nope. Hey, look at this. With some old guy with his wife. Is that what you wanted to find? You see those two guys in the background that look like they're just sneaking out of a chicken house? Yeah, so what? The one in the back is Lou Garzoni. The gangster? Yeah. Give me that negative. Let's get out of here. Well. You two holding hands in there? Hey, who are you and what's the gun for? Uh, take it easy, Doc. He shoots people. That's right. Now back into the room. Uh, all right, but take it easy with that gun. Give me that negative, Shamus. Okay. Yeah. 
Now, where's the picture? If it, it, it's still in the juice. Well, get it. I'll get it. That's better. Well, come on, come on. I can't seem to find it. Oh, yeah? Look for yourself. I'll look. See? <laughs> hey, you threw it in his face. That stuff oh, might blind him. So now he can't see to kill you. My eyes. Get me to the doctor, quick. After you Where tell me where the girl is. 212 West 45th Street, apartment 513. Harry, I can't stand it. Call a doctor for this guy and then get hold of Lieutenant Levins in 5th Precinct. Tell him to meet me in front of 212 West 45th and to step on it. Yes, all right. I'll take those pictures. I can't stand it. I'm fine. Oh, sure you can. It's no fun looking at the electric chair anyway. Apartment 513, he said. Oh, here it is. Yeah. If Lou Garzoni's in there, we got to take him by surprise or he'll knock off the girl. Otis is down the alley, so he won't get out that way. Well, here goes. I hope it works. Yeah, who is it? Oh, uh, Mel had an accident. He sent me up to tell you. What's your name? Tony Vega. Well, why'd you say so? I thought you was in stir. Coppers! You dirty duck, duck Walt! Gonna... Oh! Oh! How about it, Walt? He's on his way. Where's the girl? Probably in the other room. Yeah. Yeah. Take it easy, baby. All right. I'll get the gag on. Now, there you are. Oh, Mr. Diamond. Mr. Diamond, he was going to kill me. Yeah, I know. Is she all right? Sure, Walt. Oh, uh, how about Garzoni? No hurry for the wagon. No. Now, will you please tell me how you knew Lou Garzoni was in this apartment? Well, he and his boy were after a picture Miss Knight took. Yeah, this one. Ah. Here they are in the background. He was an old enemy of Al Rigoletto, wasn't he, Walt? Yeah. Why? Oh, I bet he was the one who rubbed him out. Then he and his boy ducked into the nightclub. Garzoni saw his picture taken, so they went after Len. Why, why Mr. Diamond? Oh, what's the matter? You finally called me Lynn. Well, Lynn. <laughs> Uh, you go home and take it easy. I might stop by tomorrow. What's the matter with tonight? I've got a piano lesson. Bye. Otis! Yeah, Lieutenant? Is it all over? Yes, you hammerhead. Now get out of that garbage can and see if you can find your way back to the station. Okay. Rick. Hmm? Tell me about the girl in your office. Oh, nice kid. Lovely eyes. I'm jealous. Good for you. And I'm mad. You're so busy. <laughs> you like the new piano? Oh, yes, yeah. It's a big one. <laughs> Must have taken a herd of elements to make the keyboard. Sing something. What does Rita Baby want? I don't care. Okay. Oh! I don't care. I don't care. Rick. Well, that's what you said. You said that. Yes, you did. There's something nice. All right. Everywhere you go, sunshine follows you. Oh, that's such a beautiful tune. Really? Everywhere you go, skies are always blue. Rick. I'm going to finish it. Children love you, they seem to know. You bring the roses right out of the snow. The whole world says hello. Everywhere you go. You suppose the guy who wrote that song ever got shot at? <laughs> oh, Rick, you idiot. Come here. Oh. This is much more fun than piano lessons. Uh. 
You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Joan Banks, Paul Dubob, Herbert Ellis, and Sidney Miller. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by Richard Sandville. And now, Dick Powell. Friends, I want to remind you of the wonderful group of programs NBC has on tap for tomorrow afternoon and evening. Shows like Hollywood Calling, Guy Lombardo, Four Star Playhouse, The Ethel Merman Show, and the NBC Symphony. For the best in radio listening tomorrow and always, keep your dial tuned to your favorite NBC station. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. And don't miss the interesting story, My Mr. Powell and His Mr. Diamond, in the September issue of Radio Mirror, now on your newsstand. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at this same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Here is another in NBC's great parade of new shows. Now, Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Hello there, this is Diamond. You know, there are a lot of people in a big city like this, good ones and bad ones. They walk down Broadway and rub elbows and you can't tell them apart. Why can't you? Because a lot of them were poured out of the same mold, brought up in the middle of garbage cans and gang wars, weaned on the smell of slums and conditioned to the taste of dirt and a kick in the ribs. By the time they get old enough to raise their fist, they're given two choices, two ways to beat the gang wars and garbage cans. One guy picks himself up, shakes off the filth, and jumps over on the right side of the fence. The other guy picks himself up, too. But when he does, he raises that fist and shakes it at the whole world because he wants things the easy way. He continues to shake his fist until someone shoves a gun in it. Then he's a swaggering giant. Sometimes he climbs over with his little bag of rot and hides in the lap of society. But take away the gun, and he ends up right back in the middle of the garbage cans with his face in the dirt. And what about the guy on the right side of the fence? Well, you rarely ever hear of him, unless he becomes president or gets mixed up with the guy on the wrong side of the fence. Like the case I bumped into a couple of days ago, it all started in Central Park. <laughs> Some girl got run over. That young guy over there ran over with his car. I came up right after it happened. He was leaning over her and crying. A little late for crying, I'd say. Says he didn't kill her. Says someone pushed her in front of his car. <laughs> Ain't that a good one? All right, everybody back. Here comes the ambulance. Come on, you. But I tell you, I didn't kill her. I was in love with her. That's the last thing you should have said. But I swear I didn't do it. I was going to meet her about a, about a half a block up the street and... Someone pushed her out in front of my car. I couldn't stop in time. Hey, look, I just got to write a report and take it down to the station. You can tell it to the inspector. Now look out. Here's the ambulance. Hello, Crackett. Yeah, you're too late. The body's ready for the morgue. Ah, Central Park's turning into a graveyard. I'm going to start taking my girl someplace else. What do you mean? Somebody else got run over in the park? Somebody got shot full of holes. Call came in just for this one. That uh, gangster Chino Scarbo? Scarbo got knocked off. He was dough, wasn't he? Please, officer, can't I get to a phone? Shut up. One of the biggest gangsters in town gets rubbed out, and I gotta show up at the station with you. You know, Sonny, I'm not pleased with you at all. Diamond Detective Agency, corpse is designed with you in mind. Rick. Oh, hello, Helen, baby. Where do you get all those awful slogans? Ghost Rider. Ho, ho, ho. Get it? Rick. Wasn't a riot? No, Rick. 
was a bomb. Oh. Uh, okay, maybe this will get a yuck. Oh. Oh, here's a butte. Are you lonely? Join the Lonely Souls Club and find your perfect soulmate. All ages. Guarantee satisfaction and money refunded. I wonder if Mighty Joe Young knows about this. Rick, what are you talking about? I'm reading the personals. Hey, get a load of this one. We'll give ride to coast, must be young companion, pretty, easy on the eyes. Hmm. Think I ought to apply, baby? You're ridiculous. Oh, here's an odd one. Anyone witnessing unusual accident at the 77, 72nd Street transverse, 11 p.m. Wednesday night, when young girl was killed, call Skyler 6036. Urgent. That's in Central Park. Yeah, somebody's got troubles. Mr. Diamond? Uh, hold it a minute, baby. Yeah, I'm Diamond. What can I do for you? I, uh, want to hire you. Uh, Helen. Yes, I know. Bye. A hundred dollars a day in expenses, sir. That's your fee? Yep. I like to give it to the prospective client first. If he turns green and faints, we both save a lot of time and talk. How do you feel? About the fee? Fine. Well, what else is bothering you? My son is being held on a manslaughter charge. Well, if you kill somebody, that's a job for the police. But he didn't do it intentionally. The girl was shoved in front of his car. That's his story. Yes, it is. And I believe him. Hmm? Who was the girl, and why do you think anyone would want to kill her? Her name was Jean Cooper. My son was in love with her. Why anyone would want to kill her, I really can't say. Uh Uh-huh. Your name and your son's name, where he's being held? My name is Cook. Earl Cook. My son's (laughs) name is Tom. He's at the 5th Precinct Police Station. Oh, wouldn't you know it? I beg your pardon? Uh, Forget it. Uh, What's your business, Mr. Cook? Politics. Where can I reach you? I live at 261 Riverside Drive. My phone is Skyler 6036. Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? I don't know. That phone number's familiar. Where did your son run over this girl, Mr. Cook? The 72nd Street Transverse. 11 o'clock Wednesday night? Why, yes. How did you know? I read the papers. Is this your ad in the personal column? Yes. Yes, it is. You see, the police claim there were no witnesses. But I had hopes that there might have been someone who had seen the accident... Well, if, if anyone calls you, let me know. Now, uh, <clears throat> I'll take $100, Mr. Cook. That's a retainer in case I run into trouble and have to get buried in a hurry. I hate to strain my relatives. He wrote me out a check, and I closed the office and headed for the 5th Precinct Police Station. An automobile death isn't exactly up my alley, but if someone had pushed the girl out in front of the car, then it was murder. And that was a territory I knew my way around in. Well, well, good morning, Sergeant Otis. Huh? Oh, where did you come from, Shamus? Sugar and spice and everything nice. Huh? That's what little boys are made of. You're crazy. That's what little girls are made of. Why, Sergeant, you peaked. Uh, you want to see the lieutenant? I think that would be lovely. Go on, then. Oh, uh, Otis. Huh? I just had a horrible thought. Yeah? Wouldn't it be awful if there was a whole room full of you? Hello, Walt. Diamond, you get out of here. Every time you wander into this office, I grow another ulcer. Why, Walt, I'm surprised at you. Well, you wouldn't be if you had to listen to Otis bellyaching all over the precinct 12 hours a day. Why don't you leave that poor guy alone? Don't listen to him. Don't listen to him? How can I help it? He screams so loud, only dogs can get with it. Have you got a boy booked here on the manslaughter charge, uh, Tom Cook? Yes, we have. I knew darn good and well you'd be springing something before you'd sit down and act like a normal human being. What do you want Cook for? He ran over a dame last night, and that's that. Maybe you want to give him a driving lesson? Uh, uh, uh. You're turning blue again, Walt. I'll light up like a pinball machine if you don't start giving me some peace and quiet. Can I see, Cook? No, you can't. Well, why not? I know you. You'll end up by proving he wasn't even in the city last night. Before the day is gone, we'll be booking Otis for the k- killing. Did he do it? Who? Otis. Now, you stop that. Don't you dare start that routine again. I'm the biggest sucker in the world for that thing, and I admit it, but I am prepared. I know who's on first base today. Who? Williams. He's playing for... Uh, Otis! Yeah, Lieutenant? Yeah, Lieutenant. Yeah, Lieutenant. Is that all you can say? Take Diamond down to see that guy Cook. And if you let him back in this office, I'll break every bone in your fat head. Yeah, Lieutenant. Oh. Where is that bicarbonate? My Walt. I left Walt coming on like Vesuvius, and Otis took me down in the tombs to see Tom Cook. Cook was a man about 25 or 26, put together like a high jumper. He had sandy hair and a nice face. Also, he looked pretty worried. I tell you, Mr. Diamond, I didn't intentionally run over Jean. She called and asked me to meet her in the park. Why? Well, we always met there. Oh. You say she was pushed in front of the car? Well, that's what it looked like. There are some bushes right near the sidewalk. 
she came flying out of them and fell in front of me before I could put on the brakes. What did she want to see you about? It was personal. Now, look, look. You're up on a manslaughter charge. You can get a lot of time for that. Now, what did she want to see you about? I can't tell you. I just can't tell you. It would ruin someone. It's going to wreck you if you don't. Then it'll have to. Okay, okay. Did she have any enemies at all? Boyfriends, girlfriends, ex-husbands, jealous ice men? She had an ex-husband. When did she separate from him? About a year ago. Why? Do you think maybe Cooper was jealous? Is his name Cooper? Yes, uh, John Cooper. Oh, live in town? Well, he was living at 498 West 81st Street, but that was a year ago. Okay. Tell me where your girl was living. 383 Madison Avenue, apartment 206. She was living under her married name, Cooper. Mm. Sure you don't want to tell me what she wanted to see you about? I can't, Mr. Diamond. Okay, but I hope the person you're protecting appreciates it. Five years in Sing Sing is stretching loyalty a long way. This person's worth it. Uh, Otis, let me out of here. You locked me up with a Boy Scout. Uh, Mr. Cook? Yes? Uh, who is this? This is Diamond. Diamond, I'm so glad you phoned. Oh? Remember my ad in the personal columns? Yes. Well, I just received a call from someone who claims he saw a man push a girl in front of my son's car. Oh. He said he was in a hurry, so he didn't wait around to see the rest. Can you imagine that? In too much of a hurry to stay round. No, I can't imagine it, unless he was running away from something, didn't want to be caught. Did he uh, tell you anything else? No, I, I asked his name, but he hung up. No. Well, if you hear from him again, call Lieutenant Levinson of the 5th Precinct. And I'll call you later. All right, Mr. Diamond. But now I'm sure my son is innocent. Well, I hope I can come up with more than your confidence. I knew a guy who yelled frame all the way to the electric chair. They fried him like a lean pork chop. I left the phone booth and took off for John Cooper's apartment. I found the place and gave my rabbit's foot a pat on the hock. The little bunny was still with me because a John Cooper was listed on the mailboxes. I took the steps two at a time. Yeah, who is it? Uh, the name's Diamond. I don't want any. I'm selling a homicide complete with samples. You better open up. Hey, what are you talking about? I'm talking about your ex-wife. She was killed last night. Why? Mind if I come in? No, 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 come on in. Jean dead. How did it happen? She was run over by a car. Oh, that's awful. Are you from the police? You got a gold star. Where were you at 11 o'clock Wednesday night? I was right here in my apartment. You can prove it? Well, I didn't leave. I don't guess I can prove it. I hope you don't think I ran over, Gene. I know who ran over. I'm trying to find out who aimed her. I don't understand. She was pushed in front of the car. How do you know that? Why shouldn't I know that? Well, what... I don't know. I, I, I guess you should. When was the last time you saw your ex-wife? Oh, about eight months ago. We didn't get along, so we didn't speak after we split up. You haven't seen her since? No. Or are you jealous of her new boyfriend? Jealous? Why should I be? Good question. I'll see you later, Mr. Cooper. Yeah. I hope I've been at some help. You've been dandy. I left Cooper pinning up his gold star and headed for the dead girl's apartment. I knew the law had already been there and that it would probably be locked tighter than a wine truck on Skid Row. I found the landlady's door and gave it a jolt. Yeah. Oh, what do you want? I'm uh, looking for the landlady. You want an apartment? We got one coming up in a couple of days. The dame that was in it croaked. You can pay in advance if you want it. Can I take a look at it? No. Lousy coppers told me not to let anyone in. You got my word, it's a good one. Oh, well then, you'd better let me talk to your mother. My mother? My old lady's been dead for 20 years. She has? Aren't you a little young to be running an apartment all by yourself? Hey, Sonny. Yeah? How old do you think I am? Well, it's hard to tell. I'd say, oh, about 28. <laughs> Come on, I'll show you the apartment. But watch those steps. I think you could use some glasses. Right up here, handsome. Was the poor girl who died married? Used to be, but she got divorced. Here it is. There you are, honey. Go on in, take a look around. I'll go on back downstairs in case the law comes back. I'll have to stall them, I guess. Thanks, beautiful. Oh, that's all right, honey. When you're done, stop in at my place and I'll give you a drink of gin. I waited until I heard the old bat fly down the stairs, and then I took the place apart. It took me exactly ten minutes, and even if I do say so, it was a pretty neat job. 
I was on the last lap, going through the wastebaskets, when I spotted something on the magazine stand. It was just below eye level. It was a late issue of a magazine, and it was addressed to Mr. John Cooper, 498 West 81st Street. I grabbed it and picked up the phone. Homicide, Sergeant Otis. Oh, this is Wu Lee. Wish you talking to Lieutenant Levinson? Oh, how are you, Wu Lee? Uh, get it for you, chop, chop. <laughs> Pretty good, huh? Oh, very fine. Chop, chop. Your head, maybe. Huh? Wu Lee say very fine. You speak very fine Chinese. Oh. Lieutenant Levinson. Oh, this is, uh, uh, this is Diamond Walt. It is. I told Otis I didn't want to talk to you. He said Wu Lee was on the pipe. Oh, this is Wu Lee, too, Walt. Oh. That lame brain, Otis. Well, what is it now, Diamond? I got a liar in the balcony, Walt. What are you talking about? I've spoken to three people about the girl that was run over. One of them lied to me. Now, I believe the kid's story. I think she was pushed. So, she was pushed. I can't be bothered with that right now. I'm all tangled up in the Scarborough killing. We found the gun that did the job lying in the bushes in Central Park. Wait a minute. In Central Park? Yeah, we traced it to a pawn shop, and the pawnbroker identified one Louis Spiegel as the one that bought the gun. Walt, what time was Scarborough knocked off? Shots were heard about five minutes to 11. Hey, that's just about the same time that Cook ran over the girl. You are so right. And Scarborough got killed on the other side of the park. About five minutes to run to where the girl got run over. Now, what are you getting at? If you know something about this Scarborough killing, I'm... Well, wondering... some guy called Tom Cook's father and said he saw the girl shoved in front of the car. He wouldn't tell his name because he said he'd get in trouble. Uh, probably a crank. No one would duck out on a deliberate murder. Unless he just rubbed out New York's biggest gangster. Hey. Yeah. Have you got Louis Spiegel on tap? No, he's hiding out. Oh. Well, do me a favor. Check your files and see if you've got a record on a John Cooper. The dead girl's ex-husband? Yeah, then I'll call you back. I've got a guy who might show us where we can find Louis Spiegel and the guy who pushed the girl in front of the car. Oh, he killed two birds with one stone. It's quite a billiard shot, but give my little stool pigeon two bottles of fermented grape juice and he can run the table. <laughs> I left the apartment and slipped by the landlady's door. I knew she was building a party because I could smell the hunted proof clear out in the hall. I ducked out on the street and headed for Skid Row in a place called the Parrot Club. When I went in, I spotted my man sitting in his usual spot at the bar. His name was Wilbur Truitt. Ah, greetings, bucko. You have come just in the nick. Not having the necessary funds to purchase another bottle of strength... I asked yon bartender to put it on the cup. Uh, Wilbur, Whereupon I... Whereupon he handed me this can of rat poison. Mm. It turned out to be rather soothing in a toxic sort of way. Bucko, you know me. I do not wish to deprive the little rodents of their daily constitution, so I would much rather nurse on the succulent end of a bottle. Wilbur, I'm looking for someone. I have been looking for someone all my life. Preferably a brewery owner. A uh, bartender, uh, bring me a bottle. Oh. Noble, sir, your over-kindness doth wring tears from me. I do embrace your offer. Now, you don't wrap your hooks around this jug until I find out where Louis Spiegel is. Ah, that is indeed a difficult problem. Mr. Spiegel carried a rather large gun under his arm. Then if I sit here and gaze at that bottle for any great period, I shall become cotton-mouthed and surely choke to death. Mr. Louis Spiegel might be found in the freight yards, hiding in an old shack at the end of 50th Street now, bucko. I'm rusting. Here you are, Wilbur, and thanks. Farewell. Lord knows when we shall meet again. I have faint, cold fear thrills through my veins. <laughs> but no matter. I have never let a cork confuse me before. Bartender, a corkscrew, and bring the cat. I owe him a drink. Homicide, Lieutenant Levinson. Diamond, Walt, what did you find out? John Cooper has no record. Uh-oh. But George Kingsley has. Oh, alias? Yeah. George Kingsley, alias John Cooper, did ten years for embezzlement. Oh, fine. Thanks, Walt. Now, here's the pitch. Lou Spiegel is in a shack in the freight yards at the end of 49th Street, North River. Get some men to surround the place and have Otis pick up John Cooper and bring him down there. I'll be there in half an hour and give you a couple of killers. All I needed was a motive, so I hung up the phone and headed for the house of my client, Earl Cook. Oh, come in, Mr. Diamond. I'm very glad you've come. Uh, Mr. Cook, did you... I uh, want to show you something. Here. Uh, what are they? 
Letters to my son. Blackmail letters. Oh? Where'd you find them? I was going through my son's things, trying to find something that might help uncover the motive for his accident. Mind if I take a look? Well, I can save you the trouble. They're about me. About you? Yes. I told you I'm in politics. Well, I am. And I'm a big power. When I began my rise, I was a young criminal lawyer. I had to accept a lot of cases that I might have turned down under different circumstances. And the opposition tried everything to discredit me. Smear campaigns. Saying that I was getting acquittals for common thugs who were known to be guilty. And later, when I became a judge, they switched the campaign and said that the men I sentenced were innocent. Were they? Of course not. But in those letters to my son, the blackmailer said that he had definite proof that could ruin me. My son knew about my past, and when he started receiving the letters, he was afraid to confront me with the evidence for fear I might have to admit my dishonesty. Have you talked with your son? I just left him. That's why he didn't tell you anything. He thought he was protecting me. His girl, Jean, found out who was sending him the letters and, well, she was killed before she could tell him. Well, that fits. If the girl found out, then the blackmailer would not only have to know your son pretty well, but he'd also have to know her. You think you know who he is? Uh, see this magazine? Mm-hmm. Well, some of the pages are cut up. Now, take a look at these blackmail notes. They're formed with cut-out letters to spell out the words. Mm. The type is the same as the type in the magazine. Where did you get that magazine? In the girl's apartment. Well, then she must have had something to do with it. She found the magazine all right, but it wasn't hers. Uh, look, Mr. Cook. Yes. Did you ever send a man to prison named Kingsley? Yes, I believe so. For embezzling. Ah, thanks. Where are you going? I'll call you later. I've got a date at the freight yards. Oh, hello, Rick. We've got Spiegel boxed up. He's in that shack down there. Ah, will he come out? If he does, it'll be feet first. Well, I guess he'd rather have it that way. Any shooting? He tried a couple, but I had the boys hold their fire until you got here. I see. Where's John Cooper? Otis hasn't showed up with him yet. Uh... Let me use your loudspeaker, Walt. Well, sure, go ahead, but uh, keep your head down. Spiegel. Spiegel, Lou. Why, that low life, I'll blast him to kingdom come. Hold it, Walt. Spiegel knows me. Louis. Louis, this is Diamond. I want to talk with you. You better get out of here, Diamond. It ain't none of your business. Lou, you've got my word. There'll be no shooting. I want to talk to you. Look, Diamond. I know they want me for the Scarborough killing, and I say, okay, I've done the job. But I'm allergic to electricity, and I don't like cops. You blow this place apart, I say, okay, too. And that's the way I want it. How do you still want to talk? I want five minutes. Okay, come on, Tom, but keep your hands behind your neck. Walt, no shooting, huh? Okay, but I think you're crazy. He kills guys for practice. I moved out from behind the boxcar and put my hands behind my head. I started down toward the shack, and I could see Spiegel looking at me over the barrel of a forty-five. One bad move from any of the men stationed around the yards, and I was going to get dead quick. I walked up to the shack and went in. That's far enough, Diamond. You've got five minutes. Uh, it won't take that long, Lou. Keep your hands where they are. Oh, I uh, thought you might want a cigarette. Oh. Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, I'm all out. Yeah. Keep the pack. Uh, just one. I got a date. Yeah. Light? I can make it. Four minutes, Diamond. Did you see a girl shoved in front of a car the night you knocked off Scarbo? Yeah. I called some guy and I told him about it. I read his ad in the personals, but I couldn't do anything about it. Yeah, because then the law would know you were in the park. Looks like it don't make much difference now. The kid who ran over the girl is in on a manslaughter rap. You'll get five or ten... It's tough. You got three and a half minutes. Lou, did you get a good look at the man who gave the girl the shove? Sure, I'd remember him. Rick! What do they want? I'll see. With your hands up, you'll see. Sure. What is it, Walt? Otis has got Cooper. Lou, will you do me a favor? I don't know. I want you to tell me if the guy they've got up there is the one who pushed the girl. Sure. But I can't see him from here. I'll have him brought down. I hope you ain't up to something. I don't want to see no kid get sent up in a bum rap, but if you get funny, you get holes. Walt, how about his bring Cooper halfway down to the shack? He doesn't want to go. Then drag him. I've only got two minutes. They bringing him? Yeah, here he comes. Okay. Out that door. 
What are you doing? I'm doing you a favor. I'm tired of the shack, and I'm walking out with you in front of me. Okay. Don't get too far ahead. Rick, what's Spiegel up to? I don't know. Hold your fire. I'm surprised at you. Even if I identified this guy, it wouldn't hold water. I got a bad reputation. Hey, what's going on? Take it easy, Otis. You can't do this to me. What's this all about? That's the guy, Diamond. I don't know what you're talking about. Sure you do. I saw you push that dame in front of the car. You're crazy. Now, I don't like that. You got just ten seconds to admit it. I won't admit anything. Then I shoot you. Hey, you can't... Shut up, Flatfoot. Stay out of this, Otis. I tell you, I won't admit anything. Five seconds. Come on, Cooper. I found out all about your prison record. I know Cook sent you up and you wanted to get even. You found those letters Tom wrote to your ex-wife, so you started blackmailing him. And I know you lied when you said you hadn't seen your ex-wife. I found a magazine in her apartment with your address on it. Time's up. No, 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 no. All right, I did it, I did it. You're too late. I'm on schedule. Oh, you idiot. Why did you shoot him? What's the difference? I kill people, he kills people. Besides, he wasn't polite. So long, Diamond. You got your favor. He's making a break. He'll never make it. Spiegel. Spiegel, in the name of the law, stop. For what? Stop. Yeah, they got him. They sure did. You know something? He wasn't such a bad guy. Wasn't he? I guess he's killed a dozen people in his time, but maybe you're right. Maybe he kissed them all goodbye before he pulled the trigger. Well, I got a right to an opinion. Yeah, yeah, and it scares me a little. You're lucky you didn't try to pull a gun on him. You'd look pretty silly telling everybody what a nice guy he was after he'd shot off the top of your head. <laughs> Lots of lemon, honey. What's that you're playing? I don't know. It says on the sheet music for kazoo and voice. <laughs> you idiot. Here, see how this tastes. Ah, uh, oh, that's swell. But can't you drop a muscle in it or something? No, that's plenty strong. Oh. The last time you complained about my weak drinks, Francis had to carry you home piggyback. Yeah, remind me to buy him a saddle. I hear they uh, let the cook boy out of jail this evening. How the dickens did you know that? Mm, never mind, I find out things. You have been snooping. Well, you won't tell me anything about your cases. How did you find out? Uh-uh. Helen? No. You'll be sorry. Here. You sing this, and I'll tell you how I found out. Well, I don't know whether I can. Your lips tell me no, no. But there's yes, yes in your eyes. I've been missing your kissing Just because I wasn't wise I'll stop my scheming and dreaming Cause I realize Your Oh, Rick, that's wonderful. Oh, okay, now, make like a truth serum or I sing 20 courses of McNamara's band. <laughs> Well, I was looking for you, so I called Walt Levinson. He told me all about it. Very elementary, my dear Diamond. Oh, get her. Do I look smug? Close your eyes and let's see. Now, that's silly. Why do I have to close my eyes? Close your eyes. <laughs> oh, that's better. Mm. Rick, aren't you nice? I certainly am. But people always notice my dimples first. Come here. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Helen, mm -hmm. you're looking smug again. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Eleanor Audley, William John Stone, Sam Edwards, David Ellis, and Frank Lovejoy. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by Richard Sandville. And now, Dick Powell. Friends, I want to remind you of the wonderful group of programs NBC has on tap for tomorrow afternoon and evening. 
Shows like Hollywood Calling, Guy Lombardo, Four Star Playhouse, The Ethel Merman Show, and the NBC Symphony. For the best in radio listening tomorrow and always, keep your dial tuned to your favorite NBC station. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.